Are we live? Is it working? Is it doing the thing? Hello. Am I online? Can you guys hear me? Can I hear me? I can hear me. Can you hear me? I have tea. Good. I think I'm live. I think we should be we should be good. Hello chat. Hopefully you can hear the things which I am saying. Yes, good. Excellent. Uh stream settings are all correct. Chat settings are just about right. Yes, cool. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Hi, hello, hi, hi, hey, salve. Welcome to the show, boss man. We've been expecting you. Hello, everyone. Thank goodness it just started. Hello, yes, audio is good. Hello. Hello, Sky. And hi, hello. Yeah, yeah, boy, you're live. Hi, Sky. What's up? Yo, let's go. Boar tired of the Sky. Go often. Hey, hey, oh, Jack. Hello. Oh, there's the many hour. I can finally focus on something other than being a burden. Oh, Jesus. Don't feel that way. You're not a burden. You're just a person. Uh, let's get this party started. AP burst with fear is a dash reset and anti mobility, it seems. Frederick the Catfish. Okay, cool. I do believe I'm seeing chat. So, new Legends of Runeterra expansion, uh, which means it's time for me to say the same thing about framing <laughs> um, and about like character storytelling five billion times as I've as I've done a hundred times before. Who am I rooting for? Pentacle or Dissonance? I don't know. I want to watch the uh, I want to watch the performance when they put it on. Remove the noise. Noise. What noise? Is there a noise? Because as far as I can tell, it should be... It, is, is the microphone sounding weird? Like, is there some, like, crackling in the microphone or something? Oh, they're talking about Pentakill. Oh, okay. Have I seen the Phoenix Mancer trailer? Nope, I have not. I don't believe it's been released, has it? Okay, it's all good. Maybe the music is too loud? Well, yeah. If the music's too loud, I can turn it down a little bit. And it should be all right. <laughs> Please talk more about framing. I haven't heard it enough in the last 10 episodes. Oh, don't you worry, Black Rain Raven. I've got framing for you for days. <laughs> How do you feel about Riot claiming all lore is disposable? I don't believe they've claimed that. <laughs> Bingo cards with framing and dodge angle have an unfair advantage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and, and focus on some things that we haven't uh, already discussed to death. On this one. Let's see. And thankfully, they've added the events tab, which makes it a lot easier to get a hold of the... Because there's the cards from the Sentinels event also, um, which I haven't looked at yet, so we can talk about them as well. But we shall do that near the end of the stream. <laughs> I challenge you to find a Legends of the Terror card without a use of framing. Interesting, because that might be impossible, because framing is like... That, that's a little bit like saying I challenge you to find a, a camera shot without a subject. Because that would just be a blank void. Will you cover the new Teemo and Fizz art? Yes, obviously. We shall take a look at that as well. I'm a little annoyed that they didn't let us keep the old art. Because, like, I'm, not that I'm super attached to it, but, it's, but it seems a little shitty, like, that you can't even make the decision whether you want to have the Bandlewood art or the, or the old stuff. Right, then. Uh, so, uh, usually, when I start a stream like this, I'll usually hang out for, like, five, ten minutes before I actually start doing the thing. So that people, because YouTube is so shitty at telling, like, let, giving people notifications about when stuff is starting and when stuff is happening. Um, so usually I'll just uh, hang out and shoot the shit for like 10, 15 minutes, um, or five, five, 10 minutes rather, uh, just to give people time to realize that the stream is happening in case they really want to be there from the start. So that's what we're doing right now. Let's see. What do you think about the rework of Yordles and the problem with Meglings that now... Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a really old problem, Jironi. Like, Meglings only really existed for a brief period of time back in Season, like, 1. 
and then Riot immediately retconned them pretty much out of existence. Like, Tristani used to be the Mechling gunner, and that was it. Like, that was the only champion who had anything to do with Mechlings. Um, so they've been gone for a long, 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 long time. The trouble with Tristana is that she hasn't really ever been updated to fit the... I mean, it's the Yordle sort of sexual dimorphism thing that they've got going on. That's such, like, a annoying decision, because, like, all the male Yordles are, like, they've got mustaches and big fuzzy beards and shit, and then all the female Yordles are just, like, basically small humans. Um, which is like, it's, uh, which is something that they've, they've addressed that a little bit with some of the cards here, but it's one of those annoying sexual dimorphisms that's sort of like, no, that's no, fine, like, but I also want a fuzzy female Yordle and like a smooth dude. Like, we can have both, surely. Hmm. Oh, TM, thank you for that. I don't know what that currency is, but thank you for, for it, for, for them, for them, uh, currencies. Been loving your content, been wondering for a while about your thoughts on One Piece's character design. If you, oh my god, One Piece. Yeah, I keep meaning to make a video about One Piece character design, but holy shit, there's so much. Like, my goodness gracious me. Uh, so that's like a big video that I have to make someday. Because like, I really do want to talk about it, because like, Oda has gotten so much better at it over time. Anyway, uh, we are, yeah. So, we'll, I'll hang out for t until 10 minutes past ha the half hour. And then we'll start on the actual cards themselves. I think Fizz has been a Yordle for a while now. Yeah, no, Fizz wasn't a Yordle. He used to be a member of some small sub, like, sub-ocean Atlantis race of creatures. And then they retconned him into a Yordle because they didn't want to deal with, like, what was Fizz's lost civilization? Yeah, was like, fuck it, let's just make him a Yordle because he's small. Um... Which is the same thing with Mumu. Uh, Mumu. Uh, Mumu was not originally conceived as a Yordle either, as far as I remember. Um, but they sort of retconned him into maybe being a Yordle. And then they sort of retconned him into maybe not being a Yordle. Like, they're sort of... They've gone back and forth on that poor kid. Talk about Vex, please. Well, no, not this stream, Linus. Uh, not this stream, because she doesn't have a card in Legends of Runeterra, so... What's the lore of his fork now? I don't think there is any. Like, there used to be, like, it used to be the thing from the civilization under the sea, but Fizz's fork is just a thing he has now. <laughs> it, ha it has no backstory anymore. What do you think about the concept of the Seraphine Zaya Phoenix skins? Eh. They're not that interesting to me. They're just pretty. Like, they're very pretty, but that's kind of... I, I just think they're only really pretty. And they don't have anything to recommend them beyond that. That's just me, though. Do you like the new expansion? Yeah, fucking Yordles, man. It's got Yordles! Of course I love it! <laughs> Why isn't Vagar Noxian? Uh, I don't know. Like, when it comes to region decisions in Legends of, Run in Legends of Runeterra, they don't often don't have that much to do with it, where the champion is actually from. Like, Senna is actually a Demacian, right? But she's a Shadow Isles uh, character. Ziggs is actually, he, he lives in Piltover and Zaun, um, last we heard of him, but he's in Shurima here. It's because they just need the champions to be added to regions where they fit into the game design. So, you know, that happens. Ever t thought about talking about Guilty Gear character designs? Yeah, but I don't know Guilty Gear very well, and I don't play it, so... <laughs> Why fish have boob? Well, we'll talk about that as we get into the Marai. Because Nami has had a bit of a design update in Legends of Runeterra, actually. Like, she's looking a little different here, um, which I appreciate. But anyway, I think we are 10 minutes past starting time. Oh, no, we were only 8 minutes live. Oh, well, whatever. People have had time to show up. So, hello, everybody. <laughs> or should I say, uh, hello, players and pirates. My name is TB Skyn, and welcome to the card review for Legends of Runeterra. Bandles Beyond the Bandlewood City Yordle, the, the one with all the Yordles in it, where we're going to look at the cards in this particular expansion, and we're going to talk about the cards in this particular expansion, and all the stuff that is going on with the cards in this particular expansion, and discuss the art, the character design, the way that they're put together. I'll chat to chat a little bit, and chat will send me super chats while I'm trying to deliver a monologue to camera. Uh, <laughs> um and hang out and discuss Legends of Runeterra character design and some of the redesigns uh, that have been made 
for Legends of Runeterra. Like, as you can see on screen right now, Caitlyn and Nami both look substantially different than they do in their normal incarnation. Serath has become a much more bulky, roundish boy, which should be interesting to talk about. So, uh, let me just check over the Super Chats. Uh, Daniel Omar, hey, Sky, I love your design bits and lore concepts as much as my, I may disagree with some of your opinions. I enjoy hearing others' opinions on design. Yeah, I mean, all everything I say is opinion. Like, it's it's very rare that I I don't I'm not a science YouTuber I don't I don't talk about facts I talk about feelings, um, which is what art is. Um, so, yes, I am perfectly happy to that you disagree with me. I'm actually quite pleased with that because if you get if everyone just agrees with you all the time, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, the Harbo, hey, what, how would you create an OC of Rune Terror without them being champion grade? It seems everywhere is horrible unless you're champion material, you exist to die in someone else's backstory. That's not true. You can live in Ionia pretty peacefully nowadays, like since the Noxian invasion has been repelled. Um, you can live in Bandle City, be quite happy. If you have money and you live in Piltover, you're fine. Uh, if you have money and live anywhere, really. If, if you are a Demacian who is not a mage and who's like living in one of the outskirts villages or whatever, you're probably fine, so don't worry about it. Think Void Champions will be spread across regions if they introduce the Void, and I don't think they will. Um, but then, yes, like, that's absolutely what they're going to do. But I don't think they'll make the Void as another multi-region thing. At least not yet. Well, actually, no, you know what? They probably will, but they've said that they won't. Anyway. Let's begin with our girl, Caitlin, of, about whom I've already made a short, of course, um, who has received a, a not insubstantial design update for Legends of Runeterra, which is quite nice. This is a design where, like, where Caitlyn in her normal form looks like, I've said before, she looks like the porn parody of herself because she's wearing, like, that extremely, like, short dress and, like, with a big cleavage and, like, this completely cartoonishly sort of misshapen silly hat. And, like, she looks like a, a sort of cartoon porn parody of her own concept, which is that she's the sheriff of Piltover, she's an accomplished detective, she's a law enforcement agent, and she's someone who doesn't like to have any fun whatsoever. Like, she's, she doesn't, like, Caitlin is very much characterized as someone who's not about any sort of silliness. Like, she's very much that kind of character. So having her run around in that extremely sort of sexy, sexy sort of Halloween costume version of herself, always completely misfit with her character. So, Legends of Runeterra has taken the natural step of saying, okay, how can we keep the aesthetics of the original costume, but then update it to something that doesn't look like it's completely counter to her actual personality? And the answer they came up with is, okay, we keep the dress, we keep sort of the aristocratic, upper-class Victorian ruffles and like, and like frills and stuff, but then we make her dress more sensibly in other ways. So she has a jacket on, she's got like le these thick leather leggings that she seems to be wearing. The straps around her legs now actually attach things to her, like pouches and stuff for tools and things that she uses. Um, and they've sort of like, they've de-emphasized her bust a lot because she's not really a sexy character. Like that's not really her thing. That's more like an Evelyn thing. Um, so they've de-emphasized that, but they're sort of re-emphasizing the femininity of her shape a little bit with the belt right under the bust line to sort of like highlight where the, like where the boobies are basically. Um, and sort of, but without going like, hey boys, look at these big mommy milkers and more like, hey, they are there and she has them, right? Um, and that to me makes a lot of sense because like Caitlin, when she's a detective, she spends her time running through Zaun chasing down criminals or whatever, like it's full of rusty industrial equipment and shit. And if she scratches her leg on one of those, she'll get tetanus or something worse. Like, I don't know what diseases they have in Runeterra world. Uh, so like it's, it's a sensible update of the character design. Like I would like to see her rebuilt from the ground up rather than just sort of patchworked into something more functional, but that's just me. Anyway, let's talk about the composition because what we have here is a scene where one character is delivering important information to other characters, right? Um, and so how is this scene framed? There's a lot of different ways you can do it. You could frame it from the perspective of the audience, for example. And in that case, you'd put the air quotes camera in the crowd and you'd have the audience in the foreground. Like you'd see their heads. Wait, <laughs> hiccups. You'd see like the back of their heads as they watch Caitlyn's presentation. And Caitlyn would be a relatively small figure, sort of at the very, actually I can show you, I can show you one of those, uh, cause Legends of Runeterra has one. I'm just gonna need to do some, uh, yeah. foundations, try fair. Uh -huh. You might do something like this. Ah, we have exactly a scene to demonstrate, demonstrate the point. If you're having one character delivering a speech or some dialogue, some information to like one, to a group of other characters, you can do a shot like this one, where you place the audience 
in, like, you place the audience for the card, like us, in the audience for the event that's happening in-game. So, like, we're part of the crowd, we're watching this character from far away delivering their, ah, you are soldiers of the Noxian blah blah blah, and you shall blah blah die blah 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 blah, um, from that perspective. And that puts this character in a certain position of power and authority over us, right? She's raised above us, she stands alone where everyone else is gathered in a mass, she's, like, the strong, powerful individual who's gathering who's like um who's leading this discussion and as you can see like with the trafarian the entire card is framed around like she has this frame right here she has the banner in the middle she's centered she's got the highlights coming down with the sun where everybody else is in shadow like so the whole card is just working to place this as like this is the character who is delivering the important speech to the masses caitlin's card doesn't do that uh, as i try to navigate my way through this interface back to uh Hang on. Oh, right. Foundation's away. There. Ha ha. This card doesn't do that. We are not in the crowd. We are not positioned away from Caitlyn. We are not alienated from her. Like, it's not a thing where, like, we're in the crowd watching her give us orders. We are positioned much more as part of a circle of equals, right? So we have the rest of the Piltover police, like, force sort of gathering around here. And you get the sense that there's this half circle around her, right? That they, that they form this half circle around her. Everyone is sort of level. Everyone is at eye line, by the way. Caitlin is not raised above the crowd. You can see her eye line is pretty level um, with the archivist. It's in fact below this guy. So she's not raised up to this like position of authoritarian, sort of centered, sort of like she's not the great dictator dictating to the crowd. This is someone who is delivering information to a crowd of equals. The storytelling tells us so, that Caitlin is delivering this to her fellow investigators with whom she feels a kinship. The same thing about us. Even though we are not like necessarily directly in the crowd, we still feel like we're part of that big half circle that's sort of around Caitlin's desk, but we're up at the front. We're pretty damn close to her. We could probably reach out and touch some of her stuff. We are in her space. So, like, the storytelling here is m very different from that, like, authoritarian storytelling. This is, oh, yes, our leader, whomst we respect, and we know them, and we talk to them, and we, we speak on a first-name basis, is giving us some important information about some stuff that they've been doing. Um, which, like, which gives a very different vibe and energy to the storytelling of the scene, and I really like it. Anyway, the, but we still need the storytelling to center Caitlyn, right? We still need her to be the main character of the card because it's her card. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, we create this scene that feels much more inclusive, that feels much closer, that feels much more like, ah, yes, here's a bunch of colleagues discussing stuff together. But we still create a little bit of separation. So we have the window here behind Caitlin, for example. This bright, like, sheer white, basically, highlighted space behind her that sort of encompasses most of her body, acting as a little frame. Um, to put in, her in there. That's the framing you all were, were asking for. Um, and we have just a little bit of physical separation. Like, most of the crowd is, like, over here on the right. Caitlyn is over here on the left. And Caitlyn's stuff, like her big sort of mystery board, is over here taking up space to which she's directly connected. So the compositional element is that Caitlyn takes up about, just about half, right? Like, her and her stuff takes up about half of the card, and then the other half is mostly, like, like her desk and the other characters. So there's this proportionality to the way that space is dedicated to each set of characters that tells us who's the central character here, who's the most important character. And then the other thing we've also talked about before, highlighting a character through sheer detail, right? So if you look at, and I wish I could zoom in a little bit more here, um, but if you look at the characters in the background, what you'll notice is that they're painted a little bit more roughly. Like you can see it especially on this guy right here, his face, right? It's not super highly detailed. It's not super cleanly painted. It's a little bit rough around the edges. And that's basically true for all the characters in the background. They are, they are rendered, but they're not rendered nearly as much. Caitlyn is fully rendered. Like everything about her is painted smoothly. Like she feels very, very sort of present and real. And what that does, it mimics the effect of a camera. It mimics the effect of a camera where you have, like, a, sh a shallow depth of field, where one character is highlighted uh, just by being in focus, and everyone else is just slightly a little bit out of focus, right? Then there's stuff we talked about before, color saturation. Caitlyn's colors are, broadly speaking, more saturated. Her contrast is, broadly speaking, higher than the characters in the background. You can especially see the contrast between Caitlyn and the detective here in the background, the insider. We'll talk about his card later. You can see how washed out he looks relative to her, and that's also something that brings her to the front, that makes her a more sort of in-focus character. Um, and that sort of, that, that repeats across the uh, the entire group. Like, you can see the browns, if you pay attention to the browns of the belt, for example, that's way more uh, desaturated than the browns around Caitlyn's, um, in Caitlyn's belts and shit. So, 
yeah, like there's a lot of little things going on that sort of that that positions the one character as the central character, but without doing the obvious thing of just like putting them on a pedestal. Which I think is this just, just a really nice little bit of storytelling there. I also like Caitlin's pose. Like I like the way that she's explaining because she's like leaning towards the crowd and she's going, "I found him over here." And it's like she's explaining this thing, but she's not giving a lecture. She's like she's like pointing to the board and explaining her theories. And like it has it has a nice energy. I really like it. Anyway, uh, something happened on my phone. Okay, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. That's the level one. How would okay? There's a thousand people here. Hello. That's. You showed up all of a sudden. I'm pretty sure it was only like 400 last I looked. Hi, hope you enjoy the stream. Uh, yes, Caitlin, Caitlin. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with that later. So here's her level two. Um, and actually, before we talk about that, let's find um, let's find the spell card. So this is ambush, um, which is what is it like? Give a unit plus two plus blah blah. Um. This is a better look at Caitlyn's new character design. Or new character design, her different outfit. This is Caitlyn essentially in her SWAT gear, um, her SWAT gear outfit thing where she's doing the thing where she's like, ah, we shall go and confront the villain in their lair, or whatever. Um, and I quite like the spell, uh, the spell card, first of all, but it's also an interesting way to reframe the character. This is something I talked about in my short, but the Piltover police, the enforcers, they're like, they're not the good guys, like not, <laughs> they're not universally the good guys. They are the arm of an authoritarian government that's ruled by nobles that are massively corrupt. Like, they serve people like Camille, ultimately. Like, they're the people who bankroll the enforcers. And, like, so the Piltover enforcers are, like, not universally the good guys. Caitlyn is still a heroic character, obviously, but she's a heroic character working inside of an imperfect system. And so I quite like these character designs because this shit is sinister. Like, these motherfuckers are scary. These are not like, oh, nice policemen coming along with your bobby hats to what, what, what is going on here? Like, they're not affable. They're not nice. These people look like they're going to fucking kill you. Uh, like, this this looks like the jackbooted thug beating down the doors of the underclass in order to do the thing. Um, and, like, enforce the authority of the hierarchy or whatever. And that, I like that that's there. Like, that there is that element of like, hey, wow, these people actually seem a little bit scary sometimes. Maybe... Yeah, okay, maybe they're not universally the good guys. And that's going to be important because in Arcane, of course, we follow, we're going to, like, this is talking about outside media. In Arcane, we're going to be following um, Jinx, or, well, Powder, as she's actually called, and, and Vi in the Sawn Undercity as, they, as they're coming up, as they're sort of trying to live their lives down there among the criminals and among, like, the, the rowdier people in the gangs. And so, like, presumably the police will play some sort of antagonistic role there because, like, they're going to be doing crime. So, like, it's, it's good to have a character design that can make them scary, that can make them fearsome, and that can make them, okay, yeah, this is, like, this may be a little bit fashy um, in, in some aspects of the uniform design. Works quite well, and Caitlyn also just looks scarier here. Like, this is a scarier version of Caitlyn than the one we see in her regular splash in her regular art because like here she's wearing like what looks like a pretty nice dress like she's oh yeah it's like it's a nice little costume thing and then the, like when she's in military gear it's like oh no this lady's coming here to murder you so that's cool uh, and also just because people brought it up uh even though i was kind of tired of it one silly thing about this base like that thigh gap there like <laughs> that's not <laughs> Even people who have a thigh gap, like even people who actually do have a thigh gap in real life, when they put one leg in front of the other, thighs overlap. Like that, and this is how anatomy works. If you put one leg in front of the other, your thighs will overlap. That is geometry. That's how it works. How are you this fucking desperate for camel toe? Like, how are you that desperate for camel toe? It's not, like, my God. <laughs> It's so silly. It's so silly. Because, like, okay, she has a thigh gap. Fine, I guess. Like, not a lot of people do, and I don't know why everyone's so fucking obsessed with it. But when you put one leg in front of the other, there's not going to be a thigh gap. There's just not going to be a thigh gap. I mean, Jesus, unless you are extremely emaciated, there's not going to be a thigh gap. So, it's, it's, it's just a dumb thing. Anyway... Where were we? Right, the level 2 art. We need to talk about the level 2 art. 
um, which is also sort of a conclusion of a storyline that's running throughout the cards. Because, okay, so this, uh, God damn it, go back to the level one. We need to explain this. So the storyline of Caitlyn's cards, or the storyline of Caitlyn as a character, is that when she was a young girl, her family was targeted for assassination. Uh, like someone tried to kill her family. And as far as she could tell, like as far as she could make out, it was some mysterious crime figure known as C. And the theory in the lore community for a while has been that Camille is this mysterious C, that she ordered the assassination because Camille kind of doesn't like Caitlyn's family being like nice to the Undercity Piltover people or whatever. With this update for Religions of Runeterra, that has been kind of disproved. It turns out that the mysterious C is, or might be, we don't know if it's a red herring, who knows, um, Corinna, who is a card we already know from the previous... Uh... Karina, rather, um, who is a card that also showed up in the Foundations as Karina Verasa, who is hanging out in Pilto and Son, does stuff with your spell cards, uh, grows plants, does a whole Poison Ivy riff with her character design, who turns out to be the Mysterious C. And what we see here is the aftermath of Caitlyn's level two, where she's springing her trap to kill the police. Uh, all that stuff. Right, so Caitlyn's storyline for a long time has been about her trying to find this mysterious C, this person who targeted her family for assassination. So you can see the C hanging out um, on the pegboard here in the background where she's like tracing and trying to figure out who is this mysterious C character. Um, and so the level two represents a moment of confrontation where she finally finds C um, and is surprised to find who it is because it's Corina Varaza, a person whom she knows because Corina is this lady right here in the background with like extremely conspicuous pink jacket <laughs> and flower on her head. I don't know why Caitlyn couldn't like, oh, hey, maybe this mysterious evil lady who has something to do with flowers. I don't know. Is, is, maybe it's, uh, maybe there's a clue. <laughs> maybe she's trying to tell you something. Um, but yeah. Uh, that's Karina right there, who's been an insider all along. And the reason why we need to know that is because there's some cards with Karina where she shows up and is like, a <sighs> lot of story to explain here. It's not really a Holmes and Moriarty thing. Um, uh, not really bruh, funny bruh memes and more. Um, it's not really a Holmes Moriarty thing because Holmes Moriarty, it doesn't matter. But yeah, it's the nemesis thing, right? Where Caitlin has been chasing this mysterious criminal in the shadows for ages and it turns out to be someone that she already knows from her real life. Big twist, big shocker. So we need to talk about this card. <laughs> I'm trying to get myself back on track here. So, the card itself. Remember what we said about framing and stuff? Here, there isn't a lot of framing going on. Well, there is some, but for Caitlyn herself, who's the main character of the card, right? Well, she's a, she's a main character. There's not a lot of framing going on. Like, there's not an explicit sort of like, oh, yeah, we have the thing in the background that frames our character. Caitlyn here is made to stand out and be a central character simply by just being the tallest character in the room. Like, she stands alone. No one else overlaps her. No one else is in front of her. Like, Corinna's arm doesn't overlap her. She's, like, separated alone. She has light right behind her. Like, this spotlight literally shines a light on where she is. And there is a little bit of framing in that we have, like, the plants. And we have Corinna's arm uh, that sort of carves out, like, a vaguely little bit of a frame. But it's really just that she's separated in the center of the image, alone, with light behind her. Whereas everyone else um, is substantially more in shadow. But also, she's also the only character who has a face in this image. Which is another thing. Like, the human, the human brain is programmed to look for faces. That's why we can see, like, we look at a house and, like, oh, two windows and a, and a door. That looks like a face. A surprised face or whatever. It's, it's like it, we have this tendency in our brains. So when we see a face, it's like, oh, that's the main character. Even though the face is itty bitty tiny in the image, it's still, we still identify, okay, central, this is the only character who has a face. So we're going to focus on that first because the brain looks for it. Yeah, pareidolia, as you, as you say. Well, pareidolia is the, is the tendency to see patterns and things. And one of the patterns that the human brain likes to identify is faces. Um, so like that that's what pareidolia is. Pareidolia is not just faces, it's its everything where we see patterns, but what are the patterns we look for is a face. Um, so that's uh, Caitlyn's central, like with the gun pointing and then doing the dramatic pose thing and all the other soldier dudes, all the other SWAT whatever people, they don't have faces. They have masks, they have like eyeglasses, they're covered up. So they become more like part of the furniture, like they become more part of the background. 
which is quite well done. Anyway, Corina over here holding a detonator because she's like, ah, Caitlin, yes, you have walked right into my carefully prepared trap. Prepare for drama. And then she activates it. And that's when we'll, we'll get to that once we get to the Karina Mastermind card itself. Right. Moving on to Nami, I think. Yes, let's do that. And I'll take a sip of tea, I think. Is it cold enough to... Yeah. Oh, Carlos Augusto Sar Saraiva, thank you for that super chat. How goes my favorite YouTuber? Fun to, fun to see I came in at probably the best time. Sky and screaming about what god-awful hip area in the ambush art based. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... It's one leg in front of the other. It's in front of it. Like, you can't have a gap between one thing where one thing is in front of the other thing. There can't be a gap between them because they overlap. Jesus. Anyway. <clears throat> Nami. Yes, good, Nami. I like this card a lot. I like, oh God, I like all of the Marai cards. Like all of, like, like Nami and all of her people, like all of the people that are associated with her and all the cards that are associated. There's some fucking cool mermaids in here, man. 30 minutes and one card down. Yeah, I know. Two cards. Two cards. Kate Little, the one and two. And we did the ambush card as well. Like, so three cards. We've done three cards. Be fair. It only took me 10 minutes for each one. What was the thing? Right. Yes. I love the character designs of the Marai. I love the character designs of all these deep sea creatures because they've gone really hard on making some different, more interesting mermaids. But Nami herself has had a minor character design update, most specifically that she doesn't quite have as explicit fish titties anymore. <laughs> um, which is always sort of the odd thing about, cause like, cause the thing is like, Nami's a mermaid. Okay, she can have mammary glands. Like maybe mermaids feed their young from breasts the same way that, that dolphins do or whatever. That's fine. No problem there. But the trouble with Nami was that like, she didn't have any nipples. <laughs> So, like, how do... Wait, so no, you can't really do that with the breasts if you don't have any nipples from them to... to feed. Anyway, so what they've done with Nami's characters on here is they've sort of de-emphasized the tits a little bit. They've not taken away the shape. Like, you can still see that there's that, 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 that bulging shape on top of her form um, that sort of suggests a bust, but they don't have that super explicit cleavage anymore. Like, they don't have, like, that 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 really sort of, like cleavage and all but name thing going on with her that they do on the base splash art because it just raised more questions than it was worth for her to have the sexy fish titties. So there's a minor character design update there. Um, there's also a few other things like the shape language of her crown has been changed just a little bit. We've sort of emphasized a few things about um, uh, the way like the way her colors gradient. Like there's, there's little things, little good changes that are quite nice. Um, and just overall, it looks like a, it looks like a much more polished character design because they've done a lot of polish on it like they took the base character design of nami and went okay let's give this another pass and it just looks more much more nicely rendered it just looks more, more nicely put together i still think nami is kind of a basic character like she's a very basic mermaid character and i feel like they could have been more creative with her as indeed they have with the other marai but it's a good little update for her. anyway framing so the framing here should be fairly obvious because you can kind of see it right like you can kind of see how the Freaking the, uh, what are they called? Venman, um, jellyfish. That's what they're called, jellyfish. You can see how the jellyfish and like the seaweed and the corals and the whatever, and the um, Marai elder, how they all form this sort of little color shape for her to occupy. You can see how she's separate from everything. Like none of the jellyfish like really overlap with Nami's bright. There's a little bit down here, but none of them overlap with Nami. The hand of the Mariah Sea Mother doesn't overlap. The staff doesn't even overlap with her. There's this separation of like separating out Nami specifically so that she can be like a central character. But this is a dual character thing. Like because the secondary character who is almost as much of a main character is the Marai um, elder here who is doing this blessing on her, like sending her on her journey to become the tide caller. Um, which so there's this this duality between where you can see that the that the uh, that the elder is in a position of power over her. The elder actually takes up more space in the image that Nami does because she's the one with the wisdom. She's the one bestowing knowledge. She's the one sort of sort of granting a blessing on the young Anshinu as she sets out on her quest. This is Nami when she's starting out, like setting out from her home to save them from the monsters of the deep. Um, which is, we should probably recap Nami's lore, by the way. So Nami's people live deep in the sea. They're Vestaya. They're an ocean type of Vestaya. They live deep in the sea, and down below them, 
there is a void portal or something. There's there's something bad down there. It's probably a void portal as far as we know. Uh, and they have an, a magical artifact called a moonstone, which they are granted by the aspect of the moon. That would be Diana right now. That they needs to be charged up every hundred years or so with power from the moon in order to keep repelling the horrors from the depths. And if they don't get that moonstone, everyone's going to die. Which is why Nami is like, okay, fuck it, I'll be the tide caller. I'll go find the aspect of the moon and make her give us a moonstone so that we can all not die. So Nami has been on a long quest to find Diana, wherever the fuck Diana is right now. Um, and that's the like that's, that's her thing is like she's this young, enthusiastic, sort of idealistic, bright-eyed hero setting out on a quest to save her homeland. It's like the intro to every JRPG, right? Like that kind of thing. Except hopefully her village won't be burned down. How would they burn down a village in the sea? I don't know. Um Right, I think there was some super chats. I'm going at five million miles an hour, and still I can only do one card per ten minutes. Hello, Skyn. Uh, thank you for all that you are able to do. It inspired me to use my League of Legends animation for my art class independent project last semester to compare using 2D and 3D animation together. You're the best. Well, good job, Sarah. That sounds interesting. Um, Turtles of Pies. I love the backgrounds in Legends of Runeterra. They feel so unique in each card. Yeah, like the environment design in Legends of Runeterra is fantastic. There's some fantastic backgrounds. There's some fantastic, like, just the places that these people live just feel so good like they feel so nice they feel so realized it's, ah, it's really good we'll talk about that more maybe in some of the other cards uh laplace 2882 hey Skyrim, i'm at work right now so i'm gonna be popping in and out of the stream love the mirai cards they're so pretty yeah yeah they are they're excellent um but yeah and you can also see like the pose with like uh the great mother hovering sort of over nami with this hand like imposing power upon it. you can see these little sparkles coming off her hand like rendering them onto Nami, and Nami is sort of much more turned inward. You can see her pose is like, she, her, like her chin is down, her chest is up, but her chin is down, so she's sort of turning in on herself, like with the hand as well, touching to her heart, pretty much. So you can see that she's in the grip of some sort of feeling, like she's in the grip of some sort of an emotion, some sort of an emotional thing that's going through her, whereas the Mirai Great Mother is much more like, she's delivering information, she's speaking, she's preaching, she's saying something, she's delivering a blessing. So like, there's this difference in their moods, where you can see that Nami is like, taken, overwhelmed with feeling at the journey that she's setting out upon, which is very good. <laughs> very fresh take, haha, <laughs> get it, cause water, yeah, Mariah are the best Astaya tribe because they've got the best colors and shape, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, the Mariah, the coolest Astaya in the game. Because uh, most of the Vestaya in the game, and I've complained about this before, just are fucking humans in, co in in animal costume, like with a little bit of animal, like fucking Zaya and Rakan, could not one of them have a beak? They're birds! Like, gee, anyway, this is a different discussion. Good card. I like it. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. So, some gorgeous water rendering right here. Uh, like, this is just, I, I, this is so... This is so like 1980s in a way. Like this is sort of late late 80s, early 90s kind of aesthetic of rendering a big, beautiful water splash where you have this like the water is almost folding over like petals of a flower, right? Like if you've ever seen water splash in real life, you know that it doesn't look this neat. <laughs> like this is very neat and tidy. This is like this is like the water being very polite. In real life, the water just goes <laughs> and flies out all over everywhere. Um, but here it's being shaped into these lovely petals and folds and shapes, which is probably partly Nami's magic or whatever. But the aesthetic of it is one that reminds me of things like um, Sailor Moon back in the early days. Um, and like sort of generally a very uh, little, little bit of a magical girl is a little bit of a Little Mermaid aesthetic um, that's going on there with the way that the water sort of conveniently shapes its way out and looks like this sort of soft, pleasant giving almost silk-like folds, right? Rather than being this big mass of just wet molecules, which is like, is, which I think is really nice. Like it has a really nice aesthetic. And it also sort of helps, serves to underline the idea that Nami is, like she's loved by the sea, right? Like the water is her ally, it's her aid. It's not a, it's not an antagonistic force that she has to overcome. It's a thing that aids her on her journey, um, which I quite like. <laughs> why is, why is it, by the way, why is it that every time I start streaming, I immediately get snotty? Why is that? <sighs> right. So, um, 
So Nami here, as people are mentioning it in chat, by the way, also, uh, as Nami here is kind of slender, right? Like, she's kind of a slender, sleek little thing. Like, she's got a very long tail, if you pay attention. Like, she has a really long mermaid tail. But here, she seems to have put on... I mean, I don't mean to be rude, but she seems to have put on a pound or two. Um, like, she seems to be a little bit more bottom-heavy here. And I think... I don't necessarily think that that's a storytelling thing. I think it's just a compositional thing. Um... I, like, I don't think, like, some people in chat are suggesting that maybe this is, like, a storytelling thing where it's like, oh, this is Nami after five years into her journey when she's grown up a little bit more, and so she's, like, she's a little bit more mature. I'm not sure that's the case. I think this is just a compositional thing, because look at, if Nami here had been very slender, I think visually she would just have looked like another ribbon of water. Like, I think if she had been very slender, she wouldn't have stood out properly from these slender ribbons of water flowing all the way around her. I think it's just a decision on the on the behalf of the artist to frame her in a slightly thicker way um, in order to make her stand out and be visible against the shape language of, of, like, the rippling water around her. Like, I don't think it's necessarily a storytelling thing. I think it's also just the angle, because, like, if you actually trace the line of the thing, it's, like, it's not that much thicker than her base form, like, like than her level one form it's not that much but because of the way that these things overlap with each other because of the way that the, the hip armor and the um, fins or whatever they are like that flap out here the way they overlap it makes it look thicker than it is but either way like i kind of prefer this thick nami um because like it's like well sort of i mean I'm, i kind of go both ways because like i kind of like the idea of a mermaid that has because like a lot of fish are really fat because they kind of have to be they live in the sea it's cold down there um and I kind of like the idea of a mermaid that has, like, the human form has this sort of human petiteness, but then the lower half is, like, much more like a whale shark or something, like, something large. Um, but I think for Nami, it's more appropriate if she's very sleek and slender because she's supposed to be this little slight sort of young girl fantasy hero going off on their first quest. So, like, uh, I don't know, character design-wise, I could go either way. Um, but anyway, framing. So the framing here is interesting because there isn't, again, there isn't an explicit frame. Like it's not in like in a lot of the cards where there's a very obvious frame in the card itself. What there is though is light. And the light here, like you can see this moon, this uh, sort of shard, this uh, shaft of moonlight coming down from above right there. It's not very starkly visible, but it is right there highlighting her, highlighting, like, lightening up her background. So you can see the background behind her here. It's very light, right? Like, it's it's basically sort of this very sparse gray, bluish gray, which gives her a lot to contrast against, right? So she has much more contrast. She has much more saturation. She has much more color. So she's very well outlined against this very slight sort of bright background in a way that she wouldn't be if her head was, like, over here. Um, against all this raging nonsense of the water, she'd be much less visible. But because we have this flat, featureless background behind her here, she stands out really beautifully. And again, she's the only thing with a face. The human brain goes, I see a face! And then that's the main character of the image. Uh, pretty simple like that. So that's, like, very nice. And I do like, like, I really like the swoops. I like the shape language that's being used here, like the S curves that flow throughout Nami's entire form, and that also inform like the behavior of the water. It's just it's just really gorgeous. Like with all the little sparkles, it's so extra. Like they 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 went a little bit like just the sparkles on the water, and it looks like very beautiful and very pretty in a way that's just kind of a little again, like I said, a little bit 90s, a little bit 90s anime style, um, in a way that I really appreciate. I really like it. I like the sparkliness and the prettiness of it all. Cause like she's a mermaid, so of course she's supposed to be. Yeah, beautiful art. Like, I really like this art. It's really gorgeous. And also, I like the spell art. Like, I really li like the way that this thing is painted. Just like that, that almost sort of a little bit cartoonish in the way that it's but like, it's almost like you can see a strong outline around everything, but it's not outlined. It's painted uh, in a way that that's just really gorgeous. Like, I really like the way they've rendered these, these spell cards. It's just, it's just really nice, pretty use of color. Lots of nice gradients flowing over top of it. It's just real pretty. It's just, I, I, I would love a print of this because that's just a really pretty depiction of magic water. Anyway, how's chat doing? I'm, I'm trying to go fast a little bit. In case you can't tell, I'm just talking a little bit fast. I'm trying to, uh, and failing, but I'm trying because I want to get through all these cards before like five hours.
Is there... Oh, uh, can't believe they didn't give her a thigh gap when she's so thick. Oh, we'll talk about mermaids with thigh gaps later, by the way. <laughs> They've got one of those. Uh, your content inspired me to learn to draw. Learn to draw the monster himbos, right? Won't give us... Well, you're doing the Lord's work, Josh Young. By the way, didn't we learn from interaction that Nami is in a polygamous relationship? Yes. Yes, she is. Nami has a girlfriend and a boyfriend all at the same time. And that girlfriend and boyfriend are also girlfriend and boyfriend to each other, which is very cool. Let's see if I can find them, actually, because uh, it's the... It's the Mirai Songstress is Nami's girlfriend, this lady right here. And then it is the... No. What's he called? Uh... Shit, but he's, he's a four cost, I think. There there is, the Abyssal Guard. And then this guy is their boyfriend. And they are in what seems to be a polyamorous relationship with each other, which is very cool. And a writer confirmed on Twitter that it's because the, like, the Marai just don't have the same concept of monogamy that a lot of the land-dwelling species have. Like, it's not, it's not really, they don't think of themselves as being in a polyamorous relationship. They're just like, no, this is just like a normal relationship where we live. <laughs> Sky, you need to tell us when you do these. I would have had snacks done. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I, I've been trying to find time to do this stream all week, and I just couldn't find time for it. What is polygamy? Well, okay, so polygamy and polyamory are not exactly the same thing. Polygamy means being married to more than one person, like being in a sort of structured uh, relationship of marriage with more than one person. Polyamory means being romantically attracted to more than one person. Uh, or polygamy means being a romantic relationship with more than one person. Polyamory is just the state of being capable of feeling romantic attraction to more than one person simultaneously. <clears throat> what do you call a Marai love triangle? Bermuda triangle. <laughs> That's pretty good. <clears throat> So, moving on to Tristana. There's not a lot to say about her in terms of her design, because it's it's pretty much exactly the same design that she has in the regular League of Legends game. So that's, like, not a lot to say there. In terms of framing and aesthetic, like, you can see uh, there's not an explicit frame for Tristana exactly, but she's separated in the frame from the other characters. She's the only face that we've really got besides the whatever the hell this thing is that's trying to come through the Yordle portal. Um, and we've got... Uh, like, the same sort of contrast and um, focus thing that we've talked about before. Where every other character, like, if you look at them, they're sort of a little bit more roughly painted. They're a little bit more sort of out of focus, as it were. Whereas Tristana is fully rendered and extremely sharp in her outlines. So that makes her stand out as a main character. We've got the bright sort of washed out background against her highly saturated, very high contrast form. Helping her stand out as a character. And she's also just the biggest character in the screen. Like, that's another way that you can make a character the central character, is just to make them the biggest character in the card. Or in the art. She takes up, like, a full, what, a quarter? Yeah, just about a quarter of the image is dedicated entirely to Tristana's form, and then everyone else gets to share the rest. Uh, so that, like, that's how the, we highlight her as a character. So compositionally, I don't think there's that many interesting things going on here. There's one interesting thing in... You see this, this tree branch, this tree trunk that they're running along, like the way that that kind of leads the image. So that you can see, let's say you can get the sense of like, Tristana is like behind these people as she's beckoning this person forward. Like, so there's a little bit of that flow of the storytelling happening in the composition that way. But other than that, it's just a perfectly decent card. Like it's not, it's maybe not the greatest representation of Tristana, I think. Um, it's sort of, like, from a storytelling perspective, it focuses on Tristana as the leader of the Bandal Gunners, right? Like, she's leading her troops into battle with the whatever the hell this thing is. Um, and it's sort of trying to set her up as that. I don't necessarily think it's the best... I don't know. It doesn't really... It doesn't excite me, is what I'm saying. Like, I'm, I don't look at this and go, Yeah, fuck yeah, Tristana! Yeah, yeah. I just, oh, hey, Tristana is here. Which is what I like a lot more about the second, uh, the level two splash art is here, like more specifically, you can see that she's the leader in front of the Bantel Gunner. She's just used her rocket jump. She's about to lay down brutal punishment on, again, whatever the hell this thing is. Um, and you can see that she's in front of her troops, like Timo down here with his little blowpipe doing his thing. They're shooting acorns at it. 
Here you can see, like, this is much more Tristana as an active leader in the front of everything. And this works a lot better for me, frankly, in, in terms of, in terms of making her the central, like, the central character of the image and the leader of the Bantle Gunners. Um, and also here, you can see a very clever little thing. We have the light of the Bantle portal, right? Like, the light that this thing is coming through, highlighting Tristana in this bright orange, which is also, coincidentally, the same color as the color of fire, the color of, like, blasting stuff to pieces with explosions. So that's used to highlight her very specifically and contrasts like this warm golden yellow color in contrast with the blues, in contrast with the sort of these pale burgundies and like sort of very, very differently purplish colors of the background. It highlights her just brilliantly right in the center of the frame in a way that you can see with Timo, he's not really highlighted by that light. He's just saturated with it. And these characters have no golden highlights on them whatsoever. They just have the blues um, of the background. So Tristana gets highlighted literally just with light here in a way that centers her out as a central character really effectively. And then, of course, also the other things. She's basically the only character with a really visible face. Like, we have this down here, this misshapen nonsense. We have Timo's little eyes, kinda. But she's the only one where there's, like, a really clearly strongly visible face that draws our attention. Uh, so that works really well. Like, it's just this is really nicely put together. And this feels much more like Tristana in action, like Tristana doing her Tristana thing, than this one where it's just like, hey, she's, oh, hey, she's saying, she's going to a place. We... I also like the buster shot. <laughs> I just like, like, Tristana's joy and delight at blowing stuff up. Like, she would get along with Ziggs a lot better than she thinks, I think. Speaking of whom, <laughs> I do like the storyline um, of Ziggs and his cards because the storyline of Ziggs is that the inspector is coming to visit his factory, his his workplace, his, his laboratory where he blows everything to pieces. And this is the safety inspector. And if the safety inspector doesn't give them a pass, they'll get shut down. So Ziggs is like, <laughs> hide the explosions. <laughs> Blow them out somewhere else. Like he's trying to sort of get through this this inspection, like, okay, fir at first he's like, okay, we're gonna try and hide the explosion so he doesn't see them. And then later he's like, fuck it, let's just blow everything up. <laughs> and then he passes because the explosions are just so impressive that the inspector is like, ah, you did well, son. Um, so I, I just adore the storyline of these two characters. Um, and that's, I think that's pretty much why the inspector is so front and center on Ziggs's, Ziggs's own art. Like he's the secondary character in the image. So Ziggs is over here, like showing off, over here, we're blowing up everything that we can find. And over there, we're blowing up all the other stuff. Um, it's like he's, he's giving this tour of like just demonstrating how horrifyingly dangerous everything he does is. And you can see the inspector over here, like looking to him, looking at him being like, yeah, well, I see son. Um, uh, so, like, you, you get the sense of, like, Ziggs is like, I see no problem with any of this whatsoever. Woohoo! <laughs> which is just a, sort of a delightful feeling. Of course, Ziggs also has this fucking horrifying mouth character design, which he shares with the inspector. And I can't help but feel, like, I don't know if this is, like, meant to be explicit, but it feels like there's supposed to be some sort of relation between them. Like, that Ziggs is, like, his nephew or something. Uh, like, it's not it's nothing that it, that's explicitly done uh, in any of the... But just the, the character design similarities between them just makes me feel that way. Um, but then we have, of course, Ziggs's followers in the background doing their explosions and, like, fi flamethrower blowing stuff up. We'll get to the arsenal and this thing uh, a little bit later. But, yeah, in terms of framing, the explosions are going off directly behind Ziggs. And you can see that, like, if you sort of trace the radius of the explosion, like, this, the center of, of where all the explosions are happening, they all converge right behind Ziggs's head and radiate out from there, which is a clever little way to put him in the center of all of it and also sort of imply that he's the cause <laughs> of all of these explosions. Um, and then the secondary character being the safety inspector, who's, like, you can see Six is connected with his arm and they're overlapping a little bit, but he's lower in the image. He's a little bit smaller and he's looking at Ziggs. Like his attention is focused on Ziggs, which makes Ziggs a main character in the image. Um, just, just, just lovely characters. I love their little storyline. Like, I love their, their, <laughs> love their stupid nonsense. It's so good. That's important. We make a good impress impression. The new safety inspector is stopping by. You know what that means? No more explosions. What? No! It means explode things where you can't see them. No more explosions. Are you crazy? <laughs> so good. <sighs> and here we have the end. 
<laughs> the end of the whole thing, where everything just blows sky high <laughs> to kingdom come, and Zix is like, "Wee!" <laughs> and the inspector, for some fucking reason, gives them a pass. I don't know, Yordle stuff. And oddly enough, though, like, this this art is more interesting than the previous one, because the, the previous one is like, it's mostly just characters, like we have the character here, we have the character here, character there, and then just, just explosions, like just just a lot of orange and yellow in the background. So theoretically, that's a less interesting image. Whereas in the level two, there's a bunch of interesting stuff going on because here we have this fisheye lens perspective. And that's props to the artist, by the way, painting things, like painting shit with a fisheye lens effect is hard. Like painting it to look sort of reasonably in a, in a way that, that that's convincing to the eye, as though we have this sort of GoPro-esque fish eye lens effect is difficult. That's a difficult goddamn thing to do, and they manage it, which like, I absolutely want to give props for. But the art itself is, to me, in a lot of ways, a little bit less interesting, because so much of it, like, so much of the background, because Ziggs is the, is the character in the foreground, because everything else is so far away, it seems to be there's a lot of desaturation. Like, all of the, none of these color, colors really pop. Um, even Ziggs himself is kind of desaturated as he's flying into the natural light away from the explosion. So, like, there's a lot less visual impact in this image, unfortunately, I feel. Um, where I feel like either we could have pulled the background away a little bit further so that Ziggs is higher up and, like, we'd get to see more of just the size of the explosion that he's made. Or that we were pulled in a little bit closer to everything where, like, where Ziggs is getting launched rather than being in the middle of his launch at the end. And fill up more of the frame with the explosion and stuff like that. That would make it harder to sort of render these little guys out of the side holding up scores for how good Ziggs' big explosion is. But, like, mm, it feels like we're sort of at a halfway point here where none of the most interesting options were taken. And we sort of ended up in a thing that's fine, but it's just like, I feel like it's Ziggs. Like, it's this level two. There could be more explosion. There could be more impact. There could be more, like, big, loud, bright stuff happening in the frame uh, that's sort of not there, which is like, yeah, uh, but that's a minor complaint. So, Ziggs, why is he the main character? Well, because he's the biggest character in the frame, because he's the closest to the camera, and because, well, he's saturated, he's contrasted, where everything else in the frame, as I talked about, is a little bit more washed out. Simple things. We've talked about these already. Let's see. Neither of those were very interesting, I don't think, which means we can move on to Poppy. I need to blow my nose, though, because I'm snotty. Why am I snotty? Uh. Yeah. Right. Let's see. Uh, the Harbo, considering the inspector calls him Son and reveals that Zix's real name is Sigmund, I headcanon that the inspector is his dad. Well, um, we actually knew that Zix's real name is Sigmund long before this. Heimerdinger has called him Sigmund before, so we know that. Um, but yeah, like, I headcanon the idea that the Inspector is, like, related to him somehow. Um, the judges in the Zig level 2 are priceless. Yeah, they're very funny. Like, I quite like those. Anyway, moving on to the hero of Demacia. Dear Poppy. The hero who doesn't know that she's a hero. As the, the thing itself says, humility is a mark of heroism. But many historians would agree that Poppy is kind of pushing it. So if you don't know Poppy's story, she is... Like, she's a Yordle who was wandering the world for a while, didn't really know what she wanted, didn't know who she was, what she wanted to be. She ran into a dude named Orlon, who was leading a bunch of refugees towards a settlement that they were trying to found where they could be safe from the Rune Wars. That settlement became Demacia. After, like, several hundred years later, that settlement would become Demacia, but Poppy was present at the founding of Demacia. And when Orlon died, he passed his hammer onto her, telling her that it belongs to a true hero of Demacia. And then Poppy was like, oh, it belongs to a true hero of Demacia? I should go and find them. Uh, because she doesn't think that she could possibly be the true hero of Demacia. So she's like, my quest is to find the owner of this hammer, the rightful bearer who will use it to be a hero of Demacia. And so she's wandered around for like a thousand years, uh, like, or at least several hundred years, trying to find the hero of Demacia and being way too humble to realize that the hero of Demacia is her. Uh, so that's her story, and that's why humility is a mark of heroism, but many historians would agree that Poppy is kind of pushing it. Like, stop being humble, lady. The hammer is yours. It's been 400 years. <laughs> yeah, that's why she's always talking about heroes, Coda. That's why. 
Um, so, framing and and uh, composition. Poppy is saturated. She has more contrast. She's a little bit darker. She's very well sort of separated from the background by virtue. Like you can see the bards here in the background and the the cavalier. They are all kind of washed out with the bright yellow of the campfire. Whereas Poppy is like highlights. She has these gorgeous like um, edge light highlights around, especially her hair and her face. And then she's like just very well separated from the rest of the action and she's a big character in screen. Same stuff we've talked about before. Um, I really like the scene here because again, remember Poppy's thing is humility, right? Like Poppy does not put herself above others. She refuses to think of herself as a hero. She refuses to think of herself as important in any way. Um, so how is Poppy framed relative to these other characters? Well, she's kind of sitting below them, actually. Like, they're all sitting elevated on this log, and she's sitting, like, closer to the ground, more down to earth, quite literally. Um, and you can see the, the Cavalier, this guy who we'll talk about later, who's, who's very pompous and very full of himself. He's separate. He's sitting the highest above everybody else. These dudes are singing songs about, like, Yordles doing hero stuff. They're bards. And she's sitting like way down there on the ground, just polishing her at her hammer for some reason. Like just cleaning it, just keeping it nice for the hero. And so like, nice song, guys. We're doing great. I bet the next quest will be fun. Like she, she, you can see the humility on her. Um, Yordles live very long. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Poppy, like Yordles are immortal. Like they do not have a natural lifespan. They can be killed, but they do not have a natural lifespan. They they stick around. They're they're pretty damn good at sticking around. And here we come to the first art in in the game that I really kind of don't like very much. Like, there's good stuff here. Um, there's there's some good things happening. Like, I I quite like the pose on Poppy. It's really dynamic. It's really powerful. I like the composition. Like, where everyone else is sort of shying away from the big beast, and Poppy is the only one who's leaping towards it. That's all good. What I don't like about this card is the decision to like fully take like seventy percent of the card, sixty maybe, and just cover it up in this nothing like just just the monster the idea that like the thing it's supposed to do, it's supposed to make the monster look big right it's supposed to make it big and scary and like make poppy more heroic for confronting it but the framing of it just i just it's it's because they want the framing of poppy in the front with her companions in the back cowering away being frightened she's standing out in front she's doing hero shit right then we want the monster to be really really big so that it's a big threat that Poppy is confronting. And it's kind of trying to have its cake and eat it too, because when you try to make the monster so big, you just take up a lot of the frame with this, which is just flat color. Like, it's just, it's a little bit feather rendered, but it's just flat color. And it's just wasted space in the image, I feel like. And it doesn't really make the monster look that big. It doesn't make it look that threatening. It just, it's just kind of blank, blank space that doesn't really do anything for the storytelling. All the actual stuff is happening, like, here. This is everything that's actually happening in the image happens here. And all of this shit is just, like, extra. And it, it just doesn't do the thing that it's supposed to do, I don't think. So, like, this is, uh, this is probably the first card art in Legends of Runeterra I don't really like. Just because of the compositional decisions. Um, But, you know. It's, it's, not a, it's not a catastrophe or anything. Like, you can see when she's... When it's centered down... When we get into, like, the card crop for the art, it looks fine. It looks perfectly good. But the full art, eh, don't don't really like those compositional choices. Because, like, the more traditional way to show, and this is, like, something that they do in this thing, the more traditional way to show that someone is a small hero confronting a, a large enemy is to put the camera behind the person, low to the ground, looking up at them, and then have the monster itself be this big towering presence in the frame. Um, but they kind of can't do that because Poppy needs to face the camera um, for the card art. And so like that storytelling thing is like, it's really hard to pull off. Like it's a difficult thing to do. And I just, I just, I just don't think they really managed it very well here, unfortunately. Do Poppy level up animation. Yeah, I'll, hmm. I think there's enough animation in Legends of Runeterra now that I can actually do a video about it. Because, like, when R Legends of Runeterra first came out, right, all the level-up animations were just basically, like, there's the Twisted Fate with the card trick, but all of them were just basically, like, like, Garen, his sword swings around one time, 
I was like, they, they were very unelaborate. They were very sort of down to earth, very kind of basic. And there wasn't really that much to talk about. But with the freaking Shurimans having their little mini movie um, as they ascend, and with the much more cinematic level up animations of like Poppy and, 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 and things like that, we might be able to do a video about it at some point. <laughs> just got here. Did you just start? I mean... <laughs> We've only done one, two, three, four, five, six. We've done like seven cards, so you're early. But it's been an hour, so you're late. <laughs> uh, like, there's plenty of stream left to go. Like, you, you, you just stick around, buddy. Oh my god, there's 1,500 people here almost. Well, 1,400. Hello. Uh, there's plenty of stream left to go, but it'll be a while. Right. Oh, there's some super chats. Uh, Poppy is the best character in League. Just came from the Shivana video. Keep doing what you're doing. Adore you. Stay safe. Thank you very much, Daniel. And TM, when you get to Vagar, please also do his and his followers' voice lines. They're so good. Yeah, mm, no, it's a little... It's a little... I can't really do the voice lines um, on a stream like that. Well, it's, it's a little troublesome, basically. Uh, and I kind of don't want to mess around with it. But we can talk about them a little bit once we get there. So, Vagar. Our lovely little friend. Our tiny, adorable, short, just itty-bitty, teeny-weeny, little overlord. Oh, look at that small boy. He's adorable. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not a huge fan of Vagar's character design generally, which I've talked about before because he's a black mage from Final Fantasy. Like he, he's a black mage from, he's a Final Fantasy black mage. Like he's got some spikes on him. And like big gauntlets and shit, but he's a Final Fantasy black mage. That's that's his whole thing is that he's just a Final Fantasy black mage, and that's just not that interesting um, for his character design. And League of Legends needs to give him a visual update. Like he needs to he needs to have something that's more specific to him because Vagar's story, for those who don't know, is Vagar. Once upon a time, he was a good little nice yordle. Like he was he was a perfectly nice, pleasant, friendly yordle who just hung out with some human wizards doing space sorcery. Like, he learned about, about like, space magic and things like that, and he was having a nice time. He was just doing scholar shit, right? Then Mordekaiser comes along, and is like, oh, that Yordle seems to have great magical powers. I shall capture him and throw him in a dungeon and torture him for 200 years. Which he did. Um, Mordekaiser captured Vagar and tormented him and hurt him and forced him to use his magic to do terrible things. And Vagar kind of got driven insane by that. Like, it, it fucked him up pretty badly. And then when Mordekaiser is, uh, falls, Vagar emerges out into the world a very different Yordle. He's become this little screaming megalomaniacal, uh, this, this lunatic right here. He becomes this character. And he goes around in the world, and he's like, ah, uh, I see that there's a big tower over there with an evil wizard in it. Well, I shall go and destroy the evil wizard and thus prove myself to be the evilest wizard of all. Like, that's basically his thing, is that he, he's decided that he's going to be the greatest evil overlord in the world. And so he goes around defeating evil wizards and being like, yes, I have proven my superiority. And then all the villagers that this evil wizard were oppressing, they come along and go, oh, you killed the evil wizard? Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. That was so nice of you. And he's like, no, I'm not nice. I am evil. I am the knight. But they will not take him seriously, ever. Um, and so Vagar just gets frustrated and leaves because he, he tries... He tries to be evil. He tries to be an evil overlord like Mordekaiser, but he fails. He always fails, and the implication of his story is that Vagar isn't really an evil overlord. Like, he's not actually evil, but he's just, he's turned into this cartoonish parody of Mordekaiser as a way to get revenge on him, essentially. Um, that, like, that it, he's turned into this, this cartoon version of Mordekaiser as a, as a sort of a means to cope with his trauma, essentially. And so Vagar is this very, very evil bad guy who's just not capable of doing evil. Like, he, he tries, he tries so hard to be a bad guy. Like, he has the castle, he has the lightning, he has, like, the bards, he has the bats, but he just can't get himself to be mean. Like, he just can't do it. He tries, and he screams, and he throws spells around, but he can't actually hurt people. <laughs> Um, which makes him so adorable and so lovely. I, I, I like him so much. Um, 
he he's such a he's such a lovely character, but the problem is he just looks like a fucking white white ma uh, black mage. Like he just looks like a black mage. Um, and what I would really like is for him to have a design that's more specifically, like, more explicitly about being a parody version of Mordekaiser. One that's more specifically about being a parody version of an evil overlord. Um, like, some, something that looks a little bit more, like, explicitly in that direction, rather than trying to look, like, rather than just being a black mage with spikes on. Like, th there's some storytelling there that could be done. Um, that's, that's quite good. Oh my god, Vagar is Megamind. Yeah, he's, he's a Megamind kind of character. Like, he's a little bit like that. Um, but that's Vagar's story, and that's his character design thing. That there's a whole other thing. Anyway, this 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 artwork, very good. I quite like it because it really does demonstrate Vagar's sensibilities, right? Like he has this evil castle with evil spires and evil little bats flying around. Uh, like he, like it has all the aesthetics of like a '90s cartoon villain. Like he should be on the gummy bears or something like. Like he should be in like a '90s Disney cartoon as like the bad guy who's incompetent. Like it's that vibe is just everywhere. He's got this whole silly fantasy thing set up and it works so well. Um, and he's framed like he's literally raised above the other characters just by virtue of the angle. And sort of standing on this pedestal and staring at the night being, ah! <laughs> um, and like with his arms out and his staff and being like, I am Vega, the evil of it all. He's doing that whole thing. And that's what sets him apart. As well as the other things we've talked about before, like with him being, he has more contrast, he has more saturation. Everyone else is a little bit more washed out. It all works pretty well. Then we have his level two. And one of the things I really love about Vagar and like his followers and his artwork and his presence in Legends of Runeterra is that he's made minions canon. The minions are canon now. <laughs> They're canon, look at those little buddies. They're just like hanging out. They're getting thrown off the bridge. They're doing stuff. It's wonderful. The minions are now canon. And I love that. I adore that Vagar canonically, like all the minions in League of Legends are canonically Vagar's minions. It's so lovely. Oh, people wanted me to read the texts? Okay. The world will fear me. It will wear my scars for all eternity. It will ache under the weight of my power. It will shudder under the shadow of my enormity. And that's excerpt from chapter one of How to Be a Supervillain by Lord Vagar. Since you asked. <laughs> and this is just like... <laughs> like, it's just a, his supervillain laugh. Excerpt from chapter 12 of How to Be a Supervillain. It's an important chapter, to be fair. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this is the minions are canon. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that the minions are canon, and I'm so happy that they're Vagar's minion. It's lovely. Um, maybe animations on the short channel? Uh, maybe. I don't really... I can't really do it in one minute, I don't think. That's, like, not enough time, but... Yeah. Um, Wings of Shoe. How about a mini pre-rework Mordekaiser skin for Vagar? Yeah, something like that. I mean, I always felt like, this is just me, I feel like Vagar's voice really shouldn't be so screechy. Like, it really shouldn't be like, Aah! like, it shouldn't have that quality. I always felt like Vagar would be better as, like, a Marvin the Martian kind of character. Ah, yes, I am the evil Lord Vagar, and I shall take over the world. Like, like a little bit more like a nerd, um, <laughs> rather than being sort of screechy and kind of, ah. But that fits in better with his, like, his whole thing about being so upset that he's short, um, like, having him be screechy and kind of squeaky and small. Whereas, whereas I always think of him as more of a Marvin the Martian, like, Ah, oh, yes, my Imodium 248 space modulator. Like, that kind of thing. But that's just me. Anyway, this, the card art, we're supposed to be looking at the art of the cards. Yes. So. Framing. Yes, framing. Um, so there's a little bit of framing going on here. You can see this portal from which Mecha Vigar is emerging. Um, you can see how that kind of leads into... Almost like a spiral, like this, like this little thing. So the bridge and the portal itself becomes the frame for Vagar. And of course, Vagar is the largest thing on screen, which he's very happy with. He's he's very large now, and he's, he's very pleased with that. Um, so like that sort of centers him as the main thing in the image. And then there's the usual stuff like saturation, like contrast, which is the highest on Vagar, and everyone else is a little bit more desaturated. Um, but this is actually interesting because it's a very, very busy card. Like, a lot of the cards tend to have a thing that they do where the immediate area around the champion is kept clear. Like, we talked about that with um, with Nami, for example. We can see, like, the immediate area right around her. Like, there's so much detail and stuff going on, but right around Nami, there's this sort of empty space 
just kind of giving her room to be the main character. And the Vagar art is interesting because it doesn't do that. Like, Vagar is, is mobbed by this all kinds of things going on all around him. The only empty space that there really is is the bubble, the thing that he, like the cockpit, whatever, the thing that he's inside that gives him that little bit of negative space to occupy. But the thing itself is like, there's so busy, there's lightning bolts, there's minions flying around, there's the, all this busyness in the background. And that gives the whole scene much more of a, like, a, it gives it the whole scene this frantic energy, like, because you, you can see it's Vagar marching out and he's got his minions and he's got, like, uh, like his, his companions and his followers and stuff and everything. Like, ah, there's this mad energy of, like, ah, oh, we march to war, uh, my little army. Like, you can hear the minions going, ah, 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 like, in the, like, and they get sapped by lightning from his staff. Like, there's this chaotic sort of gremlin energy to the whole image. And the busyness of the aesthetic, at least I think, helps sell that like it helps it all make make it all feel more like this is a bunch of cartoon villains going to war basically like it's very silly it's sort of very over the top the energy is great like look at Vagar's pose in this mech like he's not striding forward like a battle sword like he's not a power ranger doing a mega sword thing he's summoned this little ridiculous robot thing that sort of waddles across the bridge holding a giant book and a staff and like <laughs> it's it's all comedy it's all fun it's all adorable I love it and yeah as people are pointing out in chat that's the Morella Nomicon right there and that right there the hat you may not recognize it because the colors are different, but that is Rabadon's death cap on his head. <laughs> or at least the version of it, anyway. I love Vagar so much. Like, I love him. I love his minions. Oh, we'll talk about his minions. He's got some fantastic minions. Um, but this is such a good Yordle. He deserves a visual update. He really does. Anyway, darkness, not that interesting. This one's a little bit interesting. Uh, like, just because we get a sense of scale, we see that Vagar is apparently using this thing to stun a Noxian soldier, who's probably quite fucked. Um, like, he's gonna take a big blow to the head, probably, because he's gotten... He's standing right at the edge of it. Poor guy. Anyway, moving on to Zerath, our big beefy boy Zerath, who's gotten himself a minor visual update as well. Um, and this one's actually interesting, because, like, one of my complaints about Zerath in his base form right now is that, like... He doesn't look like a coffin, right? Like, the, the, the lore idea of Zerath is that he turned into this being of pure energy. Like, that he's not, he, he, he doesn't really have a body anymore. He's just energy. He's just this pure entity of power. Essentially, an Archon from StarCraft. Like, he's that kind of thing. He's just this glowing, pulsing cloud of magical energy that exists. And then what Nasus and Renekton do is that they grab him before he has time to unleash his full power. They stuff him into a coffin that's sort of designed to magically contain things. And then they throw him deep down in a tomb, um, along with Renekton, who's like thrown down there to, to basically wrestle with him and, and hold him contained for all eternity. Doesn't work that well, but... Um, and so one of my complaints about Zerath is that he doesn't re like the idea of him is that he's this energy thing that's trying to escape from a magical coffin that's trying to contain him, right? Like this coffin that still has these magics inside it that hold on to him and like trying to hold him back, hold him down, and he's trying to break free from them. He's trying to break out of them. And the trouble I've always had with Zerath is that his armor form, it just looks like armor. Like it doesn't look like a coffin that has been exploded. It just looks like armor. It just looks like he's a person wearing armor. And they've sort of done a little bit of work on him here, where you can sort of see the idea that if this thing is fit together more, you can see them level three, like if you, if you clamped all this together and like really sort of put it back together the way it was, you can kind of see a little bit more the idea that it's a coffin, with the trouble being that he has arms. Like this is the one thing about Zerath's character design that I think is like, the, the easiest improvement for Zerath's character design, just just take away his arms. Just don't give him arms. Because that way it would look like a sarcophagus. Like, it would look like a sarcophagus that is, like, floating in the air and, like, lightning is sort of breaking out from inside it and stuff. But the fact that he has arms, it just looks like armor. And they've tried a little bit. They've tried a little bit to make him... Like, to give him a little bit more of that sarcophagus shape in the way that he's put together, but the arms just ruin it. Like, you can't... When you have the arms, you can't... It's not a sarcophagus anymore. It's just armor, and it just... It still doesn't quite work. I generally like the aesthetic upgrade. Like, I like the mask, like the big flat mask. I like the sort of more geometric shape of it all, but as a character design entire, eh, eh, 
just not no it just doesn't quite work for me anyway framing the framing is pretty easy uh because you can it's right there like they've drawn it on very sort of nicely and conveniently and then a secondary framing of these circles of stone or whatever these platforms that circle around Zerath. but the actual main frame of the whole thing is right there and Zerath inside it with like an, a secondary um, compositional thing. All the lightning bolts, all the energy that's swirling towards him, all the lines of the image keeps leading the eye to Zerath himself, right? At the, well, not quite at the center. He's like a little bit off center, but at the center of the composition, even if not at the center of the image, there is Zerath with everything pulling towards him. Um, which centers him. And then there's the other things of like, he's more saturated, he's got more contrast, he's got more highlighting, whereas all the other characters in the image do not, which is the standard Legends of Runeterra thing that they always do in order to make these images work. And yeah, it's fine. Like, I'm, I'm not really excited by any of Zerath's art. Like, I think his level 2 art is actually kind of bad. Well, no, not bad. It's not bad at all, but it just looks a lot more like a level 1 art to me. Because all he's really doing is he's blasting like one person with lightning. Um, and I feel like Zerath, when he levels up, should be doing more than just, like, I shall blast one person with lightning. I am power incarnate! Like, I feel like Zerath level 2 should be more like, yeah, as people are saying in chat, it should be a little bit more like Palpatine on, on the floor being like, UNLIMITED POWER! Like, it should be a little bit more like throwing lightning bolts across the sky and, like, unraveling the earth and stuff, rather than just, like, sapping one dude. Like, it's just one dude. Like, it's... He, he's, he's Zerath. Like, he can do more than zap just one dude. I like the composition, though. I quite like the... I like the way the chains snake around him. I like the curve. Like, the sort of metapod, like, shape almost that he's got in his shape language. Like, where you can really see that he's puffing out his chest, kind of. Like, he has this very dominant, powerful energy. It's just... What's he doing? He's sapping one guy. Like, one dude. Come on. He can do more than that, Zerath. Like, this, for me, feels more like this should be his level 2 art, frankly. Like, that's the thing, is like, but... Okay, so, okay, compositionally, though, uh, let's find... Let's find a Zier for a second here. Uh, Zier, you are a 3 cost, aren't you? 4 cost? Where are you, old man? Where the hell is he? Oh, yeah, there he is. So, um... It's a version of this. Right, like, say, so Serath and Azir have sort of the same compositional elements in their level 3 versions, where Azir is rising up and, like, commanding the Shuriman Empire. He's got soldiers, he's got the Sun Disk, he's got the buildings of the Empire all standing tall, everything restored, everything in its proper place, everything put together the way it's supposed to be. Zerath, on the other hand, as he ascends to his highest power, He's not really making an empire. You can see he's more like animating these lightning servants. Like he's creating these zombies in his own service. He's throwing all these pillars off the ground. He's not building anything. He's more like just exploding out across everything. So like the storytelling here is supposed to contrast the way that the two of them wield the power that they have. Um, yeah, and as someone points out in, uh, as Iron Brew points out in chat, his coffin also looks a little bit more shattered. Like, it looks a little bit more frayed, like it's falling apart a little bit more, like he's escaping, his power is finally emerging fully from this thing that's constantly containing him. Um, but this Serath is more like, he's he's supposed to be framed more as as a mark of ruin. Like, he's supposed to, he's destroying things, he's breaking build, he's destroying landmarks. Yes, bonus suck, making a good point. He's destroying landmarks, which is like his thing, um, as a character is, is destroying landmarks in the game. So he's supposed to be this force of destruction, where Azir is this force of restoration of the Empire kind of thing. And the storytelling there is fine, it's just that for Serath as a character, this feels like his level 2. Like, this feels more like what he would do when he levels up the first time, and then his level 3 feels more like he would be leveling mountains and shit, is kind of the thing. Um, yeah, the, the coffin fragments on his arms are flat-out gauntlets in this version. Yeah, that's the problem, like I talked about previously, Nicky Boy. Um, is like, Serath's coffin just looks like armor. Like, it just looks like a suit. Um, which is like, eh, it's the one thing. Like, just, just cut his arms off. Like, he would be great if you just cut his arms off. But oh well. Uh, oh, right. I need to get rid of the Empire Sea Descendant. There we go. Moving on to Senna, who has been transitioned from a follower 
to an actual champion card. Why don't I work at Riot? Uh, it's probably because I keep calling their CEO an asshole on Twitter. Like, it's, it's probably because I keep calling their chief operating officer a, a dickhead for gro groping his employees, which he did. Chief operating officer of Riot, Scott Gelb, was credibly accused of groping his employees' genitals and farting on their faces during meetings. And Riot said, yes, he has acted inappropriately, but we need to keep him as a leader because he's so valuable. He's so valuable as a leader, we can't fire him, so we're just going to give him two weeks unpaid vacation. So Scott Gelb can, like, so I keep calling Scott Gelb an asshole on Twitter, and I keep calling Nicolas Laurent, who is the CEO of Riot, a bit of an asshole on Twitter. So, like, first of all, I have never applied to work at Riot. Um, uh, well, at least not... Yeah. Uh, I don't apply to work at Riot, and second of all, they wouldn't hire me because I never shut up about how their leadership are assholes. Anyway, let's talk about the card art. So, Zena, Zena is, is an interesting uh, card art because Lucian is there, and this is like this is like a very different version of, of a Champion Splash, where usually in Champion Splashes we'll see them like doing the stuff that they normally do, like doing the stuff that they spend their time doing, right? Like the, or important bits of, of their story that are sort of key to their character. Senna has a much different vibe because Senna here, you can see this is her essentially like she, you can see she's looking at the black mist and like the ghostly energy and the power she has as a wraith as an undead and the and the expression on her is like this almost this sense of like she's being drawn towards it or obsessed with it she has this dark ghostly power right here and then behind her hand on her shoulder sort of tenderly like pulling at her and saying senna come back to me we have lucian calling her back towards humanity so there's this little bit of storytelling going on about Senna's dual nature, which at once she is tied to the darkness and she's drawn to the darkness. Like she has an obsession with the black mist. She has an obsession with the dead. And then on the other hand, she has her mortal ties, like her ties to Lucian, her like her, her duties as a sentinel and her love and like all of that stuff. And so there's this, there's this storytelling going on, like this tension in Senna's character is being shown here in a way that's really quite subtle. Um, like it's not very it's not very obvious exactly what's going on here but once you sort of sit and look at it and take in the vibes and sort of get the feeling of like what's what's the emotional play between the characters it's like it's it's really quite nice like it's a really nice bit of storytelling for who Senna is as a character like you can see her eyes lit up obsessed with these deadly ghostly energies and Lucian like being hey hey come back you don't belong there anymore right and, and there's a great expression on his face. Like, Lucian, most of the time when we see Lucian, like, he's just, he's just angry. Uh, that's, like, mostly his thing. Is like, he's just mad. He's just mad at stuff. Like, he's he's just got, like, big dark brows. And, like, uh, I'm Lucian. I'm the Avenger. Blah, blah, blah. Light singer. Blah, blah, blah. Um, that's most of the time that's, that's Lucian. But then here with Senna, it's much softer. Like, it's a much softer expression. It's a much gentler expression. Right? Like, this is this is him when he's actually being a human person, rather than being a light sentinel, rather than being the light slinger. So, moving on to her level two. I say taking a sip of tea in the middle of my sentence. Um, so this is Senna in a different mode. This is Senna as the leader of the light sentinels. And, like, I really like this splash art a lot um, because there's a couple of good storytelling things going on. First of all, Senna has the unique ability to manipulate the Black Mist and even to free souls that are trapped within the Black Mist from their containment. Like, she can free them, she can break them free of Viego's control, she can break them free of the control of the Black Mist. And so look at what all the tendrils of darkness are doing here. All of them are sort of converging on Senna. They're, they're all being drawn to her. They're all coming at her, sort of approaching her because she's the one who has the ability to sort of, like, to to intercede with them, like, to to work with them, to draw them into her. This is how she destroys Viego, by the way, in, in the uh, disappointing uh, uh, Absolution cinematic. She draws the Black Mist out of him. She pulls it from him, denies him access to its powers, and that's when they can finally seal him. Just gonna 
drink my last tea before it's cold. Um, so, like, I quite like that bit. Um, and th that's also a compositional element. Like, all these tendrils, all these things, like, they keep pulling the f the the swing, the flow of the image keeps being pulled towards Senna, who is also centered. And you can see how all the other characters, like, they emerge from this central point behind Senna. They all emerge radially, like radiance, shining out from her, basically. Um, which I think is a very, a very clever way to do it. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but I think maybe it's not Olaf back there, but it's whoever used the axes before Olaf did. Kind of looks like it's the dude back there. And we have some of the other Sentinel cards, which we'll talk about, because, like, there's some fucking cool Light Sentinel character designs, man. Which we didn't get to see jack shit of in the actual Light Sentinels event, but now that we have them as card art, oh, we get to spend some time with some cool-ass motherfucking Sentinels, and I'm quite happy about that. Oh, wait, didn't mean to do that. Which is very cool. But this is like, this is Senna sort of, she's centered in the frame. All the lines of the image draw towards her. She's kind of separated a little bit from the other characters. And everything sort of radiates out from her. And that makes her the central character. Very good compositional choices. <laughs> Let's see, that one's just cool, but there's not much to say about it. And that's about it. Yeah. Then there's poor Scion. Poor, poor Scion. So, uh, Scion's story, in case you're not familiar, is that he was the guy who killed Jarvan the first, right? He's a Demacian general, just super badass, powerful soldier dude, who charged into battle against the Demacians, killed Jarvan the first with his bare fucking hands, and then he was killed by the Demacians all around him. Like, he charged into a battle he knew he couldn't win, and then he killed Jarvan the first, choking him to death. And then he died. But um, an element of Jarvan the First exists still within Scion. His jaw, this thing right here, that's the crown of Jarvan the First that was taken from the battlefield and grafted onto him um, in death. He's a Noxian. Noxian general. Noxian, not Demacian. Yes. No, Jarvan the First. It was Jarvan the First. I can show you. Uh... Scion Universe. I can bring it up on screen. Dun, 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 there. Scion tore straight through the Demacian line, seeking out their leader, King Jarvan I. And he finally reached Jarvan. The fight was brutal. Scion dropped his axe and with a final burst of strength, tore the king's crown from his head with one hand, clamping another around his throat. Jarvan's guards stabbed Scion again and again, but his grip did not loosen. Only when the enemy's king was slain did Scion allow death to claim him. So, Jarvan the first. Don't know why people think it's this Jarvan the second uh, for some reason, but it's Jarvan the first. Anyway, so... Um, he dies, and he is entombed in Noxus as a great warrior or whatever, and then some time passes, Borum Darkwill is deposed by Swain, and Swain is like, I could use a really powerful weapon of war, and Vladimir is like, well, my liege, I think I may know a way to accomplish that, and so Vladimir, along with a bunch of blood mages, conduct a ritual to revive Scion as a raging, maddened battle tank of a zombie. Um, which is why he has this furnace in his stomach that's blood magic powering him right there. And they use him as a weapon of war. And eventually, because Scion doesn't care if he kills Noxians or Demacians or whoever, he just kills whatever is close to him when he's deployed in combat. Swain is like, this is not very effective because he keeps killing my own army, so that's not very great. So what he does instead is he takes Scion and is like, okay, uh, when whenever someone rebels against Noxus... Whenever someone rebels against Swain's authority, he'll be like, okay, I'm going to send you a present. And then he sends Scion to their city where he unleashes him to just destroy everything and kill everyone until they agree to rejoin the Noxian Empire. So he uses Scion as a weapon of terror against his own people, basically. So yeah, like Swain might be a bad guy. Just, 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 po just, just pointing that out. Um. Anyway, uh, 
So the splash art here, like the framing is pretty obvious because Scion is making his own frame. Uh, this is him just tearing a building apart with his bare hands. Yeah, like you can see the thing crumbling around him. And that creates the negative space um, that he needs to be a frame for him. Then there's some very obvious highlighting, like this pure white blue tinged ed edge lighting around the top of his shoulder, sort of highlighting his enormous muscles and his power and his strength. Um, and then, of course, he's more contrasted, he's more saturated than the characters in the background, the other zombies um, that get that get used um, in battle along with Zion. So, like, the composition here is pretty clear, um, like, fairly obvious, and it's very well put together. One little character design element of Zion, by the way, this is a classic thing. When you have a big hulking character, like a really big character, you want them to look extra muscular and extra powerful. Just make their head a little bit smaller, like a little bit smaller than it should be. Just give them a slightly smaller head than is actually reasonable, and their entire body will look way more bulky by comparison. It's a very, it's a very classic trick. The Hulk does it. Um, lots of big, bulky characters like this do it. But it's just notice how small their heads actually are relative to things like their, their like their kneecaps, or their fingers, <laughs> something like that. But it's a very effective way to create a big character. Anyway, his level two is. Yeah, I mean, again, the framing is fairly obvious because Scion makes it. You can see this cloud of dust and debris um, that bursts out along with Scion from the background creates this sort of frame, this, this negative background space, this sort of flat background color against which Scion stands out clear as day. Imagine if there hadn't been this dust cloud behind him. Imagine if you'd had this color, this like gray steel blue sky or a steel gray bluish sky right behind his gray steel bluish body like scion wouldn't stand out against this background at all like he, he would he would basically fade into it so instead we have this cloud of dust that creates this darker space against which his pale skin can be really like effectively highlighted um and then there's also just like that scion is in terms of narrative the center of the image like he's the person who's doing a thing and everyone else and everything else is reacting to the thing that he's doing which again, in terms of visual storytelling, tells us that Scion is the acting agent in this image. Um, but yeah, this is excellent. And, and uh, as always, like Legends of Runeterra has some of the best incidental character design in, in League of Legends at all. Like, look how different the characters in the backgrounds look like. Look how like look how different this guy's face is from that guy's face, right? Like they have different hairstyles, they have different facial shapes, they have different uh, facial anatomies. They have different like body types. Like it's, it's it's just nice to see like the diversity and the and the differences between characters in the background of Legends of Runeterra art, sort of demonstrating that you can have very varied and interesting character design even in games that are based around like sort of heightened fantasy aesthetics. <laughs> Someone says it's Sithria. I'm pretty sure Sith. I'm pretty sure that's not Sithria down there. Uh, reasonably sure. That that's not Sithria. Anyway, his level three. This is, uh, or well, not level three. It's his. It's when you kill him and he doesn't die uh, when he's ephemeral. Is Scion like at the end of the battle where you can see people have tried very hard uh, to make him stop? There's a lot of arrows. He's been torn. There's holes in him. So like where the power, the blood magic is leaking out. He's got an axe embedded deep in his side, and yet, and yet. This man is not about to stop doing what he does best, which is just beating the shit out of people. Um, and here, like, he's just the biggest thing in this in in the entire image. Like, he's just the largest character on screen, which makes him instantly the central character. There's also a little bit of subtle, um, like, notice how the perspective of the image, like, you can see this this spear right here and this one right here. They point towards a common vanishing point way up there. So you have this three. Two-point perspective? Yeah, probably more of a two-point perspective, really. Where there's a vanishing point somewhere way the hell up there, and we're, like, way down at ground level looking up at Scion, but you can also see how his body itself, it sort of fits into this sort of triangular shape as well that aligns with the perspective of the image. Like, that just, like, that works really well. And as people are pointing out, uh, it's probably the Radiant Guardian who is being thrown to the ground over here because she's present in... Not in this one, but another one of Scion's follower cards. The Radiant Guardian is there. Um, and so, because of the blonde hair, people are presuming that that's probably the Radiant Guardian getting killed really, really badly <laughs> by Scion here. We also have the Lady of Blood hanging out. 
just over on the side, like looking at the effectiveness of her, of the weapon that she's deploying in combat. And as you can see here, she's also rendered like much less distinctly than Scion. This is this thing we talked about again, like making certain characters blurry, like making them less distinct in the image in order to like highlight the central character and avoid having two main protagonists. Let's see. Nope. Uh, no. Yeah, we can talk about the Ruinous Acolyte. Like, I was sort of considering, like, but this is just more Serath complaining, like, it doesn't look like a coffin, it looks like armor. Um, it looks like a fucking Darth Vader suit. Um, I think, I think, hmm, hang on, I don't know, does the Ruinous Acolyte show up as a regular card? It's a two cost. Yeah, he's down there, okay, we'll talk about him then. And move on to the Demacian Sentinel, who is clearly like sort of a Fiora school um, of swordsmanship. The dude in the full ground foreground of Scion level one looks like TV's guy. No, no, he doesn't. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I should check super chats, by the way. Uh, Vagar is such a nerd that he vanity published his own book without about a thing he's not even that good at doing. Yeah, Matthew, that's very much what he is. Hey, Uncle Skyn, wondering if you got any tips on how we can organize ourselves on creative process, like a routine or method to get things done. Nope. I, sorry. Like, the best, the best, the best advice I have is to track the stuff that you do. Like, get some kind of app or a calendar and then write down the stuff that you do each day. And that can sort of help you keep track of, of what you've actually, what you've actually been doing. Um, but... No, I, 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 I'm vastly disorganized and very bad at getting things done, except in a panic at the last minute. So, sorry, can't help you there. Right. Demacian Sentinel. Um, she has a Scottish accent, by the way, in the cards, uh, which, I, which I think quite delightful. Is like, I, I like to imagine that she charges at the black mist, like, I come catch ya, we cunts! Uh, <laughs> like, I can't do a Scottish accent, but like, in, in, that, sort of, in that sort of voice, just shouting at them in, in Scots. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm a little, I'm a little mixed on her arm. Like there, it, it feels a little weirdly twisted the way it goes into the saber here. It's a little anatomy thing that I'm not really sure if the foreshortening works on the, what the character is doing right here, but it's also a very minor nitpick. Anyway, the pose I quite like. I like the dynamism. Like you have these swooping curves, like th up through the hip here out across the torso and then swinging into that, sort of transferring the energy into that stab in a very nice way. Again, with the foreshortening, like I feel like this blade should be turned more towards us rather than sideways. Little little nitpicky things about about that, but I like the I like the pose. I like the use of color. Like you can see how the background is she's on the shadow aisles doing stuff. So everything in the background is sort of like teal and it's sort of very dark and it's like teals, blacks, browns, grays. And then she is all like bright white cloak and this like sheer black outfit that makes her like highly contrasted with the background, uh, which I think is quite lovely. Um, yeah, not a lot to say about this one. Like it's, it's perfectly fine. Like I have some nitpicks about the specifics of how the anatomy is put together, uh, where some parts of it don't quite work for me, but that's minor shit. Ah, this one's lovely. A group shot of the Bandle City Gunners under Tristana's command. <laughs> Just a lovely little group of characters, right? And here again is where I gush about the character design in Legends of Runeterra. Because, like, look how different these characters... Like, they're all yordles, right? Like, they're all, like, more or less the same size. They all have more or less the same proportions because they are so tiny that you can't kind of can't do much with them. But look how different they are. Look at all the things that the character designers are doing to make these characters look different from one another. Like, using the eyebrows on this yordle here to create, like, this large eye shape there, whereas the eyebrows here, because they're so lowered over the eyes, gives a completely different mood. And, like, it's just, like, uh, yeah, using all of the character to do the design. Yes, I like it. Like, the costuming is... is like distinctly different their poses they are like the way that they hold themselves the way that they carry themselves in terms of of their moves it's just, yeah, good character design love it is that graves gun in the background i do not believe so no 
Oh, the guy who's holding this? No, no, that, that's his own gun. He has his own shotgun. Not quite Graves' size, um, but quite good. Anyway, Hex Explosive Minefield. This would be uh, one of Sig's landmarks. And here there's an interesting compositional thing happening because try and follow the sand. Like, try and follow this. Like, you can see these swooping curves and the lines of it. Can you see how, like, that, that sort of leads down into the valley where you sort of follow this swoop and this curve, and then that eventually leads you over to, oh, hey, like, so the sand itself and, like, these lines of landmines that they're leaving behind, which is, like, kind of mean of them, it all sort of forms this little swooping arc that kind of leads you to the thing itself, which, again, we'll get to this thing later, but it's one of Sig's contraptions. And here, we also have a little bit of a frame. Like, you can see the edge here of the tree going into this. So that there's this little sort of, there's a break open of it here, but there's this little frame right there that kind of creates this, this little bit of framing around the thing itself as it's like powering on and leaving. Um, that I think that I think is quite lovely. Like it's a really nice little composition to sort of draw a connection between these these things and that thing. That this thing is somehow responsible for or leaving these things behind or has something to do with them, um, which is quite good storytelling for a thing which is just a landmark, right? Ha, the Yordles, breaking the Geneva Convention. Yeah. <laughs> so, the inventive uh, chemist is one of Ziggs's followers. Giselle was one of Professor Heimerdinger's best students until she heard of Ziggs's strange experiments down in Zon. It then it was all explosives this, and could you recommend me for an internship that? And I like the lore that's being implied here, is that Heimerdinger is at Piltover University, and he has, like, Yordle students who are, like, listening to him, and then some of them are like, Oh, Ziggs is doing experiments in Zon, you say? Explosions, you say? Uh, Professor Heimerdinger, could I have a transfer, please? <laughs> Extra credit for, for explosives research? I kind of love that, like, the idea that they're sort of rival professors of various Yordle sciences. <laughs> yeah, Ziggs poach, uh, poached from Heimerdinger. Yeah, he did. Um... Which I, th which I think is quite lovely. Anyway, uh, here's a Yordle who actually has some fuzz on her. And this is something we talked about way earlier in the stream, right around the start. Is that um, the way that Riot has been designing Yordles, it's very much a thing of sexual dimorphism between the characters. Which is, like, not in itself a problem. It's just a little bit... All the female Yordles have just been smooth the whole time. Like, all of them just, like, completely smooth little mini-humans. And then all the male Yordles have been, like, little fuzzballs. Like, they're little furry animals. And it's always just that it's just such a limiting thing where of like where all the, oh, they have to look like little humans, do they? Well, that's boring because you can do so much more with them. You can make them look all kinds of different ways, especially when they're like meant to be these fairy creature kind of things. And here we see Legends of Runeterra, like it's been fixing many of the other problems with League of Legends, is taking a crack at making a little bit of fix for that in Legends of Runeterra, where... Uh, for the Yordles, where we have female Yordles that now have actual proper fuss and fur, which also comes across with where she she's a six cost, right? With Ava Achiever, who is probably my favorite character from this new set, um, who's also a fuzzy little Yordle. Which is like, yay, finally, like, finally the Yordles get to look like they actually belong to the same species. Because the problem was always that, like, when, when, like, if all the female Yordles were just smooth like Tristana, and all the male Yordles were these little fuzzballs, it just kind of looked like they were two different species. Because, fun fact, they used to be. Because way back in the day, way back in the forgotten long ago times of Season 1, and before Season 1, Tristana was not a Yordle. She was a Megaling, which was a sort of little goblin creature. Like, basically goblins in all but name. Um, sort of think World of Warcraft goblins or gnomes, something like that. Um, and they were a separate species from Yordles. And Riot very quickly retconned that. Like, they very quickly was like, oh no, that's too confusing, we don't want to deal with more species than we need to, so they retconned all the Meglings out of existence, and now they are all just Yordles. And Poppy, I believe, was originally designed also to be a Megling, which is why she's so smooth. Um... But then, it's like, they very quickly, it was like, when she was came out, pretty much, I think, she was already, they had already retconned the Meglings out and turned Poppy into an actual Yordle. Um, it's so like, that's the history of why the female Yordles looked so smooth, while the male Yordles looked so fuzzy. They used to be different species. 
Um, so I'm glad that they've sort of been unified a little bit more to say, okay, Yordles can be smooth, they can be fuzzy, they can be all kinds of different things. They can be fizz, uh, they can be brown, they can be blue, they can be violet sky, they can be purple, they can be hurtful, they can be anything you like. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll get to Timo and Fizz. Don't worry about it, Noah. Uh, we'll get to Timo and Fizz. We'll do that at the near the end of the stream, I think. Because we're focusing on the new cards right now. Um, so that's the history of that. So it's like, nice to see fuzzy female Yorl. I'm just happy to see that. Anyway, uh, biggest character on the screen. She's more saturated. Secondary character being the safety inspector who's going like, Ah, this thing is smoking and it's full of acid and you've got a bomb in it. What are you doing? Oh, it's fine, old man. Don't worry. Um... um <laughs> they can be brown. Yeah. I can be brown. I can be blue. I can be violet sky. <laughs> um... So yeah, uh, not a lot else going on here compositionally. I don't think like the smoke and the like there's a little bit of framing here. I think just a bit for the main character, but not that much. Mostly she's just highlighted with light and she's saturated and she's got higher contrast than the secondary character in the image. I like that we're seeing it from below. Like we haven't talked that much about angles. Um, will there be a VOD? Yes, there will be a VOD. How long will the stream be? Oh, some hours. It could be up to eight hours campfire, depending on how long I go. Um, <laughs> Um, who knows? Like, it, sometimes it takes a billion years. Um, what the hell is this thing? Right, the angle. We haven't talked a lot about angles. Like, so, often I talk about Dutch angles and stuff on these streams. But here, the angle is we're placed below the two characters. Like, we're below the eyeline of the inspector. We're below, very much below her eyeline, looking up at her. Which, again, that creates a sensation of not being in power in the scene. And this is like very basic stuff. If you show characters from the top down, like from a perspective from above them looking down, as a viewer, you get a sense of power over them. If you show characters from like eyeline, like if your eyeline are equal to theirs, as for example, it is here with Poppy, you get a sense of togetherness. Like you get a sense of equality with the characters. Whereas if you show a character from below, you get a sense of not being in control, not being quite even and equal with the characters themselves. Not in terms always of like dominance and power and subjugation or whatever, but just in terms of what is your feeling as a participant in the scene is, oh, there's a lady carrying a bomb and a guy who's running after her trying to stop her and that's a chaotic kind of tense scene. We're out of control. So there is this framing from below to so sort of give you that, that sense of being a little bit imperiled the same as the characters are, which works quite well. And here we have her again. And um, here you can see the very different mood. Like here, she's not currently carrying a bomb that's about to explode. So here, we're eyeline with her, and the mood is very different. Like there's much less tension. Um, this like there's much less drama going on because this is a much quieter scene of her just finishing up her work on this big bomb that she's really proud of. <laughs> the answer is that all the Yordles are trans. Like, yeah, I mean fucking hell. Uh absolutely headcanon them as trans. Do that. That's awesome. Do that. So, here's a landmark. Obelisk of Power. So this is one of the things um, that Zerath is summoning in his level 3. It's one of these motherfuckers. And you can see some of the same characters like these guys right here repeating. Um, as well, you can see these same dudes carrying things around and like his, his servants and stuff. So that's, that's basically where the landmark is. Um... And this one is, like, a little odd because, like, I don't really feel like, like, except in the crop, like, even in the crop, really, this, it doesn't really feel like there is a landmark here, does it? Like, it just feels like, oh, there's just some rock and some lightning. Uh, where's the obelisk? Like, where's the thing that we're supposed to be focusing on? And even here, I don't really feel like the obelisk is, like, the central character. Like, it's the biggest thing. It's saturated. Like, all the usual things apply. There's a little bit of framing to sort of highlight it, but it's not really... It looks like a background element. It doesn't look like the subject of the piece to me, which is like, eh. it's also a difficult thing to frame. Like, how do you make that obelisk the central character? And what I would have done is pull the camera back, like instead of having the characters there, pull away from the scene and like show the obelisks maybe a little bit more from a distance. It's like these ominous things floating in the sky kind of thing. I don't know. But this one doesn't work super well for me. The art is good. Like, I really like the full artwork. It's really cool. Like, it's really dramatic. But as a landmark, this doesn't look like a landmark. Like, this doesn't really look like, oh, yeah, this is a landmark that I can identify as a... Th huh? 
Er? What's this supposed to be? <laughs> I just can't go low enough for Tom Kench's theme. So, the Otterpus. And this is another one of those things that uh, League of Legends itself, like League of Legends the game has kind of lost over time, is that they used to design these very strange, odd creatures all the time. Like, they used to do it all the time. They used to make these strange new animals, um, as, as like, as part of the lore. That doesn't happen so much anymore, but Legends of Runeterra keeps this going in the best style with otters that are also octopuses. Which is fantastic! That's a great thing to do! I love this! Uh, just look at these lovely little boys. Like, this one's distracting the undersea researcher guy, and the other one's stealing his food. <laughs> stealing his food right out of his, out of his thing. One thing I'm not 100% clear on is, like, how is he... How, how is he just standing there underwater? Because, like, we are underwater, there's a fish there, and you can see things, like, you can see lily pads floating on the surface, and bubbles, so how is he just standing there? I don't. Yeah, that's that's weird. I'm 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 not really sure how the it's the conch the the uh what what the hell is he called? He yeah the conchologist. It's this guy right here. Like I understand here he's floating like he's floating in the water and there's fish and stuff is going on. But then how is he just standing there? Uh, Yordle magic. Yeah, Yordle magic. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's not important. Anyway, uh, talking about angles. So we haven't talked about this much um, on this stream because it's something I've repeated a hundred billion times. Um, but uh, we have a Dutch angle going on here. And what a Dutch angle means, it's, it's a term that I'm borrowing from film studies. But it's basically when there's a horizon and it's just like flat across the screen, that's like a steady shot, right? Like that's a normal angle. But then if you take the horizon and you just twist it, like you twist it from being from being here to being, for example, here, you have what's often called a Dutch angle, like an off-kilter angle on a thing. And the thing that that does in cinema is it makes you feel unsteady. It makes you feel off balance. Um, it makes you feel a little bit like, 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 like you're falling over, basically. That's sort of what it's simulating. So it's a great way in, in film, if you don't overuse it, to give a sense of being out of control, of being like, of, of like things being out of kilter, or things being uh, creepy or strange or weird, by using these angles. In this card art, sometimes it's used that way. Like a lot of the time, you'll see if uh, if there's an action shot, if things are like if things are like happening, um, you'll see that they twist the horizon line a little bit. This is a slightly less extreme Dutch angle. You can see that the horizon is basically here. Um, like, that's just to, to make the action pop a little bit more, to th make things feel more chaotic and weird. But then sometimes it's not really about that, because what we have here is an image that's in 1610, right? Like, that's the aspect ratio. It's like 16 by 10, which means we have a lot more horizontal space to work with than we have vertical space. So if we were to untilt this image, right? Like, if we were to reset, reset the angle so that the horizon is flat, this character would basically disappear down here. Like, this little otter would basically disappear out of frame down here, and that otter over there, this otter puss, would just disappear out of frame. Like, it would just, its head would go off the top, and we wouldn't be able to see it. Um, because there is a lot of verticality here. We have this thing floating above him, like, looking down at him, talking to him, messing with him, doing whatever, and we have this thing below him, messing with his lunchbox. And in order to fit that verticality into a format that's so flat and so wide, you can use a Dutch angle, to tilt the X, Y axis a little bit so that you have more space to work with up top and more space to work with down below, and you can fit it all in the frame. And that's something that they do a lot in Legends of Runeterra in order to fit more vertical space into the card art than they can actually do with the 16 by 10 resolution. Um, so that's like that's just a compositional thing also, but it also works with the mood of this piece because, of course, this is a scene of mischievousness. This is a scene of them playing a prank on him, of like one of them is distracting him, the other one is stealing his food. This is a funny, sort of lighthearted, silly scene. Um, so tilting the angle works for the energy that you want to portray here. Okay, uh, I need something to drink. Just a sec. And I need to blow my damn nose again! Yeah, I don't know, I, I have not been snotty all day. All day I've been fine, then I turn on the stream and it's just like... 
Just noises. Like the worst noises you can possibly make. Anyway. Composition of the thing itself. Um, we have three characters. They're all the central character of the image, basically. So they are all rendered in, like, with the same level of detail, with the same contrast, and with the same lighting. What makes the um, Yordle Researcher guy central is that this character is looking at him, and this character is like, is, like, separated from them. So, like, you have more characters going on over here. He's centered in the image. He's, like, standing tall, like, rising out of the image on this little wedge shape right here. That all helps kind of center him as a main character of the image. Battlefield Earth has Dutch angles. What a classic movie. Don't watch Battlefield Earth. Don't do it. It's terrible. It's awful. It's it's famous for having 10 billion Dutch angles and, and not knowing what the fuck they're for. Um... <laughs> Um, but yeah, and I love this, I, I love this card art in general, like, I love the perspective, like, looking from below this stream, or this little pond, or whatever, like, seeing lily pads floating above you on these long streamers, like, that's gorgeous, and the way the sunlight paddles down through the surface of the water, like, this is a really beautiful piece of underwater artwork, it's so whimsical, it's so fun, I love it, it's really lovely. And then here we have the prank where the otter pusses clearly are doing like an ink splash thing on him. <laughs> Poor guy. He's just trying to be friends with them. Let's see. Poison dart. Don't care that much. Ah. Protoporo. So this is our confirmation basically that Nar is going to be added to Legends of Runeterra at some point. Um, it's right here. It's, it's these little guys. We have these prehistoric yordles hanging out, um, doing prehistoric yordle shit. And they have brought with them a prehistoric Poro. And... Am I going to have to be the tedious guy now? Yes, I am. Okay, so I'm going to have to be the, the, the buzzkill tedious guy a little bit and say that just aesthetically, a lot of this shit is a little bit problematic. Like, a, just... A little bit like this idea, first of all, from like a um, an anthropological perspective, this idea that like people from a hundred thousand years ago, three hundred thousand years ago, like these 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 um, hunter gatherer tribes were like more physically primitive than modern human beings, which is like the aesthetic that's being com coming through here is like that these like the Poro here is like oh there's this crunched up sort of caveman looking little motherfucker. Okay, I think I reconnected. There we go. Are we back? I think we're back. I'm moving, at least, on the screen. Okay, sorry, that was... I don't know what the fuck that was. It was a brief disconnect from OBS. Uh, you may need to refresh. You may need to refresh the stream. If it's not, if tell if anyone complains that they can't see it, just tell them to refresh. If something cut out, I don't know why. Anyway, what's, what I was saying is like like prehistoric humans, prehistoric beings, prehistoric people. They were not less evolved than us. They were not more primitive. They were just different. Uh, and that's something like what informs all of the art of these prehistoric yordles and all the prehistoric things um, that are being added to the game is sort of that particular vibe of like oh ha 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 these primitive people from the before times they were stupid and didn't know like uh, and like they were dumber and less evolved and more primitive and more like brutish and that's that's a framing that I'm not fond of as a historian because it's not true um so yeah sorry I needed to be tedious there for a second anyway getting back to the artwork itself actually Proto Poro is adorable like I, I do love his little mustache and his giant eyebrows um and so the framing here is interesting because he's literally highlighted by this shaft of golden sunlight coming down from above, right? Like, we have lots of characters on the, in this image. We have this big transformed proto-yordle back here. Not sure, it's not Nar, but it's someone doing something similar to what Nar can do. And then we have, like, these little other yordles hanging out. But he is highlighted, quite literally, by this shaft of golden sunlight breaking through the canopy and falling upon him, highlighting him in the image. And then there's a little bit of framing... Like, where, like, you have the rock that sort of creates this shape for him to occupy. You have this little, these little wedges of grass or whatever the hell those things are. Along with the trees and stuff. Creating a little bit of a framing for the Yordle, uh, for the, uh, for the Poro to occupy. And that, like, that all works pretty well. Hmm. 
Uh, so yeah, like that's just a perfectly sensible little piece of artwork. Uh, like he's not really the most interesting character on screen. Like the most interesting characters are definitely the Yordles um, that are also there. But he's just sitting there being a grumpy little big horned thing. Oh yeah, this guy. <laughs> oh, Sergeant Buff. Um, I used to be like you. Couldn't even lift a puff cap. But then I found Shake by Purpleberry. It's got all the right stuff a Yordle needs to go from zero to hero. So when you've had a hard workout, fuel up with Shake and become the buffest of bros like me. Printed advertisement for Purpleberry Shake, which apparently... <laughs> this is so fucking cursed. Like, this is more cursed than the fucking Swole Squirrel. This is terrible. <laughs> This is so awful. <laughs> oh, I quite like it, though. I, it's not Teemo, thankfully, but... But yeah, it's like Swole Yordle. There's something so wrong about the idea of a Swole Yordle. <laughs> uh. Anyway, Reborn Grenadier. This is the Noxian Grenadier. Uh, it's apparently just the same guy. Let's see. Grenadier... It's apparently just this guy again, uh, doing the same thing that he was doing before. <laughs> and just, like, brought back to life to do the damn thing again. After being blown up the first time, he's back to life, um, from the powers of the Noxian blood sorcerers or whatever, to do his self-explosion thing one more time. Have you heard the Swole Yordle and Swole Squirrel in interaction? Yes, I have. I have. I have heard it. <laughs> it's so cursed. Um... Scion hanging out here in the background, just subtly waiting for the other guys to charge first, I guess, which is uh, unusual of him. But yeah, uh, some interesting compositional things. So, vanishing points. The vanishing point for this image is somewhere around here, like somewhere around his hips, somewhere around here. That would be the vanishing point that, like, everything else is sort of aligned around. And so because he's right in the center of the vanishing point, what that does is naturally just makes everything else in the image kind of point to him a little bit. Like, you can see the axe of the Noxian soldiers charging. You can see the lines like on these rocks right here. Sort of, They all just sort of point towards a central point that he occupies, and that's like the simplest way to make a character the central character. Then there's the other stuff we've already talked about. He's more rendered. He's more. He's got more contrast. He's got more highlights. He's got more color where everyone else is more washed out, and that's the easy way to make this guy the main character. Then there's our angle, because like we talked about, we've got a little bit of a butt Dutch angle going on. Like, like you can see the camera is just tilted just a little bit, but here, unlike with the um, conchologist and the... And the uh, the the otter octopuses this is not to create more vertical space this time it's more about creating that unnerved feeling of like things being a little bit off kilter like things not being in balance like this sense of action of movement of things happening fast and being unable to keep up with them and it works it works quite well let's see where were we Ah, yes, this lovely boy. The Stinky Wump. <laughs> a wump that has become so stinky and so upset with mushrooms that mushrooms now grow from it. Which, oh boy, unfortunate. So, uh, much the same as with the Grenadier, by the way. We have a vanishing point that's somewhere down here, and that creates these concentric circles in the sewer system where they're at. That's sort of, that all, not quite center on him, but like they all sort of draw, you can see the lines of the image all sort of draw attention to him. And then... The stink lines, just the smell, the stench itself, creates these curving lines through the image that just keep leading you back to... Back to ya boy. <laughs> ya boy over here. Um, and his lovely little prancing. Um, and then this usual stuff, like, he's more rendered. Like, especially if you take a look at the fur on this, this one here in the foreground, this wump. Like, you can see that its fur is rendered a little bit more roughly. It's rendered a little bit more... A little bit less more less lovingly than the fur on the guy back here, which again helps center this guy as the central character because he's more air quotes in focus in the frame. But yeah, just just a lovely little bit of of grossness of gross out fart humor basically. It's just ha ah, ha stinky smells and poop. Wee. Um, is essentially what's going on here. Here we have a continuation of the uh, otterpus and the stuff that was going on with the conchologist, which is this, this adorable little fella picking up a sandwich from the guy's lunchbox. On hand, my sandwich, this instant! Yeah.
So, again, creative use of a Dutch angle. And again, it serves a dual purpose here. It does help to give us a little bit more vertical space. Like, if we untilted this image and made this horizon line flat, what we would miss is this thing over here, which is the claw of the big monster that Poppy is fighting. This is basically happening, happening during Poppy's level 2 art. Um, we would miss the claw of the monster, and we would miss Poppy's leg coming in. Just like you can just barely see a little bit of her leg as the squire is looking on and being very impressed with everything Poppy is doing. It's Peppy, yes. This is Peppy the squire. <laughs> Um, who is who is like uh, just massively infatuated with uh, with Poppy and wants to be a great hero just like Poppy is. <laughs> um, so we can see the level two of Poppy happening here in the background. You can see in the shadow play basically on the walls or on the tree, uh, the big maw of the monster and Poppy like swinging her hammer and just her watching this play like oh my god it's so cool. She's just having so much fun um, with this, where we have the uh, gallant cavalier, or whatever he's called, like one of Poppy's other followers, cowering here in the background, being terrified by everything, because he's a coward. Um, but yeah, we have Peppy here in the foreground, and you can just see the fangirling, right? Like, look at her legs, especially, like, the way that she's posed. She's not really, like, if she was, like, a, a powerful soldier ready for battle, how would she be posing? Well, her legs would be together, she would be sort of centered and stable, her chest would be out, her arms would be back, and her chin would probably be up, like, sort of, like, sort of Wonder Woman posing, right? But then... If you look at how she's actually posed, she has these, like, sort of slightly awkward leg posture. She's holding this thing in front of her and being like, oh my god, this is so cool. Like, it's this sort of, sort of little girl seeing her idol. Like, it's like a little girl meeting, uh, meeting their, their, their uh, favorite Disney character at Disneyland. It's like that kind of vibe, right? It's just, it's just such an adorable little posture of this little character. It's like, oh my god, Poppy's so cool. She's my hero. Um, and as people are pointing out in chat, yes, the face of the Cavalier guy is also on the shield because this is his gear, basically. She's his squire. <laughs> Here she is again, wielding the tiny spear, doing a little bit of a, a thrust thing, and there she is wielding the shield, which she can't really <laughs> wield. So, here we have the Bandle Commando. Gunning in the streets and tucking kiddos into sheets. And she is, as far as I can make out... The wife of the mayor of... Uh, yeah, the Bandle City mayor. She's, she's basically either his wife or his daughter, something along those lines. I'm pretty sure she's his wife. Um, and she's one of the uh, one of the Bandle gunners running around with Poppy. So she's like the mom of the squad. She's like the sort of... She's sort of characterized as this like middle-aged sort of uh, like late 40s uh, yordle mommy character uh, who sort of like does mom stuff for the Bandle City gunners. And you can see that it's her who has incited um, <laughs> this big monster to come through one of the Yordle portals because she's uh, she's rescued this nest of, uh, what are they called, owl cats? Yeah, she's rescued this nest of owl cats from this thing and it's following her through a Yordle portal in order to get to them. So she's the reason why um, Tristana's squad are engaging this thing to drive it back out of Bandle City is because she drew, drew it in there. But yeah, like I, I love her character as a, as a bit of voice acting. Um, as the splash art itself is like, it's fairly simple. Like we have this bright golden flat color behind her, helps her stand out, makes her like a, a central character in the image. Um, we have like all of the little owl cats swirling around her, but giving her space enough that she like make a central character. We have the giant or whatever the hell this thing is in the background, sort of being washed out by the gold and preventing that from being the central character. And yeah, it just makes her central. I like her pose as well, very dynamic, like there's lots of good movement and energy going on here. Uh, I think maybe her torso is twisted a little bit too much, but that's like a minor nitpick that doesn't really matter so much. But yeah, cool character, like her a lot. I wish we could get a better look at her, because like here, because she's so overlapped with herself, it's hard to really get a sense of her outfit or whatever, but you know, minor things. Which also... Yeah, so I'm not too fond of these creatures. <laughs> like, I think they just look like they're, they're just meant to be these incredibly stupid looking, dumbass, ugly creatures. <laughs> just like, yeah, I, I, have, I have a hard time feeling any positive feelings towards them because they just feel kind of condescending. Like, they feel like they're meant to be funny to five year olds. Um, so, like, I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah. A little bit of framing, uh, 
sort of helping this thing stand out. It's sitting on top of the thing. It's the largest thing in the image, blah, blah, blah. All the things we've already talked about apply here as well to this stupid, stupid creature. As we finally get to the Bomber Twins, and these are the lunatics who, if you look here in the background, these are the lunatics who've been spreading minefields all over the deserts of Shurima, apparently. Uh, probably around a Bandal portal, looking at the fa fauna that's around here, but yeah, they're, they're the lunatics who've been spreading, like, bombs and minefields all over the place because, well, they're testing out whatever the hell this lunatic thing is. <laughs> The Fossil Foot Bomberator X did precisely what it was meant to do. So chaos, plus it was easy to parallel park. <laughs> General Grievous' fursona. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's not really much to talk about here because I feel like the characters aren't really that present in this image. Like, they both have, like, Zig's mouths, right? Like, they have these big Zig's grins, which apparently you get if you're a Yordle who's obsessed with explosions. You get this giant mouth and big teeth. Um, but they're not really there as characters. Like, we don't really get to see or interact with them. The main character of this image, rather, is the big machine. Um, which is just, like, tearing ass across the desert. And this one has actually some, like, some quite good composition to it. Because you have, like, the path itself, there's, there's this narrow strip that sort of curves away over here. You have this trail of smoke just following it. You have the bombs that are being thrown out. Like, so there's a lot of energy, a lot of action, a lot of vibes. Um, like a lot of love, like a, there's a lot of great feeling in this image, but the characters themselves are just kind of not there. They're just, they're more like incidental pieces of the background. And it's kind of a pity because like we have this pink yordle and this blue yordle and they're clearly twins and they clearly love explosions. And I feel like there would be some fun character design you could do with them. But because they're so, there's such non-entities in the image, it's hard to, it's hard to feel any attachment to either of them. Okay, another little drink. So, the conchologist himself. And we might as well start with this little compositional element. You notice how these lines of fish, these schools, you notice how they keep pulling towards him and how like this little undersea fairy creature looks at him, how this seaweed sort of points to him, how this sort of cur- like, it all sort of curves and curls around the conchologist himself, which creates this flow, this feeling in the composition of everything sort of, like, spiraling around him, revolving around him, as he's falling deep into the water here and doing stuff down here. And it's like, it's just a really nice- it's, there's just a really nice swoosh, there's a really nice sort of swoop of features in the image that sort of all just kind of spiral us in towards our main character who's hovering there in the water. And it just, like, it just works really well. Again, like, another lovely underwater scene. And, like, that swirling, like, that swirling energy, again, also works so well for water because, like, that's, that's the energy of being underwater. It's like having that, that swirl of stuff happening. And then we have the Dark Bulb Acolyte. Yes, I'm quite sure that the fellow up on the roof has many stories to tell. We all know he has lots to say. We just don't know, have any idea exactly what he's saying. Stilted robe maker. Yeah, and I, I love this guy's voiceover because he's all like, <laughs> Like everything he says is like, <laughs> Which is, And Vega's like, yes, yes, I definitely know what you are saying. <laughs> It's lovely. I, got, I love this. I love this character's voiceover. His card, like, I also quite like the card as a composition. I just wish I could see him better. Um, like, cause like, he has a great character. Like, he's essentially a tiny little light bulb where he himself is acting as the filament inside the light bulb, right? Like, that's basically what's going on here. Which is such a clever character design for a character who uses lightning clearly. But it's like he's so small in this image. I kind of, I just wish we got a better look at him, because he seems to be designed very much after, um, like, he's designed after Vagar in a lot of ways. Like, he seems to be wearing the same kind of belt, he seems to be wearing the same kind of robe, uh, but it's just, like, I just can't get enough of a, of a sense of his character from this distance, unfortunately. Uh, but I do really like, yeah, the perfect little helper. Hey, I see someone's been reading Donald Duck comics. Um, 
but I really do like how top heavy he is, like how big this light bulb mask thing that he's wearing, just how huge it is relative to his tiny body. That's a good comedy character. Um, like it really works. And so we're using these um, like dark spikes coming out of the ground or whatever. Like we're using that one as a platform to him to sort of center him in the image. We have this lightning energy that just sort of radiates towards him. And then subtly you have like these spikes, like doing a little bit of pointing just a little bit of pointing like in his general direction so that again the flow of the image leads you towards him at the center of it and again obviously dutch angle because you can never have enough dutch angles right we already talked about those yeah not much to say about this one this is ava achiever uh demonstrating how she makes the her yordle traps so it used to be in the lore that Caitlyn had these Yordle snap traps, right? That were traps for catching Yordles. Like, that's basically, in, in the lore, that's basically what they were. That she was hunt Like, she didn't really like Yordles. She hunted them a little bit. She tried to catch them with her snap traps. The new sort of retcon that they seem to have made is that Caitlyn learned how to make her traps from Yordles. So this is Ava demonstrating that this is a Yordle trap, hence why it's called a Yordle snap trap that she then showed Caitlyn how to use, and now Caitlyn uses them, which is like, okay, it's a clever little retcon, uh, keeping the name in place. Uh, but yeah, there's not much to say about the art. That's just the thing I wanted to bring up. By the way, are they doing stuff on the Shadow Isles in canon? Uh, who is Vapandrus? Do you mean the, the, the Sentinels? Because I, I believe with Viego gone, we don't actually know what the status of the Shadow Worlds are. Like, presumably the Black Mist is still around and the Sentinels still need to deal with it, but we don't actually know. Oh, Vagar and his crew. No, I don't think they're doing anything on the Shadow Worlds. Um, Vagar and his crew seem to be in, Bo in Bandal City, but they are associated with the Shadow Worlds for purposes of gameplay. So, like, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't put too much stock in region associations and Legends of Runeterra because that often has more to do with, oh, this character and their powers fit into the Shadow Isles better than they do elsewhere, and that's why we, we put them on the Shadow Isles. That's that's why. Um, so don't think too, much, too hard about it, I don't think. Okay, so moving on to... The, I really like the energy of this card, the Fallen Rider. And I really like the mood and energy of this card. Um, because, like, just look at this menacing motherfucker. Um, because th there's a clever thing going on, because there's two characters in the image. We have the Basilisk itself, and then we have the Rider. And what I really like is the contrast in energy. So we have this ruined village scene, like this Damasian outpost that they've just destroyed. You can see the Basilisk is, like, crushing Damasians underfoot. I think, actually, yeah, that is a Damasian. Crushing Damasians underfoot, and it, you can see it's sort of searching for victims, like, arr, arr. like, there's this energy of, like, hunting to it. But then you look at the Rider... And he's just sitting there, like completely relaxed, completely calm, sword down this like this just this statuesque figure on top of this raging monster. Like that eerie stillness that he's got going on. Like this really good vibes. That's a really spooky character. That makes the character look really scary and dangerous, menacing. Uh, so I, got, I really like that. Compositionally, the rider and the the basilisk themselves essentially describe a triangle, like a pyramid shape that rises up out of the middle of the image. So you have like the buildings rising on the left and you can see how like you have these buildings sort of rising, uh, rising on the right and rising on the left. And then in the middle of it, you have this triangular shape made up of the rider and the basilisk that sort of create this center, this center space for them to occupy that makes them large in the image and also makes them, like just makes them literally jut out and make them stand out. And Dutch angles as well. Yes, as people are pointing on chat, Dutch angle. Because again, yeah, ring wraith energy, as someone uh, says, just as the dreamer says in chat. And the Dutch angle again, because we are off kilter. This is tense. This is dangerous. This is this is scary. And then we get get to see what happens when the rider is not so chill, and when he's actually really pissed and and doing his war stuff and here like much less menacing energy right like much less like oh this thing this guy is spooky and scary and much more i'm just gonna fucking kill you with my with my blood sword or whatever um 
we're back with the Dutch angle once again, because of course we're in the middle of an action scene. Here it's also a little bit about creating vertical space, like we talked about, um, because if we corrected the angle here, we would get this, like we would get have to put the basilisk itself like really close to, to like the floor of the image, like compositionally the basilisk would have to be down here to make enough room for this big swoop to still be visible in the vertical space of the screen. And that would make for a, kind of a bad composition, ultimately. Like, that just wouldn't that just wouldn't look very good and dynamic. And so the Dutch angle here is also just helping with the compositional element of wanting to have this big swoop with this vertical component to it. Um, but yeah, again, like, uh, they, they are careful. This is something that they do a lot when they have these scenes, like, set inside cities or set inside settlements. What they'll often do with the characters is they'll make, make sure that the background to the characters themselves rather than being like these detailed buildings and like background renderings, it's just sky. It's just like flat sky, so you can have this flat gray or flat blue color in the background that they can be contrasted against to help them stand out from the image. Compare and contrast, like if there had been a lot of like complicated burned out structures and shit in the background of these characters, you wouldn't really be able to tell the details of the characters as much. They wouldn't stand out as much. Whereas if you like leave all the detailed buildings, like just kind of shove them to the side of the image and give a lot of open sky and flat color, you can make the characters stand out a lot better, which is like, again, simple compositional element, but it works. Oh my god, we're only at the two costs. Holy shit, this is gonna be a long stream, guys. Actually, uh, let me take a break for a bit. I need to go get some tea. and rest my voice so I don't completely break it to pieces. So yeah, I'll be back in a little bit, bit and we'll continue with Dr. Eslanger over here.
I have tea. It just needs to brew. So let's move on with the thing. How's everybody doing in chat, by the way? Huh, a bit of a delay between me saying stuff and people seeing it. There we go. Ah, you were talking about decks? Yeah, I need to try a Yordle deck. I want to build just complete Yordle deck. And I don't care if it makes sense, I just want to use Yordles to have for everything. Maybe try a Bantle City, like, multi-region thing. <laughs> You're drawing with my stream as the background. Oh, cool. Hope you produce something good. It's 4 a.m. for you? Oh, jeez. Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't stream earlier tonight, I'm afraid. Yeah, Bandle Tree, exactly, Zoa Dragon. Tristana's fun. Yeah, I imagine she must be. I haven't had time to try out any of the decks yet. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had time to sink into it. Two PM for you. It's nice. Yeah, that's, yeah. The trouble with time zones, like apparently, at least according to YouTube analytics, I have like this like a, a not insubstantial number of people watch my videos in Brazil and a bunch in the Philippines. And let me tell you, it's hard to find a time zone that works for all of them. <laughs> Can you talk about the Viego and Akshan followers too? Yes, we'll be doing that at the end of the stream. Yeah, Brazil, Turkey. Like, most of my viewers are in the United States, then the UK, Germany, like, a bunch of European nations, and then Brazil and the Philippines. <laughs> like, they're the next two biggest markets for some reason. Who knows? I have no idea why. It's like, it's like a, a half of 1% or something, but, it's, you know, still. Anyway, let's move on to Dr. Eslanger. And it's very important that you say Eslanga because if you just pronounce it too quickly without very carefully pronouncing it Eslanger, you might accidentally pronounce it Aslanger. Aslanger. And you don't want to say Aslanger because he's called Eslanger, not Aslanger. Dr. Aslanger. <clears throat> so, Dr. Eslanger here is basically the dude who apparently came up with a process for reviving soldiers on the battlefield. Um, like, they had already revived Scion, like, Vladimir and his blood mages had figured out how to do it with Scion, but this dude, apparently, was the guy who figured out how to revive soldiers on the battlefield and send them back into, into battle. And so, that's, uh, that's basically him practicing his craft. So, the storyline behind these cards, and the crit has already done a video about it. The storyline behind all of these cards is that the Lady of Blood is, is organizing this raid on a Damasian outpost in order to demonstrate the power of her of her Grey Legion of like of like using these undead soldiers as shock troops in Noxian conquest. Like so so this is all like a test run for her. And Eslanga is there to sort of demonstrate his powers and like revive the soldiers on the battlefield and send them back into combat whenever possible. Yeah, some casual necromancy to spice up your army. Basically, yeah, basically. And what we're seeing here is him doing the thing, where he's using blood magic to infuse the corpse with some semblance of life again. But then, as is explained in one of the spell cards somewhere, I can't remember what it's called. Okay, one of the spell cards... Yeah, there it is, Salt and Stitches. One of the spell cards here... Um, like, explains that, like, besides, um, like, besides, uh, just infusing magic into them is not enough. Like, with magic, you can revive them. Like, they'll sort of become alive again, but they will, yeah, they will not fight. Because, like, when, once they are brought back to life, they're just kind of passive and, and uninterested in doing anything. So what they do is they rub iodine and salt into their wounds just to cause them immense suffering and pain and like inject iodine and salt into their systems just just to make them suffer so that that pain and that suffering will bring them back to a state of enragement so that you can send them against your enemies again oh risen reckoner yes this is the risen reckoner who who mentioned it mentions it specifically 
Um, and uh, like, so, so this is a cruel act. Like it's not, it, when you bring these people back, they're not brought back from the dead. Like it's not like a battlefield revival. You're just bringing their corpses back to life and torturing them in order to force them to fight. Uh, so, you know, that's that's what makes the uh, the reborn Grenadier. That's what makes him special, is that he's, like, pretty much one of the only uh, of members of the Grey Legion who seems excited to be back to life and do more fighting, because apparently he was just that crazy in life. All the other zombies are like, they don't actually want to do anything, but they're being forced to it with suffering. Which, again, you know, hey, maybe Noxes aren't necessarily the good guys. Certainly the Black Rose aren't. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's basically the League of Legends version of ne necromancy outside of stuff like the Shadow Isles is this stuff right here, hemomancy, as it were. Um, yeah, so uh, composition of the image itself. So we have two faces visible here. We have Eslanga himself doing his magic and like the light, the light of the of the red magic reflected off his glasses. And then we have this Noxian soldier witnessing what's being done to his former compatriot and being a little bit freaked out about it. Like he's clearly not, <laughs> like he's clearly not like, oh God, this is like, oh, this, this is a little too weird for me. As they're holding the body down as Eslanga is inflicting torture on it, basically. Like he's bringing it back to life and inflicting pain on it. So they need, he needs someone to hold it down so he can finish doing his thing. And, and and torment this corpse into fighting again. So we have two main characters. The main character, of course, is Dr. Eslanga himself, who's doing the thing. And this is sort of a storytelling thing. When you want a character to be the main character of an image, make the other characters do something in service to the main character. So these characters are just helping him hold down a body that he's clearly doing something to. Like, they're clearly helping him do a thing, and that's what makes him the main character of the image and not this poor guy over here who is having a negative reaction to the thing that's going on. And then we have the Kelp Maidens, a very, like, a bit of a bit of a jarring jump in aesthetics um, from, like, Noxus torturing the dead on battlefields to these adorable little creatures uh, singing, sitting around having a sing-song about some stuff. Dun, da, 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 da. Speaking of Vagar, by the way, this is his music. Tiny masterpiece of evil. Oh, it's so good. Um, just sitting around having a sing-song. And so we can see the usual things. These characters are more rendered than the conchologist in the background. Uh, they are less washed out. They're more saturated. They are clearly highlighted against their backgrounds. You can see most of their backdrop is like clear sky or a little bit of the water surface. It's like, those are all the compositional elements that makes them the main characters. And then they're sitting on a raised, like, bit of the image. <laughs> Conchologist's just here to study and be pranked. Yeah, Marcelo, that's basically his role, the poor guy. I do like the detail of the little crab that's, like, conducting. Basically, like, doing a little bit of a Sebastian from the Little Mermaid things, conducting uh, the kelp maidens as they sing. Now, they're supposed to be kelp, right? Like, they're supposed to be seaweed, and you can kind of see that in, like, the way the hands are constructed, the way, like, their feet are sort of... They're, they're sort of... They look a little bit sort of, like, seaweed-ish. I think they could have gone harder on that. Like, instead of, like, the hair looking like tentacles, they could have made that look more like seaweed, like like actual sort of flat plant material or something, which they didn't quite do, which... I don't know. Um, but, yeah, not a lot to say about this one. I think it speaks for itself, mostly. Here's another lovely couple of characters. Um, I believe these are Yordles. Like, I'm not 100% sure because, like, they look a little bit more like mice people. I think they're Yordles because it's a, it's a Bandle City Targon uh, card. But, yeah, so they've made this telescope, which has eyes and now has, uh, like, a will of its own is, like, running around and doing stuff. Yeah, fey mice. Oh, they're fey. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Little fairy creatures. Um, so again, we're working with a Dutch angle here. And again, that's a compositional thing as well as a thing about the vibe. Because what we want from the composition, clearly, you can see that they wanted to have this tall tower structure in the background with these portraits of venerated researchers or whatever in the background um, looking down over the proceedings. 
And then also, of course, the vibe of like things being off balance. This is a scene of chaos. This is a scene of this telescope coming to life and running off on its own to do stuff. Yeah, the telescope is the character. It's easy not to be able to see that. Like you can kind of see it here when you sort of see the eyes and that like this thing is acting essentially as a mouth or a long nose or a snout or something. But once you're looking at this picture, like you're more tempted to see this as the main character, right? Like because yeah, the telescope has eyes. It has kind of a face sort of wally -E face, robot face kind of thing going on. But this is clearly more of a character in the image. Sort of this poor, poor little creature being dragged around by this escaping telescope. We've got a magical cat, so surely there are magical mice too. Yeah, like that's probably, it's probably pretty much where where it's at. Outside of that, not a lot to say about this composition. Like, I do love the detail that it's, like, kicking aside this other creature over here. Like, just kicking us, like, get out of my way, nerd. I'm going on adventures. Um, but yeah, just a perfectly lovely little illustration, frankly. Not much to say about it, I don't think. Loping. More like eloping. <laughs> Whereas the Marai Songstress. Here we've got some things to say. So, um... Nami, for a very long time, was basically our only Marai. Like, the only Vestaya, the only sort of image we have of Vestaya from the underwater tribes. Then we got the, all the way back in Foundations, we got the one, uh, the one dude. Let's see if I can find him. Uh, what the hell's he called? Nope. Uh, followers, units only. Common, rare. I think he's a rare. Where is he? He's somewhere. Riverfolk! Riverfolk, yes. Yeah, we got the River Shaper. This guy. He was, like, literally the first other Mirai we had ever seen in the lore. Um, and he's not a Mirai from Nami's tribe specifically, I believe. I believe he's, like, a river Mirai rather than one of the from the deep ocean like, uh, like what Nami is from. I need to unfilter all of this again. And go and find not the abyssal guard, but the 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 I went too far. There, the Marai Songstress. Um and now finally we have some more examples of what Nami's undersea people look like. And just by existing, like they make Nami a better design. Because like my complaint with Nami was always that she's a very kind of basic character design. Like she's a very basic Sort of mermaid design, there's not really a lot to her. You could do a lot more to use the aesthetics of fish and sea creatures in order to create a more interesting and compelling character. And with a Marai Songstress and with like the with the other um, things like, for example, the Marai Warden, and as we discussed previously, the Deep, the Abyssal Guard, they do a lot to expand like just the diversity of character design that's possible within the Vastaya, within the Marai, which is just such a... Mm, absolutely lovely thing. And yes, as we mentioned before, this one, the Marai Songstress and the Abyssal Guard are both in a relationship with Nami. Like, they, they are, this is uh, Nami's boyfriend and the Songstress is Nami's girlfriend. And they're all in sort of a triad relationship with one another. Um, which is a lovely thing. But here, like, you can see we get this use of the fins, like like the fins of fish, like these long, sort of flowy, curly, almost like a dress-like shapes, all curling down along her tail. We get these sort of bioluminescent patches on her tail all along the thing, like lighting up in the dark. We get, like, this lovely use of translucency and color. Like, there's so much else going on on this character than just, oh, hot lady with titty. Which is the thing with Nami is like a lot of her character design is just she's just like a hot lady who's looking a little bit fish-ish on her base character design. Here, yeah, we have the titty. Like we have the sort of the basic mermaid shit, but then there's so much else going on on top of that also. Um, which I really quite enjoy. Like I like that there is that that greater diversity of aesthetic, because like undersea aesthetics, fish and like sea creatures, there's so many things you can do with them and combine with a human shape to create interesting, cool, fantastic mermaids, um, which is like something that League of Legends has never done. And I've always been disappointed with that in the Vestaya because they just like, okay, you want to take animal aesthetics and combine them with human, cool. 
So then why the fuck is the thing that you keep doing just like an ordinary ass human person with like the minimal amount of animal features possible? Oh yeah, human but with a tail, human but with long ear, human but with... Here we get like a much more even mix where we have the human torso, human face, arms, but then everything else is much more elaborately constructed out of interesting fish pieces, which like, yes, cool, great, love it. Anyway, compositionally, the tail itself creates this sw swooping, swirling line that draws us from, like, if we start looking at the image here, we'll get drawn to the Mariah herself, the songstress. And the songstress, you can see, like, these fish that are swirling around her. You can see the, like, the highlight, this the light coming down from above, highlighting the area around her, behind her, giving her this, this scene of highlighting. So she's basically creating her own frame and her own stage. Um... Which is all, it all works very well. It makes the scene that she's in kind of indistinct. Like, is this coral? Where is she? Where she what's she doing? But it doesn't really matter because she's like this artiste giving this performance who's in the midst of her feelings. So it all works quite well. And then there's this fish right here who, <laughs> who seems to be very, very pleased. <laughs> like, very pleased with what's going on. I don't know if, if, if the people at Riot just didn't catch this one or if it's some sort of in-joke. But uh, there he is. He, he's having a good time. Just, just a happy fish. <laughs> then we have the Marai Warden, and uh, you want mermaids with thigh gap? I'll give you mermaids with thigh gap. <laughs> um, so yeah, here's a mermaid where, again, again, this is this thing I talked about, like diversity of different designs where we have a mermaid, but instead of just having the fish tail that all mermaids have, hey, fuck it, let's give her legs, but then no feet. She has legs, but she doesn't have any feet. Um, which is like, okay, cool, interesting. Like, again, it is a different thing that you can do with the idea of mixing sea creatures with human anatomy. Like, so, like, yeah, it's a little silly to have a mermaid with legs, but it's also interesting. It's also a different thing to do than you normally do. Now, I wish that this is a thing Legends of Runeterra has problems with. That's, a, like... Her waist is thinner than her thigh. Like, just... Her forearm is the same thickness as her waist here. And that's a little... It's like, if it was just for this character, that might be cool. Like, that might be interesting. That might be a different anatomy for the character. But as we know with Legends of Runeterra, unfortunately... Uh, this is like a thing that Legends of Runeterra likes to do where they like having their female characters be incredibly thin just cuz. Just, just cuz. Just cuz, I don't know, because it's a sin to have internal organs or mm, abs or whatever. It's a Legends of Runeterra aesthetic design problem that they really, 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 really like to make their female characters very, very, very slim around the waist. Slimmer than is physically possible. And to the point where it's like, this is not stylization, this is something else. Like, this is this is some kind of obsession, this is some kind of weird... I don't know what the fuck it is, it's just weird. It's just weird. It's weird and unappealing and I don't like it. Because like, it just looks so off. Like it, looks like, it looks like a mistake, right? Like, it looks like you drew it wrong. It doesn't look like a stylization, it doesn't look like a cool sort of visual idea to, like, differentiate the character from another. It just looks... Ugh, just looks weird. And off-putting. Uh, and that's also going on here, where, like, her waist is like, oh boy. And if that was, like, a monster character design thing, that would be cool, but... It's just, it's all of the fucking women all of the time in this game. Uh, not all of them, but, like, a lot of them. It's something that they do over and over and over and over again, and it's tiresome, and I wish they wouldn't. But anyway, rest of the character design, excellent. Like, I love the hair. Like, this big, sort of, plume of, sort of, seaweed, kelp-like hair that just kind of bursts from the back of her head. I like the little frills around, like, the crown of whatever bone or coral or whatever it is that's growing from her head. That's very cool. I like her face. Like, her face construction is very interesting and different because, like, you can see the eyes are set a lot further apart than you would expect, and you have this sort of wedge-shaped nose that comes down from the top, creating, like, a really interesting shape language um, for the character themselves. Which is like, yeah, that's really cool. That works really well. You can see she has a companion up here who is sort of doing the same sort of thing. Um, the swoop of the axe that she's swinging around also, like, that helps create this, like, you can see how the swoop of the axe here 
trails into the hair itself and into the edge of like this coral here. So you get this suit creating this circular space in the middle, which means that she's again creating a frame for herself. Oh, hey, a bot. Give me a second. Um, like creates this swoop and this frame for the character to occupy in the center, which I think is quite nice. It's quite quite nicely done. Um, so yeah, I like I like I like the split leg mermaid thing where like where each leg ends up in a tail on its own. Like that that seems like it'd be fun to animate as well. But you know, it's other character design features of Legends of Runeterra bothers me a little bit. Here's a pokey stick. It's a stick. You can poke things with it. And here we have truly the best boy, the absolute best boy of all boys, the boy whom is the best of all the good boys that exist. This good boy, this lovely boy, this excellent boy right here who has just stepped on an exploding poison mushroom and is about to get everybody killed. Best boy, absolutely best boy, wonderful lad, 10 out of 10, would pet, would, uh, would adopt, would put in my home, would get exploded to death by poison mushrooms for him. Absolutely. Look at this lovely guy. Absolutely fantastic. So, same things apply. We have a character who's like raised on a little bit of a platform, sort of jutting out in this sort of creating this triangular pyramid shape right there for themselves to occupy. He's more highlighted, he's more saturated, he has more contrast, etc., etc. Same thing as everything else. And everyone here acts is essentially secondary characters. We have Ava Achiever, we have Furious Fae Folk, we have the big buff Swole Yordle, we have the Yordle newbie guy, we'll get to him later, and we have these two Yordle. Uh, day trippers who are not having a good time of it at all. Anyway, best boy, excellent lad, good kids, wonderful little pupper. I want to pet him. I want to pet him a lot. <laughs> Is it okay that he looks exactly like dogs from our universe? Yes, because dogs are good. Dogs are fantastic, and if more things looked like dogs, the world would be a better place. Ooh, that's some warm tea. Um... So, the Ruinous Acolyte. Yeah, I mean, I'm not super excited by by this, because, like, the Ruinous Acolyte, the storytelling here is that he's just one among many, right? Like, he's there, he's doing his lightning thing with his staff or whatever, and then there's another one here, and then there's another one here, and, like, he's just one of many, so he's not really supposed to be that, or they are not really supposed to be that exciting on their own as such, because they are just supposed to be a pawn or a peon or, like, a, a single sort of, Servant. There's some cool stuff going on. Like I kind of like the helmets that they're wearing with like with the little spikes on. It kind of looks nice and ominous and sinister. Cool robes. I like the sort of emerging light from below. They're, they're nice character designs. They're just like I wouldn't call them that exciting. Like they just look like a, a second-rate normal ass magic card, basically in, in sort of the way that they're put together. A uh, little bit of composition. Like you can see the the swoop of of this obelisk or whatever in the background kind of follows the same like creates this same sense of, of of power being sent or drawn towards the central pillar in the background, which also, like, corresponds with what the Acolyte itself, themselves are doing. But, yeah, not much to say about it. I really do like this spell card, though, like this uh, Salt and Stitches one, where you can see Eslanga, like, injecting his blood magic into the wound of a dead guy. And you can, like, the way that they use the glasses, like, the big red glasses to reflect the light of the magic that he's doing, giving him these blood red eyes. As he's, like, just sitting there, as, like, like, sort of, almost sort of lovingly doing his thing, but, like, hiding the eyes, like, that makes him feel inhuman and kind of scary. It's, like, it's, like, quite good. Heading on over to Piltover and Zon, here is the Sting Officer. Saying Asako, like all Sonite kids, had to grow up fast in those violence and violent and dark understreets. After losing his brother to yet another senseless gang crime, he committed himself to the Piltover enforcement, hoping reason and law would make his home finally safe. So this dude is essentially a sort of uh, Piltover enforcer's insider, who like who grew up on the streets of Son and who knows how to like like track them and how to how to interact with them and find things and like report information back to Caitlin. So he's basically supposed to be this undercover officer kind of character. But the main thing about this guy, besides the excellent shirt and <clears throat> the anatomy, uh, is the tattoos, which are really genuinely very cool. Like this is a really cool design element on him. Like having these tattoos that clearly like swoop their way all, all up across his body and then I like, cut his face in half like this. Sort of like basically sort of almost merging with his hairline as it as they rise up here. Like this just it's very well executed. Like it's a really cool bit of visual design. It makes him stand out a hell of a lot. 
I like the color composition as well. Like, I like the idea of, like, the white shirt then combined with this golden tie, uh, which has, like, the same golden color as these gold accents that run across, like, his prosthetic and, like, his shoulder guard and, like, down into this. Like, there's a lot of good color coordination in his outfit in general. That works really well. And just because he has this bright white shirt, like, that just makes him stand out naturally in the Sawnite environment as well, which is, like, just... It works really well. It's just really well put together. As he's sitting here spinning this thing around that he's presumably going to throw at these two luckless idiots who are running around here. And if you pay attention, these two guys, you'll find them in the card art of the Sawnite Barkeep um, as well. So, like, these these are characters that appear in the background of other uh, Legends of Runeterra cards as well. But, yeah, just just over... And uh, these uh, barrels, by the way, of course, contain the same... have the same uh, emblem and contain the same liquid as the... As the, those um, exploding barrels that do damage to both players that you get, like the Sawnite Kim barrel, barrel salesman guy who summons a couple of those. Same thing. Like, it's the same thing. So, stone stackers. Yordles haven't quite figured out gravity yet, but then gravity hasn't quite figured out Bandle City either. And yeah, there's some prehistoric Yordles and stuff. That's motherfucking Godzilla in the background. That's fucking Godzilla. Like, not not quite. Like, this, he's slightly different. He's got... But that's Godzilla. That's There's a fucking Godzilla here. There's a kaiju. There's a kaiju. Who's so big that trees grow on his goddamn tail. Oh, no, wait. That's not his tail. Doesn't matter. He's just... There's a kaiju. There's a kai, kaiju are canon now. There's a kaiju. I just wanted to point that out, that in League of Legends, kaiju are now canon. So we could, we could have Godzilla attacking Demacia. That's a thing we could have, and Riot hasn't given it to us, which I think is a fucking outrage. We could have Godzilla attacking Demacia. We could have Godzilla attacking Noxus. And Riot, we have Kaiju. Motherfucker, we have Kaiju. Anyway, I, I just, just, just want to point that out. I want Kaiju. I fucking want Kaiju. Um... What were you doing? Right, the card art, the art itself. So, um, a classic thing. <laughs> Rune Terra Stone Age was a wild time. Yeah. Uh, so, a classic thing when you want to create a scene of characters hiding from, or being like, or like uh, being protected from another character that that's in an image. Uh, let me bring up the classic example. Legend of Rune Terra has a fantastic example of this. In Lux. No, no, wait. Uh, Mage Seeker. In this card, the Mage Seeker Investigator, right? Like, the Mage Seeker Investigator is looking for mages. Lux is a mage. Lux is hiding from the Mage Seeker. How do we re represent this visually in the frame? Well, we put a literal wall between them. Like, we create this physical separation between them um, to sort of indicate the idea that one is hiding from the other and one is, one is hidden from the other. That's a classic compositional trick to do this. So for the stone stackers, same thing. They are these little guys here are not trying to fight Godzilla over here. That's uh, that's this guy up here who's throwing rocks at his head, which is a smart thing to do. They're hiding from him, right? They, but they're also protected from him. They are not directly in peril from Godzilla hanging out back here. Uh, so they're being protected by this little wall. This little wall creates this separation of space between them. Um, and not necessarily that it would be any use. Like, if this thing punched the wall, the wall would probably be destroyed. But compositionally, this creates the feeling of, okay, these characters are in relative safety, right? This character is exposed. Like, you can see there's nothing between them and the kaiju in the background. This character is exposed. They are a little bit more at risk, but these guys are safe. And it also separates them visually um, from the other characters in the image, like the the, the one down here uh, pulling a rock out of the wall here, the one up there doing that thing, and the kaiju. So they become these, this little trio of triangularly stacked rock stackers, uh, yordles. So separate from what's happening in the action, but still a part of the narrative that's going on, with that little bit of protection, like visually separating them from the rest of what's going on. Oh, okay. Ugh, tea. It's very warm. Um, <laughs> Braum would become friends with the kaiju. Oh, yeah, uh, he'd adopt it as a pet immediately. Um, so, yeah, compositionally, that works quite well. 
again, character designs, like, I just don't like... I'm just not much fond of character designs that depict, like, prehistoric peoples as, like, goofy or cartoony in the way that they're put together. Like, because, like, it's not that hard to sew a shirt. Like, it's it's genuinely, when if you have the capacity to make leather, it's not that hard to make a proper shirt out of it, like, with sleeves and shit. And so, like, when you see these prehistoric characters that are just, like, loincloths of, like, barely treated whatever is just, like, hanging on as, like... They would make clothes, you know? Like, we've made clothes since the Stone Age. It's like, we, we can make clothes, like pants and, and shoes and shirts and shit. We know how to do it. Um, so, like, again, th that's my historian brain coming in from my university days and saying, um, actually, that's not historically accurate to what the... Like, I know, it's, it's a little, but it's just... It's just a character design thing. Like, I don't like those tropes. They, they annoy me a little bit. But that's about all I really have for feedback. I'm excited to see Nar. Like, I'm really excited to see Nar coming in. I wonder if he's going to be a pure Bandle City character. Because, like... Because, like, most of the most of the prehistoric Yordles are, like, pure Bandle City, right? Um, or is it only the Stone Stackers? Wait, hang on. No, no, no. That one's a Freljord. Uh-uh. Yeah, so maybe maybe Nara's gonna be a Freljord Yordle. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah, not much to say about that one. That's just the control he's getting. Here's one of uh, <laughs> here's another one of Vagar's minions. So this one is a little bit confusing. Um, well, rather, it was confusing for me for a while. Like I was, I was as I was trying to look at it and figure out what the what the hell is going on here. What like what's what's the action here even supposed to be? But basically, this dude is turning this little frog creature or whatever. As far as I can tell, either transforming the owl cat into the frog creature or transforming the frog creature into an owl cat. It's one or the other, and I can't tell which it is. Because, like, it's not like his power does that. It's not like his power transforms anything into anything else. So, it's like, I'm not 100% sure what exactly is happening. Because the little thing is screaming, I have to imagine it is being turned into an owl cat, and that's the thing. And because this is, like, a bunch of other monsters in the scene, but only one other owl cat, so probably. But, but I don't know, like... I, I genuinely don't really know how to parse this guy's character design very well because he's got this hat and then this hat has these horns on it and then from inside those horns this dark transformation power comes out but it's this big hat and this little guy with his angry eyebrows and his metal armor I, I just I just don't really know how to parse this guy. Like, I, I don't really know what the concept of his character design is, like with this menagerie in the background. I, d I don't know how to parse him, especially as part of, like, Vagar's entourage of minions, because usually with Vagar's minions, the other ones, um, like, we have the, the wizened wizard here. Like, he's much more clear in what his concept is. Like, he's the guy who's sitting around scribing things into books, doing, like, magical stuff of Vagar. We have the... Uh like the stilted robe maker, who is basically the person in, in, in charge of making cool villain costumes for Vega, who has that same transforming power, like that same magic as the as the catalyzer guy is, is using coming out. But I in terms of like being an archetypal like villain character, I just don't know how to parse him. Like I can't I can't place him as an archetype. Like what's he supposed to be the intellectual smart one with the big brain? I guess, sort of, with that very large hat he has on his head, but then he does transformation magic to the thing, but then his actual power is just to make darkness have more power, so he's like, what, a power battery? I don't know. It's, he's, he's like, he's just kind of weird and, and not really very well placed in the aesthetics of, of, of Vagar and his minions, I think. But, uh, anyway, yeah, he's in the level 2 Vagar art, it's just, eh, um, but yeah, framing, you can see a very clear frame, like the helmet itself, along with the tendrils of magic, then the owl cat transforming. You can see we create this little space right here, where you have this guy in the foreground being the most saturated, etc., and then the monsters in the background being terrified by what he's doing to this thing over here. But yeah, I just I just can't really, I don't really vibe with this one very well, because I don't think it's, it's aesthetically storytelling very good. Then we have this guy. And I'm reasonably sure 
that's Poppy's dad. I'm reasonably sure. I am reasonably sure that that's Poppy's dad. It's not it's not 100% confirmed, but if you look at his armor, like the way that it's put together, the way that it's designed, a lot of the same aesthetics as Poppy. He seems to be able to make hammers. Uh, he's a forge master, and there's this thing, Poppy never listens to me, so you're better. It's not about the hammer, it's about the yordle who swings it. Like, he seems to be giving Poppy sort of fatherly advice. Um, and, like, it seems like he's supposed to be Poppy's dad. Um, also, but he also has, the, like, this father relationship with Peppy, which implies that Peppy is Poppy's younger sister, except she's probably not. It's, it's not 100% clear. Um... Yeah, Poppy, that's the other thing, as, as Publius, uh, Publius, Publius Nasso points out in chat. Because the thing is, Poppy, in her original lore, way back in the day, she was the daughter of a blacksmith. Um, like, that was very much a big part of her story, is she's the daughter of a blacksmith, that's why she has this suit of armor. And so, same color, more or less, as Poppy. Same hair color, very similar armor sets does blacksmithing it's like oh seems like seems like might be poppy's dad a uh, peppy could be poppy's niece yeah like we don't know what the family relationships are exactly and the little tooth the same as poppy's yes Snaggle tooth. Hmm. so yeah it's, it's not 100 percent clear like he might be poppy's dad uh, <laughs> for all we know but anyway Compositionally, a little bit of depth of field going on here. Rather than painting things more roughly, we've just applied an actual Gaussian blur filter uh, to the background here, which helps highlight the central characters in the image over here. And like, I like the visual relationship between the two of them, like with him presenting her with this hammer, um, like giving her like, you you're, you look up to Poppy so much, I'm going to make you this hammer out of wood so that you can like pretend to be the same as, as, as your big hero. According to Twitter Twitter riots Twitter rioters, Yordles don't have biological families, they aren't born from parents. Yeah. That's probably the simpler way to do that. Like no biological family, but just people adopt each other and stuff like that. Yeah. Makes sense. I can work with that. Um what was I saying? Right, compositionally. So like they're just highlighted by being in focus, whereas pretty much everything else in the scene isn't. Uh, they are sitting on this bench, which creates this little sort of visual uh, sort of sep uh, separation of, of characters from the background. And I just like the energy between them. Like, I like the sort of the sort of pleasant fatherly energy with which he's presenting this thing to her. And like the big wide-eyed kid on Christmas morning thing, looking at the thing that she's been gifted. Absolutely lovely. Speaking of characters, here's another one. <laughs> the Arena Kingpin. Talk about a character design, huh? There's a character and a half. Um, and what I really like about this guy is that, like, these these bodyguards he has, these swole yordles, these cursed swole yordles, they seem to be like his brothers or something. Like, they all like, they all have the same hairdo. They all have, like, the state. They all also have mustaches. They all have more or less the same head shape. Same, like, same fur colors. Like, it seems to be like a family business kind of thing that they're doing. Uh, <laughs> with the Arena Kingpin sitting there with, like, the gold tooth and the monocle. Like, he's such a caricature, but it's so good. And I like, um, you can see the, the, the henchman yordles. They have this tattoo around their eyes. Same as the, um, monocle that he has around his. Which is, like, fantastic. He's the Arena Bookie, too. No, I don't. Is he? Are they the same guy? I don't think they are. I'm pretty sure they're not. Ex like, they look similar, but... Well, I guess this guy just has a... His mustache has just grown, I guess? I feel like their fur color is different, though. Hmm. But yeah, there's a lot of shared design elements. Like, they both have the collar. They both have... Yeah, I guess the Arena Kingpin would be the Arena Bookie, but just later in life. Older. Maybe his dad... His, again, maybe they're related somehow. That was...
was a four cost, right? Where are you? Three cost? There you are. Um, but yeah, he's just in there. Like, again, highlighted by literal highlights. Like, there's literally just the light falling on him. That doesn't really... Like, you can see the light just falls a little bit on the, on the brim of the cap of the sort of supplicating dude in the background who's giving him this document or whatever. Um, he's just literally just highlighted by sunlight, by, by direct light from above. Um, centering him as the main character. And then every other character is placed around him. Like, you can see how they sort of form this... This band around where he like where he's positioned specifically and he's in front of everyone he's like the, the foremost character in the image hence there we go then we have the babbling balladeers <laughs> and I quite like this one because uh, as far as I understand from the storytelling here like they're singing a song this is a song about Poppy the strong Poppy the mightiest Friday's strong <laughs> scratched out lyrics from the songbook of Reginald Reginald Dactyl and Faltimisque, Bard's Extraordinaire. So they're singing a big song about what a hero Poppy is, and she's just sitting there being really embarrassed by it. <laughs> it's like, oh, come on, I'm not a hero. Like, leave me alone. Which I just think is quite adorable, frankly. Um, oh, there's a super chat. Uh, why is the fish thigh gap the child one? I don't know. What would you say is your favorite card from the new expansion design-wise? I don't... I mean... <laughs> I'm sorry, unknown guy, but like when people ask me to, to pick favorites, I can never do it. I'm I'm terrible at it. I don't know how to pick favorites. I just don't because things are good for different reasons. So, sorry, I I I've talked about a lot of the ones I like. That's that's the best I can do for you. I'm afraid. <laughs> anyway, uh, like Poppy just sitting there being embarrassed by it all, like just like, oh my god, you guys, jeez, <laughs> like holding her hair in front of her ears, like, sort of trying to cover her face. It's very, very, very adorable. And these two dudes just being super, like, don't care that they're embarrassing her because they want to sing her a cool song about how cool she is. Um, which I think is, like, it's a cute little relationship with the bards. <laughs> it's like, just how enthusiastic they are about their craft. And the little, yeah, as, as, as Apple of Doom points out in chat, the, the owl cat bird here just applauding her as well, uh, which I, which is also very cute. The light here, by the way, is fantastic. Like, so we have this, uh, you can see again how the light is used to create contrast in the characters. And Poppy, she's a little washed out by the light. Like, you can see that the light makes her colors a little bit more pale and sort of washes her out a little bit with this bright yellow. But the bards, even though the sunlight is hitting them the same way, they don't get washed out nearly as much, which gives them that greater sense of contrast, just a little bit more, which makes them a little bit more prominent as characters in the image than Poppy herself. So, like, even though there's a champion in the image, these two can be the main character of, of, of the interaction. And then we have Bandle City Mayor. We have Tristana and Timo here in the foreground, uh, just listening to his big speech. And the mayor himself, who's like a fantastic character design, isn't he? Like, he's just adorable. With his giant, enormous, like, miles-long mustache that needs two servants to carry it on either side. And, like, his big, fancy overcoat, and then that completely dopey face. Like, just like, oh, yes, I'm the mayor of Bandwell City. I can't believe I had a speech. <laughs> like, he really has that energy all over the place with the big hat. And, like, the golden rings and, like, all the finery and shit. Like, that's that's all over. I am the Bandwell City mayor. Like, he really, he really does give off that, that general feeling of, like, yeah, yeah, he's the mayor, but, like, he's not in charge of anything. People just, like, he, get, he gets a big hat and he gets to make speeches and that's about, <laughs> like, then everyone else just gets on with their day. <laughs> Which I just think is absolutely lovely. He's just a good character design. I, li I like him a lot. Oh, right, uh, composition. Again, he's on a pedestal. He's above all the other characters. Like, he's very bright. You, here, you can really tell, like, the thing about, like, contrast and brightness. He has all these bright, saturated, highly saturated colors against this very pale background. And again, that's what makes him stand out. And he's more saturated than any of the other characters in the frame, etc. We've spoken about these things already. Here's another character I quite like, the Bandle City Painter. Um... I need to stop taking... I I start a sentence, and then I take a sip of tea, 
for some fucking reason, and <laughs> then I go and talk. And so the most prominent cool, um, like, design feature of this, this Bandel City painter is that her hair is brushes. Like, it's basically her, like, it's either she has paint brushes, like, stuck in her, in her hairband, which I think is what's going on, but it also sort of vaguely implies that her hair is tied up in such a way that it looks like a paintbrush itself. And as you can see, like, the ponytail that she's got coming down here, she has used that as a paintbrush. Like, you can see it's been dipped in paint um, in order to, to, to put paint on the canvas. And I just kind of, she's just such a hippy-dippy sort of painter type. Like, she's wearing this long shirt and no pants. Like, there is just this wonderful hippy-dippy painterly, like, I, I just like expressing myself with paint on the canvas kind of energy. It's just lovely. One, this is a wonderful character design. Like, and it's so on the nose. Like, it's such a Pokemon character design thing of like, oh, we have a char we have a character that's supposed to be a painter. Let's just put like just put paintbrushes all just paintbrushes for hair, which is kind of similar to what's it called? That one Pokemon that's also a painter, and it has like a beret, and like its tail is a paintbrush. Like, it's that level of completely unsubtle, but I really like it. Like, it's, it's like, because it doesn't need to be subtle. These are yordles. They're not subtle creatures. They're silly. They're fun. And then we have the, the lovely little cat stool. Like, this little stool with, like, paint cans hanging off it and everything. That is also apparently animated and alive and is a cat. <laughs> Which is a lovely thing. Yeah, Smeargle. Smeargle. Yeah. Now, the thing I do wonder about is who is the yordle here in the background? Because I can't remember seeing him in any of the other cards yet, but he has all these trophies in front of him, which sort of implies to me that he's gonna be some sort of important Yordle champion. Like, not a champion champion, but like he's gonna be the champion of Yordle stuff. He's gonna be like the, the arena champion for the Yordlers or something. Yeah, the Yordle is being painted, I know, but, but what I'm wondering is who is this guy? Like, cause we haven't seen him elsewhere in the, uh, as when the cards yet, so I assume he's going to be showing up with one of the expansions at some point. But yeah, uh, again, framing and aesthetic, we have, like, the big window in the background, again, creates that washed-out, desaturated backdrop against which the main character can then be framed, like, as, as being much more in focus and being much more highly contrasted. No, oh, it's LeBlanc, yeah, of course it's LeBlanc, um... And so all the things we've, we've talked about before, like saturation, about highlights, about uh, about focus, about contrast, all of that applies to this character as well, and to her canvas as well, which is sort of a secondary part of her character, which I think is quite lovely. <laughs> then we get back to the Light Sentinels, and again, it's like, wow, these are a whole bunch of cool character designs. Sure would have been nice to have an event about them or something, like to, to, to be told their stories, and the stuff, like, just to, like, that, that, that would have been cool if we got to actually see them and interact with them and hear their stories and not just pass over them for two seconds because they're NPCs in a story that's not really going to explore anyone's characterization very much except maybe Lucian and Senna. That would have been cool. That, it's, wow. I mean, imagine how amazing that would be. Like, just to have a whole set, a whole event about the, the Sentinels of Light and, like, them, them sort of, like, doing their thing. We call it something like the Rise of the Sent. That would be cool. I wish I wish Riot would put on an event like that. That would be great. Like, just... I Could, could you imagine how cool it would be if we had, like, a visual novel about these? That would be great. It's such a pity that that hasn't happened. <laughs> it's just... I'm just trying to cope, guys. I'm just trying to cope. Um, <laughs> I'll make that video at some point. Anyway... Uh, the Buhuru Sentinel, uh, or the Buru Sentinel is the, uh, central character here. And the simple way to make that happen is just to have him be in front. Like, he's just in front of everyone else. He's just, like, the, the only character who's completely uncovered, except by the boat. And then everyone else is sort of, like, aligned around him. So he just looks like this dude with his three girlfriends, uh, sailing off to do some, some undead fighting. Which looks quite cool. I quite like the boats. Like, I quite like using the boat as a frame, right? Like, we talk so much about framing, and here you can see, like, literally it's just the boat is just doing the job of creating the frame for the character to occupy. Um, 
And that works really well because like it means like unlike something like the poppy or level two art where we talked about like the wings of the monster taking up so much space but not doing anything for the storytelling of the image. Instead, we get little things over here. Like we have the other boats. Like we can see that there's multiple boats that they're sailing in like some sort of a fleet towards the Shadow Isles. But then you also get this ominous green glow um, from like deep below the water where you can see like this edge lighting coming up on, on the spear that's hanging off the side of the boat. So like there's a little bit of environmental storytelling going on for the Sentinels there. And for like where they're journeying to, where they're journeying to somewhere where, the, where the water glows green for some reason. So it's probably bad. <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. So, here we have these guys again. We've seen them before. Uh, they they were milling around in Serath's level 3 art. They've been sort of around in Serath-related art before. These are the Endless Devouts. And what they seem to be are just like these crackling lightning elementals that are occupying these mummy forms, these shapes or whatever. Um, and there's some cool things going on. Like, I quite like the idea of them having, like, this 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 hat with the eyes on that sort of gives them a face. And then these bandages sort of just hanging down, like, this curtain of hair around the head. Like, that's a really cool way to create a character out of them. Outside of that, I don't know. They're not that interesting. Like, I, I, I can see they're doing a thing with chains. Like, that Serath is associated with chains because he's, like, bound in chains. And he's, like, the guy who tried to break free of his chains, that kind of thing. But it's just, like, I don't know. I... I don't think that these guys sort of meaningfully interact with Serath's themes that much. Like, they just sort of, they're just sort of like, oh, lightning creatures that serve Serath kind of thing. Where I feel like the character design could go a lot harder on any of the themes of, of who he is. Serath is in the background fully bound. Is that... Well, mm, I'm not sure that that's Serath bound. I'm not sure that that's what that is. I think this is Serath's lair. Um, I don't like this. Isn't the tomb where Serath was was uh, was sealed? I think this is a lair that Serath has built because these like because in the tomb where Serath was was sealed, it was just him and Renekton, and it was the tomb of the Emperors, which is the same place that Azir um, was uh, was trapped. So I don't think this is Serath's coffin, and I don't think this is like him being fully bound before breaking free. I think this is a lair. Like, I think this is, this is like, Serath's palace or whatever. <laughs> because, like, this seems more... Like, the Tomb of the Emperors is no less lavish for serving as Serath's prison. Indeed, the beauty of the place in this trapping zone, I think, if not a reminder of the inhabitants fall from grace, a gilded prison. Like, this looks more like Serath being bound by something or other. Um... Isn't that in the background Zerath's eyes? You mean this thing? Yeah, I mean, it, storytelling-wise, it it wouldn't make sense to me that if this was the Tomb of the Emperors. Like, storytelling-wise, this wouldn't make sense to me. Like, that that that's weird that Zerath would have minions in the Tomb of the Emperor or, like, being able to... Like, where would where would he get... Like, I don't know. That that doesn't really make sense to me. I think this is something that, that Zerath built rather than, than, like, than anything else. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly what they're doing. So, insider knowledge. This one's mostly notable just because it has Karina's hand. Like, this is seen from Karina's perspective as she's looking at some documents of the Piltover Enforcers and gaining insight knowledge. This is a popular case, you know. Just had a chap in here earlier looking at it today. Enjoy. As the station archivist hands over the information to Karina, who is looking at it and, like, sort of recording insider information for herself to use in her plans. Sarah's new army would make better use of the tomb of many artifacts, turning useless extravagance into a powerful conduit for the ascendant's magic. So the idea here, what being that he has taken over the tomb of the emperors and using it as a base? Yeah, I mean, maybe, but that right there would still not be Serath's coffin. Like, it wouldn't be. That wouldn't make any sense with the story as we know it. Uh, so, okay, I guess Serath has taken over the tomb of the emperors and he's using it to do Serath stuff. Yeah, I suppose. So, here we have uh, an old friend. This is the Golden Narwhal, or the Golden... The, uh, uh, what's it called? It's not called a narwhal. It's called... Uh, 
Let's see, it's a hunting fleet that does it. Where the hell is it? Oh, it's the Rising Tide. Yeah, it is the Golden Narwhal. That's what it's called. The Hunting Fleet is hunting the Golden Narwhal down here, which is this poor creature right there. The Elusive with Vulnerable, which is such a useless combination. Um, and what we get in the new artwork is a scene of the thing having actually escaped and now being helped by the Journeying Sandhopper, who are like, he, it's been trapped in these nets. And then the journeying sand hopper and its friend is basically helping break it out, break it out as those nets so it can escape. Yeah, rising tides. Yes, thank you, chat. I, I forgot that it was introduced in rising tides. Um, and here's another good mermaid design because like a lot of him is like pretty basic, right? Like he's got the mermaid tail with the fish scales and stuff. And then if you look at his head, and I wish I could zoom in, but like the head has this mantle of like coral-like fins that's bursting out from the side giving him this, like, very strange head shape. He's got these completely black eyes with no whites. Is that Nami? Are you sure? Because that doesn't look like her staff. To me. It could be. Yeah, it could be Nami, but, like, that just doesn't look like her staff. But yeah, and he's got the four arms. Like he, like he looks a lo lot more monstrous than mermaids and mer people typically do. Yeah, the crown again. Like I, I'm pretty sure that's just a, a marae, like a marae, wearing a he wearing headgear that's similar to Nami's. Like I'm not, I'm not sure that that's that that's Nami. Um. But yeah, like he's just like he's just a cool because he's got the four arms. He looks more monstrous. He looks more weird, and he's got this long ass like golden mane of hair like flowing around him all over the place. <laughs> like he, he's just he's just a fantastic little character. It's very interesting. Like again, this thing of doing unique things with mer creatures instead of just having like human with fish tail. Let's have human with fish tail and a bunch of other stuff on top of it as well. Which I think is quite nice. So, uh, framing. Here's an interesting thing. The golden narwhal itself acts as the frame for the image. You can see how, like, it creates this separating line that runs through the splash art or through the artwork. And within that, that sort of creates, uh, like, the frame for the characters to occupy with the narwhal being part of the, being one character. And then this guy and this character being the secondary characters sort of occupying the space. And it's like, this just very well put together. Like, it's a clever way to use the fact that you have a huge character in the screen is to simply use them as a frame to highlight other characters that are also doing stuff. He has four arms like a fish. No, he has four arms like a crustacean. Like some, like, a, like, like, uh, he's got like many sea creatures that have multiple limbs, you know, like crustaceans, crabs, any kind of thing. Like using the fact that they are not human, like instead of just making them normal humans, Give, give them some weird shit. Like, make some weird shit happen with them. So, not a ton to say about the Noble Rebel. It's just, uh, it's just yet another one of, of like, the Grey Legion dead soldier people. Uh, Storyline seems to be um, that this, this character was, like, a Demacian spy in Noxus. And they killed her, and then they brought her back to life and sent her against the Demacians as a soldier, like as a as a shock trooper, to demoralize the people in the Demacian garrison when they saw their own former companion coming at them with a weapon, kind of thing. That seems to be the storyline. Compositionally, not a lot to say. Like you can see how the banner, uh, like the background here, a little bit, little bit of a frame there, not very much, but she's framed against again. The thing that they always do when they're doing city scenes, you have buildings on the left, you have buildings on the right, you have no buildings overlapping with the background of the character so that they can be f uh, framed against basically these flat color spaces of just cloud, gray, a little bit of orange, in order to sort of highlight the character themselves as the center of attention. Here we get a good look at uh, how Caitlyn's Piltover Peacemaker works. I'm not... Sh I, I don't know how... <laughs> how that gun launches that thing. Uh, but here, I guess, is a better look at what it theoretically looks like. Is this 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 sort of mechanical Hextech contraption thing. 
that she fires from her gun. Uh, so that's that's neat that we that we have a better look at it now, I guess. And here we have the pompous cavalier. 900 and it's 999, 1000. There we are, Borky. You look as impeccable as ever. Okay, now do mine. And the idea here being apparently that he's been brushing um, his big chicken mount's hair <laughs> to give it a nice pompadour um, and not paying attention to the fact that he's got a giant razor beak coming at him right now. Maybe you attach it before firing. Yeah, it seems like that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, say hello to the pompous cavalier, one of Poppy's followers, a very silly man, uh, who seems to, like, he seems to be basically Poppy's version of, uh, what the hell is he called? Nope, it's not him. Oh, duelist, duelist. Nope. Darn. Ugh. It's Poppy's version of this guy. Basically, like, it's basically this guy again, like, this dude, this, like, pompous, self-assured, idiot, incompetent moron dude. But just Poppy's version of him with this guy who has these grand aspirations to be a cavalier, and he has this, he has his own squire, and has all this fancy gear, and he has this big chicken mount, and then, like, the moment a monster actually shows up, he gets... <laughs> he gets thrown off because his chicken runs off. Uh, which is one of the spells, has the artwork for that. Yeah, stress defense. His chicken throws him off and runs away, and he cowers behind a tree while Poppy kicks the ass of the big bird monster. Yeah, Laurent Chevalier, something like that. Laurent something something. Um, and again, like nothing we haven't talked about before, saturation, contrast, the background characters are a little bit more washed out, and that's sort of what centers them uh, in the image. I love this melody so much. There we go. Anyway, here's um here's something interesting, lore-wise, something quite fascinating. In fact, this is a Solari Sentinel. This is one of the Sentinels of Light from Targon, who seems to be doing something to Ledros. And what I can't help but wonder is because so the storytelling of the new Sentinel cards and of like Senna leading them to the Shadow Isles to do a thing is that apparently like Senna has the ability to free cursed spirits from the Black Mist, like to free them from their torment, to like set them free as, as spirits to go to the afterlife or do whatever they want. And so the thing I can't help but wonder is whether or not maybe what the uh, Solari Sentinel is doing here is casting some sort of spell or magic on Ledros's head. And the thing is, Ledros, like he, like everyone else, he is mind controlled by the Black Mist. Like he's trapped there. And he's like one of the closest of the big Shadow Isles monsters to having his own mind back. Like he's the closest one to having free will. He doesn't quite have it, but he's the closest one to having it. And I wonder if this is a prelude, like if what we're being shown here is that this Sentinel of Light frees Ledros's mind somehow so that he can actually be free to become a new card in the game that can do something else like that's that's kind that's kind of the feeling that I'm getting Ledros's helmet also looks very Solari-ish yeah well no Ledros is from Camavor he's one of uh, Viego's soldiers he was the he's the lover of Kai of uh Callista. He's Callista's former lover uh, who died alongside her, and he's, he's been trying to free her for a long, long time. He's been trying to help her free escape from the Black Mist and no longer become and, like, no longer be controlled by vengeance. And he has failed many, 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 many times. This is the past? Yeah. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know if this is, like, a past thing where Senna led the Sentinels to the Shadow Isles in the past or whatever, but I kind of, I, 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 I kind of hope that let this, this is an indication that Ledros is going to undergo some sort of transformation. Cause, 
Because I, I want my boy to, like, have some more time with Callista. Like, Ledros and Callista's story is great. I Like, I love it. I love it a lot. Anyway, uh, not a lot to say about the composition. There's really only two characters on screen, and there's very little background or anything else going on. So the main feature is really just, like, this bright light that she's sending with a little halo of, of a rainbow, uh, which I think is quite nice, that she's sending into his head, doing this, like, this very intent expression as she's trying to something something on Ledros. Unbound Letros incoming. Yeah, I mean, that's the worst case scenario, but uh, since he's not a champion, I don't think they're going to bother ruining him. Um, which is like, and so the color contrast here is the big story, because like Letros and everything on the shadows, like just green and teal and like ghostly and like black and rawr. So like we have these black, we have this teal, we have like all of this green. And then the Sentinel herself is like, she has like this dark brown skin. And she has, like, these golden colors and this bright white cloak that contrasts so beautifully against all the green. Like, I just love the color combinations here. Like, it's, she's so gorgeous, especially against all of this. Then we have the Station Archivist. And uh, here we have Corinna. You can see her, like, hanging out in... Piltover and Forcer HQ getting all the information she needs. This is basically when she gives that case that we saw in Insider Knowledge that for Karina to uh, to examine. Um, so like, so that's part of that storyline. The station uh, archivist herself, though, is a card that we know from Foundations. Yeah, let's see, Piltover Sun. She's the astute academic who has uh, basically found a new job with uh, the Piltover Enforcers, which I thought was quite lovely. Oh no, God, Foundations, go away. Don't need you. Where is she? Where did I go? There. She's now the station archivist instead, which I thought was like a nice little, nice, nice little continuation of her story. And the cat is indeed Fun Yip, by the way. Um, so what happened last time we saw Fun Yip, he was falling through the air as the fallen feline, and Echo saves him, and then takes him back through time. And because Echo's powers, remember, like when he goes back through time, it reverses damage and changes done to his body a little bit. So they reversed Fun Yip back far enough that he lost his. Like, he lost his cybernetic eye, he lost his cybernetic enhancements. And so, he gets shifted back through time. Echo basically, I think, delivers the cat to the Piltover Enforcer or something, or gives him to the Station Archivist, who then adopts poor Fun Yip as a pet, um, while his broken foot, which is still, which was apparently broken in the fall or something, I don't know how exactly the timeline works out, uh, to nurse him back to health. So that is Fun Yip hanging out with a Station Archivist there. Just, he's gone through like a time warp and there's been all kinds of nonsense going on. <laughs> they also retcon catastrophe. Yeah, like necess necessarily sort of. I'm not 100% sure how they're handling those timelines, but but yeah, that's that's basically the idea is that Fun Yip is now hanging out with the Piltover Enforcers, being a very annoyed little office cat <laughs> who like, wants to get out of there, but can't because everyone is just like fawning over him too much. <laughs> Why does Fun Yip have more lore than like half the champions? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he, has, he, is, he is the character in the game who has the most cards that he appears in, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Fun Yip is the character who appears in more cards than any other character in Le Legends of Runeterra. <laughs> so yeah, uh, framing and aesthetic, not much to say there. We've kind of gone over all of the things already. I will say I do I do really like the character design of this one. Like I like the vest. I like the like the saturated red shirt against like the against like the the pale teal um not teal tan against the pale tan skirt. And like the big glasses, it's just a very appealing character design. She's just a very nice character. I really like her. She's so pretty. Except LeBlanc. Yes, fair enough, Axolotl. Except LeBlanc. <laughs> and then we have the tidal wave, which goes from like this wave to this wave to this wave. And the thing I want to I want to compliment it on one thing, that it didn't go into the sort of tedious thing of referencing uh, the wave, which is like the tedious thing that you all like. 
which is the tedious thing that people always do. Um, the Great Wave of Kawanaga, which is the uh, Hokusai... Is it Hokusai? Is that his name? Uh, it is Hokusai. Like, that they didn't reference this image. Like, props to them for not, like, doing a direct... A direct reference to that. Because that's, like, that's kind of such a hack thing to do. Um, but instead, they just kept it on the idea of just the wave throwing over a boat. Like, it's not it's not dissimilar, but it's not, like, the direct, like, oh, we're just going to put the wave in our thing. So, another one of Zerath's minions. Um, is some fumes worth looking at? Is it? I don't think so. Like, it's just... It's just wumps eating mushrooms. So, the Waste Walker, another one of Zerath's minions. And you can see here it's confronting a Sand Soldier, uh, which seems to be a little bit overmatched by this thing. Um, and, yeah, again, framing and composition-wise, not much to say, because, like, it just... It's obviously the main character by virtue of it is a big, giant, glowing thing right in the center of the image, and nothing else is nearly as bright as it is. Um, it re it retains, in terms of character design, like, here we see a little bit of that repetition of, like, Serath's sort of... Serath has this fundamental character theme of being someone who tried to escape being controlled by others, right? Like, he's a slave who wanted to escape his slavery. Um, and so some of that carries over into some of the character design of his minions. Like, you can see this guy here, who's essentially, like, held up by these fragments of obelisk. So he's, like, dancing on Serath's strings, is the idea there. So, control. Um, and this guy has this thing of, like, he has this Chinese finger trap thing. Like, he has this, this, this like, manacles or shackles looking thing that his arms are trapped in and chains coming off it with blades. Like, so there's like, a little bit of that sort of being chained up, imprisoned, breaking your chains. Like, there's a little bit of that imagery there, sort of. But then a bunch of Serath's minions don't really have that, which is why, why I've been sort of lukewarm on them, is that a lot of them just don't really... That thematic is not really fully carried through um, into, into the character. Serath should have arm bindings like this guy does. Yeah, like, that would be better on Serath because, like, that's his whole thing. Um, but, yeah, it's, like, mm, I, it's like I'm, I'm sort of lukewarm on the character designs of all of Serath's minions because, like, the, the theme is there, kind of, but it's not carried through. Like, it's not really applied fully to all of them, which is, like, eh. I'm not even sure these elementals are people. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it seems to be like, these guys here seem to be human. Like, these, or at least partly human somehow. And then the rest of them seem to be elementals or extensions of Serath's power or something or other. It's not 100% clear. I will say, in this artwork, I really love, like, the, the earth kind of being shattered and torn apart by the power. Like, you get this sense of, like, this swirling storm that sort of appears at the feet of this creature, like, holds it up. You, you, kind of really do get the sense of unleashed power like tearing the world apart as this thing moves forward which I think is quite nice <laughs> ah the Yordle newbie <laughs> uh, just trying to face off against this giant grass monster as Ava <laughs> sits there I have found a thing that we are looking for oh, that's not good <laughs> as this poor guy <laughs> tries to fend off this thing with a knife that's basically strapped to a stick. And you can see he's got like a fork strapped onto there as well. A very improvised weaponry all around. <laughs> and you can see here in the background that the furious Fae Folk is swinging into the rescue um, as this grass monster emerges out of the ground. I need to sit down, by the way. I've been standing for the last three hours. There we go. Lowered my desk. Ah, that's better. Um, so yeah, again, like compositionally the same things we've talked about, but there's also a frame here. You can see the monster traveling into the branches of the tree. Like, this whole thing creates a little frame around the poor Yordle newbie as he's trying to hold off the beast. Like, very heroically trying to defend Ava, even though he's clearly terrified out of his mind um, with his little improvised weapon. And it's like, like a really nice pose on him because you can see, like, he's reluctant but determined. 
And that does kind of come through, like, in the way that he's framed and presented. Which I quite like. And then, of course, there's Ava's face, which is like... Oh, shit. Like... <laughs> It's it's such, it's such an oh shit face. I really like it. So, here's the wizened wizard, which is one of the Vagar's minions, obviously. And then there's the minions! Actual minions, which are also Vagar's minions. We have a caster minion here in the background. And we have these other little minions, like, just standing there, doing stuff like watching him transcribe, using the dark Vagar power or whatever to tra transcribe runes into a book at the behest of Lord Vega, who wants something to be written down for whatever reason. So, composition and framing. Here we're using the vanishing point again. Like, you can see if you pay attention to any of the perspective lines in the background of the image, you can see how they all kind of converge a little bit around this guy. We have these ornamentations in the background that sort of all curve inwards towards our central character. So he's very central in the image. He's very central in the scene. And so everything sort of ends up pointing to him. And so do the, these tendrils of darkness that like swirl around. They all sort of come towards him and seem to move at his commands. So like every, all the action in the image revolves around the central guy. And that's what keeps us grounded and centered on him as the main character. And then we have the Abyssal Guard. And here again... Like, just lovely use of mermaid ideas that aren't bound to just being person plus fishtail. Oh yeah, Ganondoodles, uh, go to bed, sleep. This this stream is not that important, I promise you. The VODs will be up tomorrow and you can watch it there. Um, again, lovely variety in the way that you design a mermaid, because here we have a mermaid that, first of all, has the, like these octopus tentacles rather than like just being like a fishtail, but then those octopus tentacles, rather than being octopus tentacles, have the same sort of frilly fins and, like, fans that Nami has, like, on her tail as well. Like, these frilly sort of goldfish fishtails things coming off them that gives them this, like, this wonderfully fuzzy sort of flappy quality that just, it's just, it works really well. It's a really, really cool character design. And then you extend that into giving him these long flappy wings and, like, these, like, these, these fins coming off of his face. Like, it's an absolutely gorgeous character design. Really well composed and put together in terms of just how different and odd it is. Jellyfish, jellyfish manta ray. Yeah, basically. Like, this is such a cool... This is just such a cool version of a mermaid creature. Again, this thing about... Yeah, merfolk, yes. Uh, like, this thing about taking the basic idea of person plus undersea creature and just not only changing the creatures that you're using as inspiration, but mixing and matching different sea creatures as well. So, like, octopus plus goldfish. Octopus plus... Like, like uh, crustacean plus another thing. Like, I just, I just think that's, that's really nice. That's really cool. And it makes Nami, like, it makes me have much less of a problem with Nami's character design because now there is variety and we get to see that Nami is just, like, one out of many different possible options for what the Marai can, can be. And yeah, uh, nothing new in the framing or the aesthetic. Again, he's more rendered, he has more color, he has more contrast, everything else is desaturated relative to him. I do like the pose, like he's got this arm outstretched as though like, it, it looks as though Nami is being chased by something, right? Like Nami is fleeing from something, carrying the corrupted moon pearl, and he's like throwing out an arm and saying, I'll take care of it, you just flee. Um, which, is, which, I, which I think is like, good little bit of storytelling, that he is the abyssal guard, like he's the guy who guards from the abyss spreading any further than it has already gone. Then we have the aloof travelers. And I really like these two. Whereas Trap ever. Cause like because like she has this total like, ugh, you dropped something. I don't wanna be here. I think this is stupid. And he has like this much more loud, whiny sort of complaining thing. And these two are like clearly these two day trippers who like showed up to join the Yordle Scouts for like for like a day or two because their dad told them so or whatever, and they just don't want to be there. <laughs> and now the Yordle troop are stuck lugging these two idiots around who, like, don't know how to do anything and who carry way too many things and, like, are carrying, like, these robes and clocks and God knows what else, useless garbage, tourist nonsense. 
So, like, just as characters, they're a lovely contrast with, like, the... Because all the Yordle Scouts otherwise, they're so earnest, right? Like, Yordle Scout, hap, two, three, four. Like, they're so earnest. They care so much. They're so dedicated to, like, the survivalist thing. And then you have these two little spoiled brat assholes. <laughs> just, like, getting dragged along and having to learn important life lessons. Absolutely in fantastic. I love them. You dropped something. I dropped everything! <laughs> yeah. Like, this is lovely characters. And again, compositionally, they are raised, like here, like standing on top of all of this stuff, basically. You can see the background is desaturated and sort of flat color, mostly. And they're separated visually and, like, separated physically from the rest of the Ordal uh, Scout Troop because they are separate from them. They don't want to be part of them. And you can see Ava over here giving them, like, a very dirty look because she's like, oh, God, tourists. <laughs> This one, not really much to say about it. I just really like this. Like, I really like the screaming, melting face in the background. I think it's really cool. And also, this, this to me feels like a tease that Pantheon is coming. Just because warring against the gods seemed a fool's errand, but through the scars and through the screams, those brave few learned lessons. The gods thought singularly selfishly and had lost the gift of camaraderie. This would be their weapon, this would be their armor. That, to me, feels like Pantheon shit. Like, that feels like Pantheon stuff. Like, that feels like they're associated with Atreus. Um, like, that feels like like he's they're teasing that he might be a character who's coming to the game at some point, which would be nice. Oh my god, someone in chat has the name Peck Me Ilawi, which is very valid, honestly. So, Benemony. <laughs> um, so this is like an anemone creature, which again, lovely diversity of sea creatures um, in, in like the Legends of Runeterra, where it's not just fish and it's not just like crabs, but it's like all kinds of different sea creatures being used to create these interesting like monsters and beasties for characters to interact with. And the Benemone is an anemone, obviously, with a big friendly smile and and too many tentacles. Um, <laughs> just kind of hanging out, lounging on the seafloor and playing around with this dude by swinging him through the water. Uh, as he screams for air and is probably about to drown, which is a little bit, a little dark. Hentai potato. Oh no, don't call it that. Don't call it that. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh, we're moving on. We're moving on. We're not analyzing that anymore. We're moving on. Moving on. Moving on to the catalog of regrets, appropriately. As, uh, as we get a visit from a friend. A friend. A friend whom we all love. Unbound Thresh is hanging out. He's standing there with his lantern doing Thresh things. Uh, just, just hang out. Uh, but anyway, the catalog of regrets itself seems to be some sort of library of pain and suffering and misery. Which, you know, is why Thresh would be there. But what I really like about this thing is the composition. Like, I really like the compositional idea of, like, first of all, you have the frame of the library itself, right? Like, you can see this thing creates a frame around it. And then you have this pile of books, and then on top of that pile of books this stone arch of floating stone that's like half shattered and then that one book just sitting there open sort of billowing in this vast and wild wind that's whipping through this place um like that's just as, a, as an image as imagery that's really compelling and cool where you get the sense of like this pile of books cannot possibly stand like there's nothing supporting it and yet there it sits and, like, you can see, like, you can also see the colors on the pile of books is much warmer. Like, there's much more warmth to the colors on the pile of books relative to everything else in the scene, which is part of what makes the thing stand out. And just, like, the imagery of, like, that one arch and that book hovering open in the middle of it, that's just, mwah, that's just really good. That's just a really, really nice composition. Alice here holds two shots. One's a greeting, the other's a farewell. You two want to meet? <laughs> so here we have the gruff grenadier, and probably the yordle who's closest to having essentially Graves gun, uh, with his big double-barreled shotgun that shoots big spiky metal acorns or whatever at creatures like the big ugly thing that they're driving back from the bandle portal. 
Um, and yeah, like framing and composition, you can see the tree that he's covering behind is doing a little, like sort of leads into his back, which sort of leads into the branch that he's sitting on, which again helps separate him a little bit from the scene of the thing that he's actually shooting at, which is the big tree monster thing, whatever it is. Um, so like, like again, this thing of separating the character from the action, not completely, like he's not completely covered by anything, but you get the sense like he's covering before he's rejoining the action. And that sense of separation is also enforced with the light because you can see like the explosion that's going off on the big troll creature, oops, in the background there. That casts this strong edge lighting all along the Yordle himself and all along the tree branches around where they're doing the battle. But that golden lighting, you can see it doesn't extend into the background over here. So you get, again, this separation of spaces where here's the battle, here is relative safety as they're covering. And it just works really well. Like, it's, it's just a, a perfectly nicely executed bit of framing. And then you have the secondary framing with the back of the buff Yordle into this that sort of creates a framing for the monster that they're fighting which is like a secondary character in the image then we have justice rider which this one's maybe a little cartoony i feel like this one is maybe a little much um <laughs> it's like it's in terms of of like okay so apparently piltover has motorcycle cops not only and not only do they have motorcycle cops these people dress like lunatic superheroes like this this looks like a knockoff like like a, like like it escaped from a sort of middle tier sentai show um i get this one's maybe a little like especially for the scent for the uh, piltover enforcers this one's a bit much like this one's a bit this, this one's a bit children's cartoon uh, for me. Like, I, a little, little, little much. Um, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, but, like, it kind of shouldn't be. Like, I don't think that's really the vibe of the Enforcers in the same way. Um, but, yeah, I think, it, like, as someone says, says in, the, uh, in the chat, like, the idea seems to be that she's, like, this, this character is like a, a motorcycle piltover patrol person and they just like go way too hard with it. Like they go way overboard and they have like a big costume and they sort of like they sort of think of themselves as the coolest person in the world. But it is like for me, it's a little much like for me, it's a little outside of the aesthetic of, of the piltover enforcers. So, you know, eh, doesn't really work for me. But as a composition, it works quite well. We have these barrels that are like bar like falling off um, the truck that this officer is in pursuit of. Which seems to be like the um, the ah, uh, what's he called? Uh, salesman guy. Yeah, it seems to be the used cask salesman, uh, who's like, just like, dragging his merch around. Um, and she like in pursuit, trying to prevent him from being able to get his stuff to Piltover or to a buyer or whatever it is. Um, and so you have this swoop, right? Like you have this swoop of like this canister that's falling off and these barrels like swoop you into the truck itself. And that creates like this little, this little sort of like flow in the image that drives your attention to the central character, which of course more highlighted, more saturated, uh, higher contrast, sort of being centered as the main character of the image with direct sunlight coming down upon them. And then there's the lecturing Yordle. Like, don't get him started. Uh, well, back in my day, this kid say had respect for their elders. Like, he just, that's his whole character. It's just he's an old dude with a big beard who lectures everybody about how things were better when he was a kid. As Ava is doing her very best to set up <laughs> to set up Yordle snap traps uh, to use in whatever it is the Yordle scout trope is doing as Timo is sort of excitedly coming along behind everyone. So not much framing, like there's a little bit with the like the tree here going into Ava's backpack, sort of creating this sort of half frame above him, into which points like his lecturing finger. He's the most central character. He's the most oh, well, he's not the most central, but he's the most frontmost character. He's the biggest character, and he's highlighted more than Ava is. Ava is the secondary character because she's the one who's listening uh, to all of his nonsense. But yeah, all the same things we yeah, it's a boomer yordle. It's a boomer yordle basically. It's a complaining grandpa Yordle. Then we have the Mariah Great Mother. And again, 
Like, motherfucker is some fucking cool ass goddamn mermaid merfolk creatures. Just a, look how cool mother, motherfucking cool this is. This is so rad. Like, with the scales that look like feathers almost, like down and like she's got these growths coming out of her back, like anemones or coral or whatever it is, like this big mane of hair. And like this big sort of cloak of like a fin that just billows out behind. Like, it's just a fucking cool character design. Like, it's just such a cool character design. Ah, that's cool. That's good. Like, again, that's the thing that, like, this is the thing I want from character design. This is the thing I want from, like, when you have a, a, a type of creatures like the Marai, that you do this shit. Where it's like, okay, we have fish, we have humans. How many different ways can we combine them? Like, how many different ways can we find to express the idea of sea creature mixed with human anatomy? How many ways can we find to express the idea of a mermaid without just doing a mermaid? And, like, they've done such a good job with the Marai of, like, making them appealing, different, interesting, and strange. Like, especially strange. Not just pretty human in cosplay, but weird human-like creature. Like, mm, absolutely excellent. I love these character designs so much. And again, uh, it's double scene. Like, again, Nami is the secondary character here, um, but she's the uh, secondary character to uh, the Marai Great Mother, who's giving her... This is the Moonstone. Like, it's been corrupted and it needs to be purged of its corruption, and Nami's job is to do that. Um... So, like, you have this scene between these two characters, like, linked by this trail of bubbles, basically. Uh, and, like, the Marai Great Mother, just, like, with her big cloak, like, enveloping the whole scene. It's just, ah, it's gorgeous. Like, she takes up so much space, but without feeling like she's an overbearing character. It's wonderful. And her posture is good, too. And I appreciate that there's wrinkles on her. Like, if you look around, like, her, like, around the places where she's bending, that she actually has slightly wrinkly skin. Like, it actually seems like she looks a little older than the other mermaid creature, like, the other merfolk. Um, which are so smooth all the time. And then we have the stilted robe maker. And here's something fucking cool. Like, <clears throat> um, uh, like we're playing with non-binary uh, gender aesthetics with the yordles, which I think is very cool. Like, we have this character where there's a mustache, there's a beard, but there's also eyeliner. And, like, and, like eyeshadow, they're wearing enormous platform heels, like just the biggest platform heels you can imagine. They've got some, like, a version of Vagar's outfit that's a little bit more feminine, like in the way that it presents with, like, a bit of a skirt. And this long cloak of powerful magic in the background. Yeah, absolutely excellent. I don't know the gender, um, of this character. Like, I don't know if it's, if it's a non-binary character or what it is. Uh, but I just appreciate that they're playing with different kinds of gender expression, like fucking around with it a little bit. Um, for, like, a big queer-coded villain character. Which I really appreciate. They look like a drag queen. No! No, I don't think they do. At least, well, I mean, it's not that I haven't been to a drag show in a very long time, but drag aesthetic, as far as I know, is mostly this heightened hyper-femininity. Like, to the best of my knowledge, you don't see a lot of beards at drag shows usually. But then, like, my knowledge of that one might be outdated. Um, but, like, I like that they're fucking around with gender expression and that they're using yordles to do it. Because uh, that's cool. Again, that's a thing of like, people often accuse me and it's very tedious and annoying, but people often accuse me of like, oh, you just want every character to be gay or whatever. No, motherfuckers, I want one character. Like, I just, I just want one, two. Could we have three characters that are like not cis? Just three out of 150. Let's just have three characters that are not cis. Just three. Like, out of 150, let's just have five characters that aren't straight. Just, just, doesn't have to be that many, just fucking some. And this is very nice. We have a character, finally, that messes with, like, like, binary gender. That, like, that messes with gender presentation so that we also explore that part of what you can do with character design. Instead of being stuck in just the same boxes over and over and over and over and over again, which fantasy is often so bad at. Like, fantasy is often really kind of, of of regressive and conservative in the way that it plays with gender, especially. And, like, that's 
gender is one form of expression of a character. Gender is one place where you can design a character to be interesting, to be different, to express something. And so when you refuse to engage with that, like when you say, we, okay, like we have a, we have 10, 15 gender options of various form of, forms of gender fluid or like non-binary or like, like demigenders and whatever, but we're only going to use two options. Like male or female, that's the only ones. Like it's it's like it's like just cutting yourself off from a huge spectrum of possibility of character design, and it's so dumb and pointless to do so because you can do interesting things with it. So yeah, th I think that's cool. Like th it doesn't make them automatically a good character design. Like just because they have like non-conforming gender aesthetics, that doesn't automatically make them a good character. It doesn't automatically make it good, but it means that like you're you gain the virtue of doing something different, of showing people something new. Right? And that is a virtue of having more variety, more different things, more experiences, instead of just the same shit over and over and over again. Anyway, compositionally, uh, something we've seen before, we have this pyramid shape that rises out of the center of the image, and inside that pyramid, we have our main character occupying it. We have the contrast, we have the saturation, that's all going on there. And then every other character in the scene, which is another way that you can center a character, every other character in the scene is reacting to or acting in service of our central character, which is another way you can center a character um, in an image. So that all works really well. And then of course, like the, the added benefit of all these tendrils of dark magic become like threads or lines that draw our attention to the central character in the image. And then we have the Swole Scout, who is still so fucking cursed. <laughs> like, this, you shouldn't have a buff Yordle. I, I know I just said all this stuff about diversity, but buff Yordles, no, they're banned. I don't like them. They're too cursed. No, it's fine. It's completely fine. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> he's a good character, though. Like, he's very distinct. As the Yordle Scout Troop are making their way through hostile waters, we have the, the f Furious Fae Folk. We have Ava in the front, carrying her enormous backpack. We have Timo overseeing the whole thing. And we have the dude being like, Yeah, I can march through water. I do 10 miles of watching, marching through water with my CrossFit team. <laughs> What's my secret? You'll have to ask the bicep. They do all the talking. <laughs> So again, we have a Dutch angle here, which is both because, well, there's a green sea monster tentacle about to grab this guy around the neck or whatever. So this is a scene of tension and fear, but it's also because we need to have that vertical space so that Timo and Ava's big backpack can both be like occupying the scene without, again, if we untilted it, Ava's backpack would just kind of vanish out of the scene. And then we have these two motherfuckers, and I love them so much. They're so good. The te tenor of terror and the base of burden. <laughs> Which are this Vagar's personal, personal singers who sing songs about how cool Vagar is. And there's a fantastic voice line interaction where it's like, Would you like a little song, Lord Vagar? Don't use that word! Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Which is just is absolutely excellent. And I love that Vagar has his own bards. I I love that it's a tenor and a bass. And that <laughs> they do this big opera bullshit singing songs about how cool Lord Vagar is. Uh, they're so good. And they're so extra. Like, they're so extra. Like, even more than Vagar's other minions, they are so extra. And they should be, because they're like these ridiculous glam rock, rock opera motherfuckers. Just standing there. <laughs> it's very good. It's just it's just a delight. Like they're just delightful. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the best lines. Do re mi fa sol I kill you. <laughs> I love that so much. It's so good. They're so good. They're just like Vagar has some of the best followers. Like these two dudes are so fucking fun. Then we have the Lady of Blood, and you may recognize uh, one of the uh, Vladimir followers in the background, the uh, Crimson... Sorry, the Crimson something or other. Uh, the girl who's... Well, actually, let's find her. Uh, 
the Crimson Aristocrat, the girl who was doing a very straight heterosexual thing um, with her friend, the other uh, Crimson Apprentice. Just just the most the most heterosexual gals being pals I've ever seen in my life. They are they're such good friends. They're such good pals. They're just hanging out, doing doing gal pal stuff. Just just having a good time, doing friend things. Um, that's her. She's one of Vladimir's followers. She's part of the group of uh, the Crimson Curators, the Crimson Disciple, who are sort of like these teenagers who are like hanging out doing blood magic stuff with Vladimir, basically because they're bored and for fun. Um, and she turns out to be the daughter of the Lady of Blood, who has dragged her along on this expedition with the uh, with the Grey Legion in order to like take down this Demacian outpost. And so here we have Eslinger, uh, Eslinger explaining some stuff to the to the Lady of Blood herself, uh, Lady Ferris Noradi, who seems to have like who seems to have a low opinion of everything. Like look at that like that sneer of dismay and sort of disdain on her face. Like she's like she's such a fucking upper crust piece of shit. Like just just like she's just that asshole, right? Um, just like an absolute Malfoy. Yeah, like if you want to do the Harry Potter comparison, fuck J.K. Rowling. Uh, Absolute Malfoy attitude um, to her. And by the way, nice camouflage idiots walking through a winter landscape in red cloaks. Wow, no one's going to spot you coming from 10 miles away. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, just bring a gray cloak or something. Um, but yeah, uh, that's that's sort of all the backstory stuff. So again, uh, saturation, contrast, that's what highlights her as the main character. And then Eslanga as the secondary character, where you can see that he's subservient to her by the way that he sort of crunch, like he sort of crouches forward a little bit. He bends over. He's leaning towards her, inclining towards her, while her posture is just straight up and down. Absolutely straight up and down. And her eyeline is above his. She's literally looking down on him. So you get the sense that she's like the main leader that she's in control that she has the power in the situation which is part of what makes her the central character then we have this cool motherfucker the watcher on the isles also known as the sentinel veteran who just it seems to be a, a light sentinel who lives on the shadow isles <laughs> like he's just there he's just hanging out um just, just keeping an eye on stuff that's happening there, and he's like this old, grizzled, sort of sniper veteran dude uh, who just hangs out in the shadow as lights these beacons every once in a while and just uh, does Sentinel of Light shit uh, despite being on the fucking shadow. He's just, he's just a badass dude. Like, look at that coat. He looks kind of Bloodborne-ish a little bit in his character design, like the way that he's put together. A little bit of that Victorian-influenced, like with the long coat and the boots. Uh just a very cool character design compositionally light like we have this bright orange light that lights him up in the center of the frame and then everything else is much more blue gray desaturated he has these little hounds uh that are sort of lit up with the same and this is sort of a, a thing about like visually creating affinity between characters if you want characters to seem like they belong together um, like, the obvious thing to do is use visual, like, use color to create visual affinity. Here is a very obvious example. Everything in this scene that's red is, like, okay, these people clearly go together, right? Like, it's, you're not really in doubt about that. But then, with the Watcher on the Isles, you get this thing of, like, oh, hey, that's the same color glow from his lantern as glows from these dogs. And because he's not, like, worried about them, they're not attacking him okay, so we can see that these are his dogs, right? Just just by looking at the image, we get the sense of, okay, these are his dogs. He has command over them, and they are part of, like, his hunting crew or whatever. So... Here we have an ancient warmonger, and this, the, the lore behind this is basically that Lady Noradi, and we can see the, um, you can see the Radiant Guardian is back here. This is where she appears uh, before she's presumably wrecked by Sion. Um, the lore behind this is that Lady Noradia took Eslanga and the like the her revival powers into the ancient tombs of Noxus to revive like old warriors and like corpses that have been dead for hundreds of years and use them as shock troopers as well. Um, 
And so you get this Noxian warrior who's like supposed to look a little bit more like a like a revived ancient mummy kind of character. So they have this slightly different armor aesthetic, not very different from modern Noxus aesthetics, but slightly different. And like these spiky helmets and like they look much more wraith-like, a little bit more ring wraithy. Um, so in terms of framing, it's like pretty obvious. Like you have the falling body to the left of it here. You have um, the swoop of the axe sort of coming in there and then the falling body there. That creates like this little sort of semi-frame around the central character, which is our ancient warrior come back to life, like throwing everybody around like rag dolls, basically. And again, you can see they're, do they're doing the thing, like we have some buildings over here, we have some buildings over here, but nothing behind the character themselves, just gray sky giving us this flat backdrop. Whereas, for example, like the Radiant Guardian, you can see there's buildings behind her, there's all kind of details interfering with her silhouette, but there's nothing interfering with this guy. It's I just like this one. It's like bonk. <laughs> he was he was uh, being inappropriately horny and he was punished for it. Then we have the fallen reckoner. Um which is like who is apparently like this is a minotaur reckoner, someone who used to fight in the Noxian fighting pits, uh who's up against the bright steel formation by the way, which which I thought was a nice little detail that we see the Damasians doing their bright steel formation thing. Um and so what we have here is, again, notice how, like, there's a mountain over here, there's a smoke and buildings over there, but nothing behind the character themselves. So that helps with the frame. We have the pyramid shape rising up out of the bottom of the image once again to encompass our main character. And then we have color affinity and contrast. He's all dressed in red, they're all dressed in blue. That helps con contrast them out. And the usual stuff we talked about, saturation, uh, color density, contrast and so on and so forth all that centers him as a character and then the added benefit of just characters in the scene just pointing swords at him which again like hel very helpful this is the main character we got it and i really like his pose like i really like that he's got this like poor demacian by the leg and he's not even looking at him it's like i'll fucking throw him at you you motherfuckers like you can see he's sort of rearing almost sort of rearing up to like swing this guy at them or something like just a really nice dynamic character pose Oh, right, 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 right. Uh, Fallen Reckoner also has Risen Reckoner. Uh, which is where we get this small dose of iodine salt into the bloodstream, lethal to an immortal, but simply agonizing to our patients. To the written, Risen, there's no greater motivator than pain. So again, it's suffering. Like, they just torture these poor creatures until they fight. Uh, and you can see here what the, what the Reckoner is doing. He's breaking through that bright steel formation, right? Like, the this formation that was being set up right here, these shield walls... He's just like, yeah, fuck your shield wall, and just bursts right on through, throwing people left and right. And again, he's making his own frame. You can see how all the bodies that are falling, how the fire, how, like, the shields, all of that creates this, like, this valley through here that becomes the frame for the character to occupy. And again, behind him, just flat gray colors so that he can be contrasted maximally against them. Moving on to Fleet Admiral Shelley, who is just, again, like, they just get the most adorable creatures. They just get the cutest fucking things. Just... Listen over here, soldier. I'm having, you know, over 500 confirmed kills, and I'm the top admiral in all the Marines' forces. So when I say swim, you better swim, okay? Okay, thank you. With a reference of all fucking things to the Navy SEAL copy pasta. Of all things, the Navy SEAL copy pasta. My God, how did they get away with that? <laughs> but yeah, Bubba the Bubble Bear, he's right there in the background, which I think is absolutely lovely. We have him riding on this, I don't know if it's an axolotl kind of creature, it's some kind of frog, axolotl, sea creature, whatever. And of course, Admiral Shelley. It's just the cutest, adorable little good boy. Look how look how good he is. Just look how cute he is. Like you can't look at this and not be charmed. Like it's 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 basically one of those like uh, Lisa Frank things. Like it's it's about as subtle as a fucking Lisa Frank um, trapper keeper or whatever. But it's just it's just so cute. It's just so wholesome and so happy and so pleasant. 
I, it's, it's just nice. I'm just happy. I'm just happy looking at it. It's just lovely. And the water is so nicely rendered. Like this is just this is just good. Good boys. Good boys being good. Here we have the Herald of the Magus. And like we talked about before, like it's not 100% clear which of Serath's minions are actual people and which ones are just like elemental constructs that he's throwing into the world. This one I'd say is probably a person just because it wears clothes like quite as extensive as this, like which clearly people clothes and not, you know, um, whatever. But yeah, framing is obvious. Like we have all these obelisks sort of like forming this frame around the central character. We have the perspective doing a lot of the framing work for us because we have all these lines that align with the sort of the character rising out. The character is centered. The character is highlighted by uh, sunlight. The character is higher contrast, higher saturation, etc., etc. All of that is there. As the character design itself, it's like, it's fine. Like, again... Like, I wish with Serath's minions that there was a clearer thematic through line. Like, there's some sort of cult worshipper. Like, it, it's sort of meant to be this cult thing of like, oh, these are cultists who are worshipping a mad god kind of vibe to it. And so this is supposed to be essentially like Herald of the Magus. It's supposed to be a priestess to the cult of Serath, as it were. But it's again this thing of like... Well, is that do you want do you want it to be a cult thing or do you want it to be a control thing or do you want it to be like a like a worship of Serath's megalomania thing? Like it's I feel like it could be more coherent. I feel like it could be more specific to Serath rather than just sort of like we have this cult leader stuff, we have this enslavement stuff, like we have all these different things about escaping entrapment and things that just it just doesn't quite come together for me. So then we have these two, the Mist Keepers. The Black Mist traps its victims in endless cycles of self-imposed torment. Through the Mist Catchers, Tech and Kana give those souls a chance to break that cycle for themselves. Which again ties into sort of Senna's thing, um, where what she's trying to do for the souls that are trapped in the Black Mist is to free them, to give them control and a chance to escape, and to like no longer be trapped in these cycles of eternal torment. Um, and that seems to be how Senna views her mission as relates to the Shadow Isles as well. Um, and so we have these two Ionian Sentinels using these special Mist Trapper weapons that seem to give these spirits, like, the ability to escape from the Black Mist. And so here, um, color is one of the major things that separates, because, like, everything else is green. Like, the entire scene is just green with lots of green accents and green and green and a little bit of teal and then some green and some green. Just green, 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 green. So how do we contrast that? Well, with anything that isn't green, anything that is saturated with reds, anything that's saturated with yellows, anything that has warmth to it where everything else looks cold, we just use that and you get this great separation of the characters from the background where like you can really see that these are the central characters of the image, even if they weren't centered, even if they weren't, you know, whatever. And then you have the swoop of their weapons, of course, like as they sort of spin around each other and protect each other's backs. The swoop of their weapons, like that big red curve through the whole thing, again, also helping to sort of frame them as central characters. It works very well. Like, they're really cool. Are the inside of a mist wraith? Yep. That's where they are. So, here again, Caitlin, we have the plant, the flower, everything pointing towards C. This is from Caitlin's scene when she's doing her little presentation. And then we have the officer squad. You can see Caitlin up here, very well in the background, with her enormous pointless tie cap, as uh, Captain Burley here <laughs> prepares the door rammer uh, to smack, to, to crash the door in. And again, an object demonstration of all the stuff we've talked about already. Lots of desaturation and sort of uh, a flat color in the background of the character to help him stand out against everything else. And like saturation, contrast, and all the rest of it. And like a really good look at like the highly over elaborate SWAT armor that these people run around in. Like excellent costumes. Then we have these excellent boys. Look at them. Look at these good boys. Like. I don't know if it's supposed to be like an Indiana Jones Poro kind of thing, but look at these excellent lads. This is the, um, I think, uh, 
I think that's the daring Poro. And I th and I'm and I know that it's the nimble Poro as well. Who are taking a sled ride um <laughs> with the Poros that we have the prehistoric Poro here in the background as well. Just sledding through the the winter wonderland. And then we have uh, Indiana Jones Poro <laughs> in the front with the whip. Just yeah, it's just it's just cute. It's just adorable. I, I like them. I like them quite a lot. Um, I hope that Indiana Jones Poro gets like his own card elsewhere. Like I don't know. I don't know where he'd be, but like he, that would be very cool. Um, but yeah, this seems to be in either Ionia or Bantle City, or like the Bantle City region itself. Just because we've got floating rocks in the background and we've got like this spiraling, sort of curling wood. Um, which is weird, because it's a Freljord Bantel City card, so you'd think that, you know, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, this, this is just adorable. Like, all the same things we've talked about before apply here, but this is just an adorable little scene. Um, with, like, using the golden sunlight really well to contrast, like, the living characters with the, with the environment. And also, the golden sunlight also has the added effect that it makes everything feel a little warmer, right? Like, it doesn't feel like a cold, unforgiving, blighted, snowy landscape where nothing can live. No, it feels like a really nice, sort of late, uh, like, late in the day, golden hour, sort of winter's day where you're out sledding with your friends. It feels idyllic. It feels fun rather than sort of hostile and, and difficult to endure. Let's see. That was the Yordle sled, which means the Sand Seer is next. Another one of Zerath's minions. And this one, clearly, being an actual human person who is partially transformed into energy by the magic of Zerath or whatever. Um, and I really like this card. Like, I really like this design in a lot of ways. Like, again, we have this tendency to just, for these cards, like, always with the skinniest motherfucking women. Like, every time. Um, where it's like, but I think it works for this particular character. Because, again, this is sort of the idea of Seraph is, like, this replacement of all humanity with just the worship of power and nothing else. Like, so for, for this character, I feel like it makes sense for them to be, like, skeletal thin. Like, just just barely emaciated, barely anything there, because they are being consumed by Serath's power. Like, they're being consumed for Serath, and they are emaciated of all, like, human sustenance because Serath is so inhuman as a character. Like, I think it works for this character. It's just... In context of all the other incredibly skinny women characters in, in Legends of Runeterra, it gets so tiresome. But yeah, here you sort of see, again, this... This sort of mixed metaphor thing that's going on with Serath, where on the one hand, we have all these chains, we have all these obelisks, like all this prison imagery, and then on the other hand, we have all this, like, I am, like, unlimited cosmic power, blah, blah, energy wraith thing going on. That, again, I think they haven't quite reconciled it, but, like, I do really like this character design, like, and I really like the idea of, like, um, like, this, this beacon of light, like, almost as though she's beaming cosmic power right into her head. You can see how, like, her hair is these, like, energy tendrils that sort of mix and merge with the stars and the sky, almost as though she's part of the cosmos in some way. Like, that's very cool. Um, and there's sort of, like, a cool way to frame Serath's ambition, like, as, a, as essentially a cosmic ambition. That would be quite interesting. And here's Ari, by the way. She's just she's just there. Hi, Ari. You're here. Uh, are you going to be a card? We don't know. Uh, you're in a card. You're right there. Just ju ju just hanging out with the tail cloak matriarch. Uh, so that's a thing. It also confirms to us, like, this is the first time we've seen, I think, another of... Ari's people of the Vestaya, or at least another, mul like, many-tailed creature of Ari's people, because, as I recall from Ari's lore, she doesn't have a family. Like, she doesn't know where she's from. She doesn't know who her parents were. She doesn't know, like, sh why she is the way she is, and she's constantly traveling across the world trying to find answers. So having another character who has those multiple tails as a Vestaya... It seems like that should be kind of a big deal for Ari. But, yeah, uh, she, she's just there. 
and she's like a secret keeper or something. Like she's someone who has something to do with mysteries or whatever. Uh, but yeah, Ari might have found her family. <laughs> I guess. Um, so not a lot of framing. Like again, we have like uh, the main character being the tailcloak matriarch. You can notice again, they make sure to give her clean sky behind her. Not a lot of details behind her. Uh, she's above Ari, like she's sort of like touching Ari's neck or whatever. Yeah, it's hard to remember what's canon with Ari because her lore keeps changing. Yep. Yep, it changes a lot. It changes often. Um, but yeah, like clear sky behind her. She's highlighted by like the light. You can see her face especially is highlighted by the light from the lanterns where Ari's is a little bit more in shadow. And it all helps sort of make her the central character of the piece with Ari as a secondary. Then there's the Bandle Tree, AKA the I might randomly win the game if you don't remove me from play card. <laughs> which is the sort of this, which is the idea is that this is the heart of Bandle City. Like this is the central thing that Bandle City is organized around. And all of these like, all of these branches that sort of branch out and create portals and create like gateways to other worlds and routes and like leaves all of it as part of like this great great world tree basically like the bandle tree is so large that it has no beginning or end and so all of the yordle adventures like vagar's castle is somewhere on the bandle tree um ziggs's um laboratory is somewhere on the bandle tree like he's everything that happens in bandle city happens on one of the branches of this tree like yggdrasil essentially and so here we can see the Bandle City Mayor getting ready to give a speech. So like this is th this is in advance of like Timo, Tristana, all the people coming there to hear the speech of the Bandle City Mayor in a for some anniversary or something. Who knows? And yeah, you can see sort of the design elements of Bandle City. Like you can see these spirals. Like the like Bandle City is very organized around spirals. Like if you ever see trees with spiraling. Uh, branches like this, that's because it's a Bandle City thing. Like, it's a Bandle City card, it's a Bandle City something, and you can see that, like, carry over into the City Hall, which is just nothing but these sort of spirals turning in on themselves over and over again in the aesthetic. It's very good. <sighs> Oi, excuse me. So here we have the cool guys don't look at explosions thing. We look so cool right now, Tristana. Cool guys don't look at explosions as the Bandle City gunners walk away from a successful blowing something up. <laughs> it's just a cool little scene. And here we have our girl, Ava Achiever. Just such an excellent character. Like, you, the moment I saw her in the animated short, I just fell in love with her and she's so good. Cause she's just like a really, like a really sort of dedicated Yordle Scout who just, who just wants Timo's approval. And here we see her get it because she sh she's showing off the uh, puff cap traps, like the, uh, the, the Yordle snap traps that she's developed to Timo. And he's giving her the big thumbs up like, hey, yeah, good job. That's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great Yordle tool. And she's even getting approval from uh, the big buff Yordle here in the background as well. And it's lovely. And again, compositional limbs, we have this separation, like she rises out on this little sort of semi-triangular shape here. She's separated from the other two minor characters. She's bigger than them. She's above them. All these things are present and makes her the central character of the image. Then there's this thing. And like, damn. Like, Wow, okay, so it's a manta ray, sort of, with this, like, weird sort of segmented, almost centipede-like body coming off from behind it, and, like, these multiple eyes up at the front, or whatever the hell they are, I don't even know if they're eyes, like, thing. Again, just, like, the sea creatures that they've designed for this are just so fucking cool. Like, they're just so cool. It's so many cool sea creatures. They look so badass and weird and alien and, like, strange. Yeah, rules. Nami's up here. We have the uh, uh, the warden down here, and it's just like it's just a very like it's just a fucking cool mandatory monster, ghost leviathan thing. Yeah, it looks like the ghost leviathan from the Subnautica. Just absolutely gorgeous creature. Let's see, how far are we from the end? Well, I mean, we still need to do the expansion from uh, the Sentinels of Light thing, but we're getting there. We're getting there. 
So, remember way the hell back in Caitlyn's level 2 art. Caitlyn's confronting Karina in her hideaway in Piltover, Son, somewhere, whatever, like her greenhouse. She's holding this detonator behind her back. Well, this is the aftermath of that. She's pushed the detonator. She has this chemtech apparatus or something tied into her, which presumably makes her immune to the poison gas that she's unleashing all over everything. You can see Caitlyn in the background trying to chase her. You can see one of the police, uh, the police like succumbing to the gas over here because the idiots weren't wearing gas masks. Haha, <laughs> stupid morons. As she's just calmly and confidently strolling away uh, from a plan well executed. And so again, a little bit of a pyramid shape rising out of the bottom of the image. And she's just like more saturated, contrast, all the stuff we've talked about already. Um, but the real star of the show here really isn't Karina. Like she's gorgeous, don't get me wrong, but the real star of the show is like all the green and the plants and like the purples and just the elaborateness of this giant plant conservatory or whatever the hell it is that she's building all of this stuff inside. Like, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous scene just all around. Like, I really like this this art. Like, this is just gorgeous artwork. Not just the, not just the character, but the background. It's just, mwah. Beautiful. Absolutely excellent. Beguiling Blossom. And there's a tie-in also, like, you remember that uh, motorcycle cop who was chasing down that uh, truck that was delivering those canisters? Yeah, it's those canisters. And she seems to be growing her plants on or around them somehow. So again, like, it all sort of ties together. Another landmark for Seraph, and it's yeah, like it's it's a it's a landmark, it's a obelisk of power rising, drawing power out of these little faithful people who are feeding it with something. I do like the idea that this this thing is like warping the landscape around it. Like you can see how they're throwing rocks around and like sort of exploding out of the ground. Quite cool. I like the use of pink and purple uh, as contrast with like gray and brown and brown and gray of everything else. But other than that, it's just a landmark. Wait, I skipped something? Mini Morph. Oh, yeah, 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 the Mini Mini Tea. <laughs> which, uh, which seemed to be mistreated a little bit by uh, the prehistoric Yordles. Like, uh, this one right here seems to be pushing, trying to push uh, that one into the water. <laughs> which seems like a little slightly mean thing of them to do. But uh, the Mini Mini Tea itself doing the surprised Pikachu face. As this guy's like, no, don't do that. It's a terrible idea. And this person seems to be, this, this uh, Yordle seems to be completely determined to do it anyway. Jerk. Um, But yeah, like, I don't think there's anything to talk about here that we haven't talked about already in terms of composition. Like, it's just a, it's just a lovely little, like, I, I love the expression on the thing. Surprised kitty cat, surprised Pikachu. So, the Curious Shell Folk, yet another one of those, like, uh, where, again, they design interesting sea creatures. So, before we, like, before we have the Shell Folk, we have the Kelp Spirits, the Kelp Sprites, right? Um, and they were designed more around looking like seaweed, whereas these creatures are designed a little bit more, like, around, like, octopus sort of aesthetics or goldfish. Like, they have a slightly different look to them, which I think is interesting, that there's a little bit of variety between them. But mostly just, like, this guy just seems to be having an excellent time, <laughs> like, discovering sea creatures, doesn't he? Like, he's just hanging out, everyone's curious about him. It's just lovely and adorable and cute. And, yeah, like, not a lot to say again. Like, we've sort of exhausted a lot of the topics that come into these cards at this point. Um, so it's mostly about just commenting on the individual ones, and there's not that much interesting to say about this one at this point. Oh my, okay. Drunk people outside. So, the Ishtali Sentinel. This one's interesting, because there's a few things going on with this person. They seem to be losing um, 
if you pay attention to them. They seem to be losing, and it, do, it just it doesn't seem to be a good time for them. The uh, the dark mist is like piercing their legs. It's like tearing through their arms. You can see like they're basically cracking up, almost as though they are sort of being shattered like porcelain um, by the black mist. So they they don't they don't seem to be having like uh, they don't seem to be having a good time of it uh, right at the moment. Um, and you can kind of you kind of get that sense from the composition as well, where you can see like like she's still swinging her weapon around and doing stuff, but like the black mist is like it's like taking up a lot of space on the screen. You can see it sort of converging, and like and like uh, snaking and uh, and like uh, making its way towards her to like to pierce her and destroy her. So like yeah, this this seems like a last stand of some sort. This seems like a character who's. Uh, who, who's about to, uh, who's about to snuff it, uh, who's about to, to buy the farm, and that sucks a little bit, because that, that's a cool character design, that's a, it's nice to have another Ishtali character at all, we don't have a lot of Ishtali characters. But yeah, outside of that, I don't think I have a lot to say about it, like, I think the pose could be a little stronger, like, especially since she's, like, swinging her weapon and attacking, um, th this feels a little... A little vague. I mean, that makes sense in terms of like if she's desperately fighting back with the last of her strength, but I kind of don't get that sense so much of it just yet. Still, cool golden eyes glowing. So, here's the Yordle safety inspector. This is uh, after, <laughs> for some fucking reason, he's let Ziggs and his factory pass the safety inspection. Like, who knows why he just did. Um, her flavor text seems to establish that the Ishtal was never in any danger from the mist. Yeah, probably. Like, because they have all that nature magic protecting them. What do you mean I missed one? I'm pretty sure I didn't. Like, there's double tap, but, like, that's just the monster getting shot with acorns. Um, not much to say about that one. Oh, Risen Altar still has a follower you skip. Yes, that's true. Damien. <laughs> Say hello to Damien the Unbound. <laughs> yeah, hi, Damien. <laughs> I can't help but feel that that name is a reference to something. Um, Damien. <laughs> Here's Billy, the Chosen One. <laughs> but yeah, just, just Damien uh, doing... Ascended mega shit. Uh, but yeah, like again, not that much to say about it. Like the interesting thing about this guy is the floating ghost arms in the back that sort of look like Zerath's hands, as though Zerath is like this giant thing that's reaching down and sparking life into Damien the Unbound here. Um. But I don't, I don't really know whether that's it or if this is like he's controlling those hands as part of his power kind of thing. But with all the cheering cultists down here, it kind of seems like, okay, this is Serath reaching down and doing some godlike power shit to a thing. Maybe ascending someone into being a... Um, but, yeah. Like that 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 seems that seems to be the thing that's going on. So like centered character, highlighted, glowing, has all the saturation, and like everything in this in the scene seems to revolve around him. All the other characters are looking up to him, cheering at him, looking to him. Um, presumably right before all these guys are gonna be destroyed, which, you know, sucks for them. But yeah. This big safety inspector party. Um, Wilfred was originally skeptical. He was skeptical throughout, too. In fact, he was skeptical to the very end. But Ziggs and the other explosives experts knew they uh, proved they knew how to put on a real humdinger of a fireworks show, and that's apparently enough to win him over. <laughs> and I do like, um, I do really like Wilfred and his character design. Like he, he's got the hard hat. He's got like the ear guards that he's not wearing. He's got like the safety goggles. He's got the high visibility vest. Like he really, he really does. Like oh, I'm here from the union to check the working conditions on this site. Like he really does have that energy to him. Um, of like a very sort of sensible engineering minded person who has to interact with all these crazy lunatics. <laughs> Maybe they treat safety inspections like termite inspections. If it's not safe there, if it's not there, then you pass. Yeah. <laughs> 
um, as he stands on top of the largest bomb that Siggs has in his entire arsenal, and a fireworks show is going off. And this is just kind of a celebration picture with, like, all the characters we've been introduced to before. Well, minus the arsenal, we'll get to him later, um, who work at Siggs' laboratory. Just kind of having fun, partying, doing yordle shit, uh, and celebrating that they passed the inspection with a fireworks show going on in the background. So, here we have uh, the Yordel Ranger. This is Kip. And this is Peppy. <laughs> uh, so, so, like, this, this is a squire from before. You can see the uh, Cavalier, the pompous Cavalier here in the background with this big chicken. And the Yordle Ranger basically is the scout of the group. Like, if, if you think of them as an adventuring party, then Peppy is the little squire, like, the sort of... Uh, the enthusiastic helper. We've got the bards, we've got Poppy being like the knight and the main sort of uh, frontline tank, and then we have literally the ranger flying around in their animal companion doing scout shit. Um, and so this seems to be like, this is not in the middle of the scene that we've seen with the others. Like, this is not like, they're not fighting the big uh, bird monster right now. This is just the ranger sort of communicating some sort of something, maybe saying, oh, the bird monster's over there or whatever. I'm not really sure where the storytelling is at this, but in terms of framing, the wings are basically it. Like the wings and then the collar of the creature gives us like the two faces that are important, which is the uh, the bird beast itself and the ranger on top of the image right here. So like, it's only a very small proportion of the image that's really taken up by the character. Then secondarily, we have the actual hippogriff, or whatever it is that she's writing, and then we have Peppy here in the foreground being very, very out of focus to avoid her being the focus of the image. This is just, like, Senna's spell just looks so cool. Like, just, like, look at the way it's composed with all the lines. Like, this ah, it just looks so cool. Anyway, here's the ferocious fey folk, who seems to be, uh, Either rel related to or the same person as the Tasty Fae Folk uh, from a previous expansion. Who seems to, like, who's uh, basically swooping in. And I think this is after, uh, let's see, the newbie. I think the implication is that this is, like, you can see he's swinging in here as the newbie and Ava are in trouble from the grass monster. And then here, I think we see the aftermath of that. Like, he's blown up um, the grass monster, rescued Ava and the newbie, and is now, like, dramatically jumping away from a big explosion. Which all works very well. And you can see how the explosion is, like, uh, like this flat color surface background that is used to highlight the central characters in the image, uh, which are also the only characters we can really see. Oi, I'm yawning. I've, I've, I've been drinking chamomile tea to help my throat, like to, to avoid uh, blowing up my voice. But the problem with chamomile tea is that besides being really good for, like, decreasing inflammation, it's also soporific, so you get a little tired. Anyway, Servitude of Desolation. This is basically everyone uses Sonya's Hourglass uh, to become stasis statues. Um, but I quite liked it, like, in terms of, of like, sort of just being a lineup. Like, it's a very nice illustration and, like, a collection of Serath servants just all standing there, waiting to be unleashed on the world again. Then we have this. And this is just excellent. I really, really love this. I don't know if the... I don't know... I think this guy's supposed to be, like, a, a sea yordle in the same vein as Fizz. Like, I think they're sort of trying to bridge the gap a little bit between what Fizz is and what most yordles are, and they're using, like, this guy here to do it. Um, as... <laughs> As he's just hanging out, he's like trading this like little sharks, his little puppies. They've got little, they've got little little collars made of seaweed, and he's like he's like feeding it. And it's like, oh, it's just cute. It's just very adorable. I really love this. Like using the little puppy sharks, absolutely adorable, absolutely wonderful. I wish he didn't look quite so horrifying as he does, but still very good, very cute, and very excellent. And we have uh, the conch. Um, Researcher guy, the conch, uh, sort of, uh, 
sorry, sort of helping out with the research and like, or helping out with the, the feeding of, of the creatures and <laughs> holding his nose at the terrible smell. And you can see that this is like Bandle City because like you can see the spiraling branches. You can see like the buildings built on branches in the background. You can see that this is like this is like the, the seas around Bandle City, essentially. And here we have Short Tooth. <laughs> like it, it seems to me like what the storytelling here is that the um, the Contrologist. Yes, thank you, Shifu. The Contrologist tried to feed um, the shark puppy, and then he got dragged into the water by an overly playful, uh, playful shark. And then that's sort of when he begins his undersea adventure. For some reason with this art, and I don't know why it is, I don't know how well you can see it on stream, but this art is really fucking grainy. Like, it's just really completely blown out in a really weird compressed way, which is something that's been happening to the Legends of Runeterra art more and more recently. Like, there's this weird compression filter over it, that mostly it just makes the edges all fuzzy and kind of kind of ugly, but the grain here is like really out of fucking control, and I don't know why. Like, I do, it, it seems intentional, but I don't know why you would do it, because it's just a really ugly form of image compression. So, more Bandle Gunners. So basically more of Poppy's followers, and I really quite like uh, the design on this on, on this lady right here, because like, when you first look at her, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, it's like, this is a normal Yordle, but then you look at her again, and it's like, wait, her eyes are like, really far apart, aren't they? Like, really far apart. And so she has this slightly uncanny, slightly unsettling feeling to her when you look at her for more than a second. Like, she looks just a little bit weird, and I kind of appreciate that. I like the big leaf hat. That's very cute. That's a sort of a very sort of very sort of 90s kind of uh, kind of giant hat. Um, Yordles have four toes. Oh, people have been looking at the feet, have they? <laughs> Yordles have four toes, yes, and four fingers on each hand, usually. I think there's some artwork where the artist uh, accidentally drew Yordles with like, uh, with like five fingers, but they're not supposed to have. Um, but yeah, a couple of Yordle followers for Tristana. Many of the same things we've talked about already. They seem to have a big cannon, though. Like, a really big cannon that they're very eager to use. Um, which I quite, which I quite appreciate. Then there's Des and Ada. These two are so fucking cool. I don't, like... These two are so fucking cool! Could we have more with them, please? God, like, they're, they're so fucking cool. Piltover and Zaun, uh, Sentinels using guns. Like, using, like, basically same as Graves were, was using. Just using, like, a big mounted gun, just pounding into the, into the black mist with power. Just, oh, that's cool. Like, they're so cool. Look at those pants. She's got some great pants on. Again, you can see the highlights being used to center the characters. You can see the contrast and color temperature. Like, everything in the background is very cold. It's very bluish. It's very green. And then they are highlighted with, like, golden light and, like, lots of warmth and warm colors and so on. Like, it's just... This is, I, I just like their character designs. Like, I just like their fucking fashion. They look really cool. And I'd love to have seen more of them before they just died and were never heard from ever again. And didn't show up in Sentinels of Light for more than two seconds. Oh well. I guess we just assigned these cool characters and they're not going to be used for anything. So, more of the Grey Legion. We have uh, Lost Soul over here. And again, you can see a lot of the same stuff applies. He's separated from other characters. He's saturated and contrasted when everything behind him is washed out, etc., etc. Um, another appearance of the... Uh, of uh, the Twin Blade Revenant. Which you can see is being taken... Like here, they get taken down by that arrow, like fired into them. Basically, like, knocking them out of the fight for a bit. And then they rise again after the attentions of Dr. Eslanger. And this, uh... Let's see... Uh, where the hell is he? He's a two-cost... This is what's happening here. Like this one, this person got this. Uh, this zombie got taken out by this arrow fired into their chest. This guy helped restrain them while Eslanger worked on them, and now 
they rise again to fight another day as Eslanger walks away. And as the soldier here in the background goes like, oh shit, that's not right. That's just very unnatural and I don't like it. But it's basically a demonstration that even if you take them down one time, uh, they can be raised again and again and again. Yeah, just shoot the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if they can, if, if, if they can get a clear shot at him, killing the doctor is probably the best bet that they have. Yeah. But yeah, other than that, not much to say about either of these that we haven't set already, I don't think. No, like again, the triangle shape, like it's subtle, but you can kind of see it. The, the triangle that rises out from the bottom of the image to create like a, a central shape for the main character to occupy. And then we have the mirror mage, um, who I believe... I'm not sure about this, but I think her voice actress is the same person that voices LeBlanc. I think so. Um, and so a lot of people, because there's all this mirror stuff going on and mirror images and like that stuff, people have been theorizing that maybe this is LeBlanc in disguise who has infiltrated Vagar's inner circle for whatever reason. I'm not sure I buy that, um, but it's a fun theory that everyone is LeBlanc all the time. Um... But yeah, like this is a, this is a cool card. Like I like the whole Isma vibe of her. Like it's, she really does have that sort of classic villain, Disney villain uh, Isma vibe thing going on. Like or maybe a little bit more like one of the um, yeah, one of the seventies Disney villains a little bit more perhaps. Like animated by Milt Kahl, that kind of thing. <laughs> Yordle LeBlanc, yeah. <laughs> oh, this is the actual LeBlanc. Yeah, the, the one we see in Noxus, is, that's the fake one. This is the real one. <laughs> that would be amazing. But it's yet another one of Vagar's minions and yet another one that's like appropriately, massively sort of campy, flamboyant, classic cartoon supervillain. And I really do like the use of the mirrors. Like I like the, like the different expressions uh, that they've got on, like almost as though there's multiple different personalities in all of the mirrors, like all these reflections of reflections of reflections are just different versions of the character, different faces that they can put on. Just excellent. Like, and again, big triangular um, sort of pyramid shape in the center of the image, rising up to sort of accommodate our central character. And then we use the mirrors to sort of show what the character actually looks like from the front. Moving on to the Arsenal, who is yet another one of Vagar's minions. Um, wherever Six went, Arnie followed. His serene demeanor and natural foil to Six's chaotic seal. His duty just ranged from making sure the munitions were stocked to putting out fires to clapping his hands over Six's ears when Six inevitably forgot hearing protection. And so this guy is just like, he's just like the big sort of sensible, steady, calm dude who works at Six's factory, who's just like, yeah, I'll take care of stuff for you. Ziggs. Yeah, Ziggs. Yeah, yeah. Names. Who cares? It doesn't matter. <laughs> and I really do like sort of like this safety inspector is coming along and like, what you doing in here? And he's like, well, let me show you. Let's go look at some explosions. Like, like he's like, like just dragging the poor guy along. <laughs> like being extremely just unnaturally calm about everything that's happening in this house of madness. Which is like a good character. Like, he's a good sort of foil or like... A, or counterpart to Ziggs in that sense. Like, the, he's the big sensible guy that makes sure that everybody doesn't get blown the fuck up. Um, which I quite like. Like, I kind of like that. But yeah, again, like, nothing much to say about the composition. They're centered. They are separated from the background by contrast and color. And, like, we have a little bit of a pyramid shape, shape in the foreground. Not much of a pyramid shape here going on, really. But they're just, like, big and in the center of the image. And that's what makes them central characters. And then we have Treasured Trash, um, which is like, which sort of reflects the idea that Yordel portals exist everywhere in the, in Rune Terra, and oftentimes things just fall through them that the Yordles then just grab and repurpose and use for their own purposes, um, which is a, a bit lovely, little bit of lore storytelling kind of thing. Anyway, moving on. Uh, actually, let's do, let's do. Uh, Timo and Fizz's new art.
So Fizz has a much, much, much more elaborate new uh, concept art than he used to. Like this is like this is a much more elaborate. There's a much more detail. There's a lot more stuff going on. And interestingly, this one breaks a few of the rules and tendencies that we've seen um, previously in our discussions. Because like if you look at Fizz, where a lot of other characters will often be completely separated from the background. Like they'll have clear skies behind them. There won't be a lot of detail interfering with their silhouette. Fizz, on the other hand, is very much in the midst of a lot of stuff here. And there is a point to that. The point is that he is hiding. He's sneaking. He's not trying to stand out too much because he's trying to sneak up on the poor conchologist in order to pray, play a big prank on him along with Longtooth, which is no doubt going to be fucking harrowing. That is the conchologist, yes. Um, who's going to have a pl prank played on him by Fizz. So the point of having Fizz like be a little bit less clearly separated from the background is to have him like sort of to give this sense of like he's in amidst everything he's preparing to do a thing like he's trying to hide he's trying to be subtle he's trying to be sneaky and stealthy um and it works okay because fizz has this dark blue color scheme to him that stands out really nicely against all the bright greens and purples um of the background that he's uh, covered up against and I like the detail that he's basically looking at you, like he's looking out towards you, the viewer, and going, shh, because he's kind of letting you in on the joke, like like he's letting you in on the joke that he's about to play on this poor guy. As he does, <laughs> by this rise, like bursting out of the water on the back of a giant shark to, well, throw the poor dude in, <laughs> into the drink. Uh, fizz, you little jackass. Attempted drowning counts as a prank, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It's okay. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Um, as Fizz then dives out. Here we have a much more traditional separation, right? Like here, we have the separation of Fizz, like completely separated from the background, entirely framed against clear blue sky in order to really highlight him as a central character. We have a little bit of a framing going on. Which you can see, like with like with the uh, with the corals, with the falling conchologist, the surface of the water leading up into here. So like this is much more of a traditional splash art. Then we have Timo giving a big um, group pose with all of the uh, all of the Yordle scouts who have, I think, at this point, successfully returned from their mission. Like I think this is supposed to be like at the end of the Yordle scout mission. Uh, when they're all back um, at Bandle City and everyone's sort of in, in good shape and, and, and in a good mood. Basically, like, this is the triumphant return after a successful Yordle Scout expedition. And the reason why I think so is because you can see the travelers here, like the, the two sort of jerky kids who didn't want to be there, at this point seem to be having a great time with it. Like, they seem to be, like, holding a map and sort of jumping up into the air. Yes, we did. Like, like as though they've had a really good... I so they've had a really good time doing all of this. And then, of course, <laughs> Timo has to go and... Uh, I th Well, again, I'm not really sure about the timeline because I think maybe this is Timo saving everyone from something or other and everyone running away from a giant explosion. And then this is the aftermath. Like, I'm not 100% sure exactly on the timeline. Um exactly how it goes, or whether Timo just set off a bunch of explosions now because he's a dick uh, <laughs> and he wants to and he wants to teach them a lesson about getting away from gi giant poison explosions. Not sure either way, but whatever the case, here is a really clear example of highlighting because like they're all sort of ostensibly standing in the same light, right? But you can see the swole yordle is like barely outlined a little bit with some light. Like Ava has just a little bit of edge lighting. The yordle newbie has just a little bit of edge lighting on him. But Timo himself has much more substantial surfaces of light highlighting him as a character. He's also generally brighter than everyone else. And he's raised above the rest of the crowd, of course, by standing on a platform. And here, even more obviously, like, he's just the only one who's flying through the air. He's He's got highlights uh, coming from the explosions behind him, and he's separated in that way from the rest of the scene. Moving on to the character who has the most fucking associated cards. 
Like Jesus Christ, Akshan. Fucking hell. <laughs> Being Akshan himself, who is on a raid to do a thing, like to, to steal a thing from a warlord and also kill him, um, out of revenge for what happened to Shadja. And he's just like, as some, yeah, as, as Sol Navarro in, in chat points out, going full Prince of Persia here, like running along a wall, doing acrobatic shit. Um, as this poor fool in here, like this warlord who's framed against this little sliver of a window, is completely oblivious to the fact that the black mist is probably about to consume the shit out of him. Uh, which Akshan, very, very sort of, uh, in a very friendly manner, is going to prevent by killing him first. Uh... <laughs> But yeah, again, as we talked about, when one character is hidden from another, it's a very sensible way to show that visually is to have a, vi a literal barrier between them in the image. So between Akshan and the Warlord, we have this. Like, we have a literal stone pillar separating their spaces from one another, and that stone pillar also creates a little bit of a frame. Like, you can see how the, the fortress itself creates a little bit of a frame for Akshan to occupy on the left side to be contrasted against. Uh, and that all works quite well. Like, this is a quite well put together art. I think it's like, I like the action. I like the motion and movement of Akshan as he's like racing to, well, to compete with the, uh, with the black mist for who gets to kill this guy first. <laughs> and so again here, like you can see this guy has the frame around him. Like you can see he's framed by, by, by his opulence, by his wealth, by all the stuff that he's sitting in the middle of. And Akshan, rather than being framed, Akshan is breaking through frames. So like you have a frame here, you have a frame there, you have a frame like, like there's all these little windows sort of in, like windows within windows in the image. And Akshan is just breaking through all of them, reaching into this guy's space and is about to either grapple hook him in the face or fire the Absolver, uh, one or the other. And so, like, again, the storytelling here is pretty good. Like, Akshan is breaking into this guy's home. He's breaking into his space. So, Warlord's Palace. That's basically the preamble. Like, that's basically what was Akshan doing right before he did this. Well, this is him planning the heist, essentially. Sitting out there on the, on the right side, separated from the thing, casing the joint, and then we have the palace itself rising up in the center with the only thing that's really has saturated lighting on it, which helps center it as the central location of the image. Let's see. The Warlord's Horde. Here we have one of the characters we'll encounter later um, who uses these, I don't know what they are, but holy shit, they're terrifying little acid spider creatures uh, to do stuff and break in. Um, just breaking in to grab the Warlord's Hort. And here you can see, like, we've talked about these pyramid shapes, right? Like, we've talked about how using a pyramid shape sort of centrally in the image can help highlight something uh, to be the main feature of the image. Here, it's a little obvious. Like, here it's very clear exactly what's going on because we have a pyramid right behind the thing as it's being worked on by these little spider creatures. Let's see. These, are they interesting? No, not that much. Then we have Viego himself. Uh, I need to blow my nose because I got snotty again. Yeah, sorry about that. And yeah, like it's, it's Viego. He's not doing much of anything. Ex well, actually, didn't I review Viego's cards already? Hmm, not sure. Um. Did I? Now I'm in doubt. No, I don't think I did. No, 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 I didn't. I've just talked about them before. Um, so, yeah, Viego, uh, interestingly here, the sword is actually a big part of the composition that makes Viego the central character of the image. <laughs> can your avatar blow their nose as well? No. This avatar can only really do this. Like, that's it. Tilt he head left and right, that's about all the avatar can do. And blink. Uh, <laughs> and move the eyebrows around every once in a while. Yeah, I know, the flavor text uh, references in the crit, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, the sore is actually doing a lot of the work here of making Viego the central character of the image, because it's like this thing that just bisects the whole picture, 
and draws everything sort of towards him. The black mist also helps, of course, because all the tendrils are coming out from his chest, him being the source of the damn thing. Um, and yeah, outside of that, there's not that much compositionally to talk about. Again, clear sky behind his torso. Like you can see here, like a building, then nothing, and then mountains and stuff. Sort of again, trying to sort of clear the character from being interfered with by too many details in the background. But that's about it. But yeah, there's something that deeply unsettles me about the young king, somewhere in his heart, a hunger that cannot be satisfied to decide this goes unfulfilled, from the record of Nunyo Nekrit of Camabor. I don't think they can put me in there. Like, I don't think T.P. Skyne works as a League of Legends name. <laughs> Ever. But I was really happy with this. Like, I'm really happy to see Nekrit getting a little bit of recognition in the game, because, like, the dude has done a lot of work about League of Legends lore over a long-ass time. So I think it's cool that he gets to have a little reference to him in there. So here, some of the some of the stuff we've already talked about is in play here. Viego is separated from the background by being more contrasted, by being more by uh, by having more saturation, and just by being the center of the image essentially. And then we have all the tendrils of the black mist, of course, all pointing us towards him, doing this menacing walk at the head of his miserable army with the uh, ruined Shivana, a Camavorian dragon, and some other stuff in the background. Here we have the encroaching mist, which again is the black mist doing harrowing shit. And here we have the uh, Jawl Hunters, which is a card that was introduced in the game way, way, way long ago, uh, being menaced. Like, they've been menaced by a bunch of things around the Shadow Isles before, and now they're getting the entire force of the black mist rising like a tidal wave bearing down on them um, as the harrowing begins to spread across the entire world, which is bad. Speaking of which, this is, uh, oh, like this is, this is like moments before disaster shit. Like this is, this is kind of depressing. Um, <laughs> uh, cause I think those those kids are gonna die uh, just just based on the way that the scene is put together. It kind of looks like the the harrowed, the ruined dragon thing is coming around the corner. And like this little thing sees it and the mother hasn't realized yet. And we're about to get, yeah, as people are saying in chat, we're about to get full Bambi um, on this one with, with like the mother taking on the dragon and the little critters trying to run away and... Uh, yeah, it's just, 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 this is just gonna be tragic and sad, guys. This is just, uh, this is just gonna suck. <laughs> have I talked about, yeah, I've talked about Aphelios and his cards. I have. So, Crawling Viper Worm. So there's something interesting about this creature. Um, which is that it seems to be made of swords. Like, as far as I can tell, like, when you look at the texture on, on its scales and stuff, its entire body seems to be just covered in swords, and it seems to be made of them. And I'm not 100% sure how that's supposed to work uh, in terms of what this creature is. It's a crawling viper worm whose entire skin is swords for some reason. Uh, that I don't fully understand. It's a very cool creature. Like, I like the sort of snake fangs that it's got going on as it's crawling over the wall. I like the Attack on Titan vibe um, coming from this thing, like, going over, uh, going over the, going over the battlements. But in terms of, like, being a creature from, for Viego, like, a sort of, like, a, a, a dead creature that he has revived, I don't know. Like, it's a cool, visually, it's a cool idea to have its skin just be made of swords entirely, but, but why they did that... Uh, like it, it feels like not really it doesn't really feel Shadow Isles or Viego that much to me so here's a female character who isn't fucking ultra skinny which is a nice change of pace uh, for once a Camavorian soldier or Camavoran soldier 
um, who actually has some goddamn stomach muzzle, which is a nice thing to see. No face, but hey, you know, we take what we can get. And here, interestingly, like we have this cloak that that billows from her, which seems to be made of black mist. And that sort of seemed to billow out all over everything and creates this portal through which the other Camavoran soldiers are marching through. And that sort of mixes in with the waves of the seas. Like there's this wonderful like use of the black mist is this roiling ocean like smoke like like a like both a fog and an ocean like taking over everything becoming the entire environment which i quite like and again a compositional element she's separated from everything else that's happening in the scene she's separated from the background because the background is just this flat gradient of color uh sort of against which she can be contrasted quite easily and it all works pretty well i think So, um, the mist warped Gregem's mind, forcing him to relive Renwall over and over. Stoked by long-buried bitterness and rage, he turned against the comrades who once stood with him. And this is sort of the thing about Viego um, and, and his power, is that Viego has the ability to take over the minds of people who are vulnerable to having their like the, to having their fears and traumas repeated to them like to to be trapped in like these cycles of negative emotion over and over again getting obsessed getting obsessive that's how he's able to control shivana for example um and so here he does it to to this dragon guard and framing is very strong here like you can see the wings of the dragon that he's riding right there create a frame for the dragon guard that also separates him visually from his former compatriots. We can see the uh, scout, oh, the um, shit, what's he called? One of Shivana's followers, the soldier dude who's like a three cost, who's like a three two that can have challenger if you behold dragon or two cost or something like that. He's, it's that guy, he's right there. Um, but yeah, the framing is very strong. It also separates him from his companions, like visually doing the storytelling that he is now separated from them, that, that he's now apart from them in his thinking and in his mind. Yeah, the lieutenant or the lookout, one of the some, one of them, yeah. Um, so like the framing here is doing a bit of storytelling for the action that's actually happening, which I think is quite good. And then we have the Vakauran Vagabond, who is stealing a little bit of uh, style from Samira, I feel, uh, with, with that eye patch. But uh, who is, um, like, this person is, like, seems to be, have a cr big crush on uh, Akshan. Like, a, like, really just wants to prove herself to him, wants to prove that she is, like, uh, like th that she's better than him and, like, that he should really, he should really acknowledge her and maybe they should hang out. Maybe they should kiss or something. I don't know. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, and you can see Akshan climbing into the climbing into the uh, warlord's palace up on the wall right there, and she's basically following behind. Um, as she's, again, like like Akshan, she's transgressing a boundary. Like, the wall here represents a boundary between the warlord's palace and the outside world, and she's transgressing it like a thief sneaking in. So here again, we have that aesthetic of skin made of swords... And you can see it here on the Camavoran dragon. Like, it's just that there's so many swords stuck into it, basically, that its entire skin has become nothing but swords. Which, again, is like... It just doesn't feel like a Viego thing. Does it? Like, Viego doesn't have that thing of, like... Of, of like, uh, like, Game of Thrones thing. Like, in Game of Thrones, for example, like, the throne is made of swords as a sort of symbol that, like, oh, hey, yeah, like, this is a throne over which blood will be spilled. Like, this throne is defined by warfare to some extent or another. Like, there's a visual metaphor in there. But then, like, that's not really a thing with Viego. Like, his whole thing is a broken heart. And Camavor's whole thing, like, they are a conquering empire, but, like, that's not really their thing? Like, it's, it's like more, more, I guess someone is pointing out in chat, that's more of a Mordekaiser thing. Like, it's definitely more of a conquering, like, warlord Mordekaiser aesthetic thing than Viego, who was, like, very much not about those things in the same, I don't know. It's, it's an awkward thing that I just don't think it works completely. Again, individually, this makes a very, very cool monster. It makes a very, very cool creature design. It just, I don't think it fits with, like, Viego's ruination thing as such. Um, but anyway, very cool creature design as a whole. I like that it has tentacles rather than feet. Like, it's a, it's a more of a worm dragon kind of creature design, like a snakish 
thing with a bit of octopus mixed in there, which is also very cool. Um, like that, it's just, like, just very, very cool. I love the rendering on the smoke, like how liquid and inky it feels. It's gorgeous. And then like, of course, highlighting the central character just by making them glowing, which is a simple way to do that. Then we have the defective swap bot. And I quite like this guy as well. Like it's just, it's basically a robot that's been ruined. Like that's been infected with the ruination somehow. <laughs> and it just seems to be like still uh, hanging out in, in Piltover and so on. Like a new slot bot. Didn't they shut down the plant that made those years ago? I thought so. Something about rolling bombs and unintended conflagration. Huh. Want to play? Absolutely. Yes. So like this is this casino robot that's been infected by the ruination that's just still hanging out doing casino robot shit presumably this will turn out really poorly for everybody involved but okay i guess robots can be ruined <laughs> but yeah i don't want to repeat myself any more than necessary so i'll just skip over re-explaining all the same compositional elements that we've talked about already. So here, Hella framing. You can see it like the, the she's framed against the Reckoner there. You can see that Riven is fighting uh, Draven there in the background. And you can see like this creates this little framing for the ruined Reckoner right there. Uh, and I appreciate this character because she's a female Minotaur who looks like a female Minotaur which is nice. Like, uh, I've made a video before kind of being annoyed that the only female Minotaur we knew of in the game was essentially just like, again, like a skinny human lady who, let, let me show you actually. Um, uh, that was in Empires. Thorn of the Rose, right? This was a Minotaur lady, right? But she's just a skinny human lady. Like this, it, Design-wise, there's nothing except her face separating her from just being a skinny human lady, which, like, I felt like was a bit of a, a bit of a waste of the Minotaurs, and I thought it was annoying the implication that the Minotaurs have this really strong sexual dimorphism. Um, for some goddamn reason that I that I just don't think makes sense. So seeing the ruined Reckoner. Is quite nice because okay here's a minotaur that actually looks something like a fucking minotaur uh and like that implies okay the, their sexual dimorphism may be in this species but it's like the, the the thorn of the rose is not like a hollow type it's not an archetype of what every female minotaur looks like it's just one among a variety of female minotaurs which is cool i like that that's good let's see some more female minotaurs let's see some more different ones let's see some more different male minotaurs as well let's see like a little skinny slight tiny male minotaur also because all the male minotaurs right now are just these big fucking beefcakes all the time so okay we have a dimorphism we have like many different kinds of minotaurs cool let's go with that let's roll with it let's make many different kinds And this is just a cool pose. Like, I really like this pose. This is really fucking cool. It's dynamic. It's action-filled. It has, like, lots of good movement. I really like it. Uh, let's just do this. So, here's the safe cracker, the Vakaran safe cracker. We've, uh, we've encountered this character before. They were uh, breaking into the horde using their horrible little acid spider creatures how does she train them like i don't i don't even know uh she's called tina and she's like again here the thing we talked about before like when you want a character to hide from someone or from something well just put a physical like a visible boundary between them and the thing that they're hiding from so she's over here in the like the cold moonlight outside of it you can see a little bit of the warm light from inside shining on her face and then there's this boundary separating her from the thing that she's trying to break into, which is like the inside of here. And here we have a continuation. Like this is again, uh, the ruined Reckoner who's been taken over by Viego's like negative emotion powers fighting against her, well, her own husband, it seems like, or lover, uh, who's trying to calm her the fuck down and not having a lot of success uh, with it. The retired Reckoner beckon. So here, framing, 
like basically the ruined reckoner does a lot of the, of the work of framing him but there's a compositional thing here where he's under pressure right like he's trying to fight her off um while she's very aggressively attacking him and he's basically trying to push back against her but she is like pushing him backwards like he's defensive he's on the defense he's being attacked and she's pushing forward and you can see that in the way that she dominates so much of the page like all of this basically is her space the space that they're clashing over is just this little sliver in the middle and then he's being pushed back into this like cramped compromised position as he's being driven back by her and then we have like this was just so fucking heartbreaking somehow petty officer going like rex as rex somehow gets ruined and turns on the poor petty officer who's like just seeing his pet and his best friend like get ruined he's like rex what's wrong buddy and it's like it's just it's just kind of heartbreaking and sad and it's like rex is such a good boy like he's a cannon barrage monster that has killed me a few times but like it's, 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 there were so good friends and it's like they had to fight it's, oh like no that shouldn't happen poor rex like oh it just it's just depressing. It just it's just depressing. I don't like it. So, the Vakaran Bruiser, which is another one of the uh of the uh, characters associated with uh, with Akshan, who has a somewhat more hands-on approach to breaking into a place as you can see like just <laughs> scores of people behind him just completely knocked out. <laughs> As he's got this adorable little lizard creature running around, grabbing gold and riches for him. And he's like just a big, adorable himbo man. Look at him. What a what a beef boy. What a lovely dude. And he has an adorable little lizard that he loves and calls Barb, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> but yeah, nothing compositionally we haven't seen before. Nothing in terms of framing and aesthetic uh, that we haven't seen before. Just a pretty good character and I like the pose that he's got like that sort of warm welcoming hug thing like there's no sense that he's just been in combat right like, there's no sense that he's just been punching these guys to pieces he says like hey there's my girl <clears throat> so here we have Cadrigrin and that's a dragon that Shivana has fought before um at Renwall if uh, like no less if you can believe it and uh, who has apparently been ruined and brought back as a ruined dragon along with uh, some other like characters we have here the the ruined dragon guard and here we have the dragon guard lieutenant dude uh down at the bottom looking up at him and again we see the same little trick repeated where the wings in part are used to separate the rider from the people but in this case the rider isn't really the the uh the main character so it's not that much of a storytelling thing this is more about, like, we are, in terms of, of the framing and the aesthetic of, of the shot, we are put in the position and the perspective of the Dragon Guard. Like, you can see that we are among them, and we're looking up at this thing coming down from the heavens. And so, like, we're sharing their perspective and their, like, their fear and their trepidation at what's coming at them right now and how bad this shit is going to be. Which, again, is, like, a good way to frame a monster. It's a good way to frame a terrifying villain creature. So, Rhymefang Den Mother. Well, you can see we have a Druvask here, and a Druvask is the same kind of creature um, that Shivana, uh, not Shivana, Sichuani. It's the same kind of creature that Sichuani rides, which here clearly has been ruined by something or someone. And you can see, like, there's this standoff going on between the wolves and the Druvask itself, where they're sort of trying to surround it. They're sort of trying to, like, see if they can... Um, if they can overwhelm it with numbers or like get the drop on it or ambush it. But it's also like just you can tell that it's like this thing is big and they're not eager to attack just just by the way that they're posing and posturing at it. It's more of a like a calm before the storm moment as the Rhymefang Den Mother evaluates whether this thing is worth it. So the Rhymefang Den Mother, all white, like very bright fur, mostly white. So look at the background that they give her. Like we have a white landscape, obviously, but here, oh, just coincidentally, there just so happens to be a cliff full of dark black rock that rises in just such a way 
that like she's not ha- doesn't have to be framed against a snow white background she can be framed against a dark black background which highlights the like the color of her fur even more which is a good way to highlight the character as one of the central like as one of the central characters in the image and then there's the fact that the druvask is staring at her and she's staring at it like there's eye contact between the two which again helps sort of cement, cement this one as the central character that's challenging the druvask So here's a scattered pod. We have these cloud drinkers, uh, which are like creatures we've, we've examined long ago before when the game first came out, um, being overtaken by the black mist as well. Like they're defending themselves as best they can, but like it's not, it's not gonna work forever as they're just trying to fly away as fast as they can. And um, here's a little trick that's being demonstrated that's very common for these cards when they want to demonstrate sheer size and scale. Let me see if I can't find a good, good example. I know I can. because it's right here. If you want something to look big, to look overwhelming, to look absolutely enormous, you have to put something else in the image against which it can be compared. You have to do banana for scale, right? So what are they doing here? Well, we've got two human characters right here, tiny, looking up at Malphite towering above them up in the clouds. But more than that, we've got birds. We've got birds, these little tiny, little tiny bird shapes flying around his head, all of it in service of showing us the sheer scale of this mountain man. And it's the same trick that's being used here. In order to get a sense, like, because here we don't really have any humans, we don't have any landscape, we have, like, these mountaintops way in the distance, to get a sense of the scale of just how big these cloud drinkers are. So what do we have instead? Birds. Birds for scale, helping to sort of increase like increase the perceived size of these creatures relative to their environment which like it works reasonably well like it works okay i feel like really there should have been some mountain tops in the foreground like something else to give more of a sense of scale of just how big these things are but the birds are an attempt to do that to, to like to give a sense of just that these are like sky whales that these things are absolutely huge Invasive Hydrovine, yeah, I don't think there's much I can say about that that we haven't gone over like a dozen times already. It's just a big cool Hydra monster. That's about it, I think. And the Thrumming Swarm, yeah, I mean, not that much to say about it either. Um, except like, like, one thing I'll criticize this this for is that it doesn't really look like a swarm creature. Like, it just doesn't. This looks like, and especially when you frame it like um, like so, it just looks like one beetle. Like, it just looks like one. Um, the idea of the art is that you can see all these eyes sort of emerging out of the black mist in the background. We have these other beetles here. Like, that's sort of supposed to suggest the swarm, but this doesn't look like a swarm creature. Like, especially with the humans there for scale, this just looks like... A big fuck off beetle like this is not a swarm threat this is just one big fuck off beetle which is more than enough to be a threat so like this feels less like a swarm monster and more like just like just a monster um straight up which like yeah, uh, mileage may vary on how well that works and i think that's all of them yeah I think it is. Have I forgotten any chat? Uh, you can let me know. Because I don't think I have. I think we covered everything. Will I review the skins as well? No, not right now. I've, I've been talking nonstop for five and a half hours-ish. So I think I need a break <laughs> if we're done. Yeah, I think we got all of them. I think so. Yep. Yep, we got him. Who's my favorite new champion? I'm not sure. Like, I like quite all... Like, I mean, in terms of what I'm going to play, definitely Vagar. In terms of, uh, of their character design, 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I'm, I'm bad at picking favorites. Always have been. But yeah, that was almost every single new card revealed so far for the Beyond the Bandlewood expansion. Whew. That was a lot. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you had a good time listening to me blabber on. And yeah, this will be up as uh, VODs on my second channel tomorrow-ish. I'll like they I'll cut it into one-hour episodes, something like that. Make it a little bit more easy to watch in installments and chunks. And we'll be back with another one of these when another expansion drops, I think. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>